Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. So this happened to me when I was 11 or 12 years old, over a decade ago, and I still remember it vividly. At the time, I lived in a semi-detached house with my mom, dad, and sibling. It was decent sized, but the most impressive part was the garden, which essentially had three levels. The first level was concrete, the second grass, and the third, also grass, had my trampoline on it. At the very end of the garden was a tree embankment. The area I lived in was somewhat hilly. One morning, I woke up to a cracking sound, like a snapped branch, and I was worried since a week earlier a tree from the embankment had fallen into our neighbor's garden. My bedroom was at the back of the house overlooking the garden, so I opened the curtains to see if another tree had fallen. Instead, I saw a guy hiding in one of the trees in the garden. He was pale with blonde hair and wearing all black clothing. He was looking directly at me, presumably because he saw the curtains move. He started sparking and moved his finger in a come here motion. I totally freaked out and shouted for my mom and dad to come into my room. I was so scared I physically felt like I couldn't move. This was super early in the morning by the way, around maybe 5 so it took my dad a good 30 seconds to get in my room at which point the stranger had hid behind the trees. I remember being really shaken up. I was crying whilst I told my dad what happened. He went out into the back garden to see if he could spot the guy but he was gone by that point. A bit of time passed and I'd started to forget about it. Then about three months after, my mom and I were watching television together after I'd finished school. The doorbell rang and my mom went to answer the door. I looked out the window of the living room where we were sat and saw a white van parked outside. It was the same van as as my uncles, so I walked out of the living room and into the hallway to greet him. When I got to the porch where my mom was stood, I realized it wasn't my uncle. It was the same guy I had seen in the garden a few months prior and it really freaked me out. He noticed me as I walked behind my mom and gave me the same smirk as when he was in the garden. I wanted to say something to my mom but I couldn't. I was freaking out inside. Anyway, he just asked my mom if she wanted work done on the drive. She said no and he left, got back in the van and drove off. He didn't give her a business card or anything. The van didn't have any company branding and he didn't knock on any of the neighbors doors. I told my mom that it was the same guy as soon as he went and she started to feel uneasy about the situation too. A month or so after that I got my first job doing the paper round. I had to deliver over 300 papers with my best friend at the time. He was getting towards winter and it was dark by 4 30 in the afternoon. We'd been doing the job together for around a month when the one evening after school it was super dark and rainy. We were halfway through delivering the newspapers and a van started following us driving really slow at the same pace we were walking. The clock that it was following us after about a minute and we started to panic as I noticed it was the same guy again. We left the newspaper trolley and started walking quite fast up the hill. We were about a 10 minute walk from my house. I rang my mom who made me stay on the line while she left the house to meet us. She told us to go to the corner shop that we were about a minute away from. When we made it to the shop the van sped off really fast. The police were called who came to my house for a report. We told them everything. That was the last time I ever saw the creepy stranger but I still remember remember what he looked like so vividly. Hi, me, my sister, and my mom have been trying to make sense of this for the past couple of hours and the facts get less comforting the more we compare our experiences of that night. So last Friday night, I, a 17 year old dude, was home alone while my family, besides my sister who is 21 who was at work, stayed in their cabin a few kilometers away. I'm used to staying home alone as this exact scenario is very common in the summertime, especially while I'm working and can't travel from the cabin and back. I'm not usually jumpy or afraid while home alone anymore used to the odd creaks and settling noise of our old house. I was especially comforted by the fact that my sister's dog was also in the house with me that night and most noises could be attributed to him and if anything were to happen he would act as a guard dog of sorts and alert me to anything odd. At the same time, however, he is the type of dog to bark at any noise or person walking past the door or windows so I'm used to hearing him bark or growl at night. Even so, this past Friday the sound of his barks at nearly 12 in the morning were disconcerting, to say the least. Despite my comfort with staying home alone, I am still terrified of the premise of a break-in or some other uninvited human interaction at midnight. I let him bark for a few seconds, telling myself it was just someone walking past our glass door in the adjacent alleyway, and he would quiet down once they passed. Needless to say, that's not what happened. He kept barking and growling for a few moments too long and I finally got out of bed. I sleep in the basement. I walked upstairs to check it out. As I'd suspected, he was standing alert at the glass door. I was comforted for a moment until I walked over, ready to close the curtains and go back to sleep, and saw the door 
door open about two or three inches. I froze. I had let Bosco, the dog, out earlier that night, but I know I closed the door. I have never left this door open. I am a paranoid person with bad anxiety, especially concerning break-ins and the like, so I would never, home alone, forget to close the door. I am 100% certain. But at the time, I didn't let myself think about these facts or even acknowledge that I could not have left the door open because I knew it would send me into a spiral, possibly even an anxiety slash panic attack if I didn't explain this away. I closed and locked the door, double checking that it was certainly locked. Using the flashlight on my phone, the lights were all off. I looked around the entire second floor of my three floor house, including closets and other reasonable hiding spots just to put my mind at ease upon finding nothing. Went back downstairs to my room. As I was down there, trying to push away the fear, I could hear Bosco walking around on the floor that doubles as my bedroom's roof. I thought I was overthinking it when it started to sound like human footsteps accompanied by Bosco's footsteps. He walks around for about 10 minutes before I put in my earphones and talk myself down until I can fall asleep. At 2 in the morning that same night, my sister comes home from work. I woke up a few minutes before this to Bosco in the basement, which he never does. There's even a gate to stop him from getting to the basement. Bosco is winding at my bedroom door. When I got up to let him out, my sister walked in, and we let him out the front door rather than the glass patio door, letting him in the same way. We talked for a while before I went back downstairs and my sister went to the bathroom. I forgot about the door, busy with work, for the next few days, and forgot to mention it to anyone until tonight. My sister and mom were home with me for a movie night while my dad and brothers stay at the cabin. I remember the door situation when we were picking out horror movies to watch. I was sharing it as a creepy, almost funny story before my sister spoke up, saying that the same night, an hour or so after they got home, the door was open again, the same door that was locked from the inside and not open since earlier that night. My stomach dropped and I started shaking the second this was revealed. We first started trying to explain it away. Maybe she had let Bosco out and forgot to close it until we both recalled that we'd used the front door. Then we were trying to justify a reason someone would break in to not steal anything and proceed to stay for two hours before leaving. Ultimately, I realized that I quite possibly locked someone in the house with me, then forced them to hide upstairs while I searched the second level of our house. Then this hypothetical person would be trapped up there now knowing that this house, that appears empty with the rest of my family gone and all the lights off, was not empty and there was a dog who would bark if they showed themselves again, alerting me to their presence. Then, when I was in the basement and my sister was in the bathroom, they ran out the glass door, which is timed perfectly to when they found the door open once more, much wider than when I found it as though they were only in a hurry on the way out. Perhaps they left it open the first time for a quick escape, or to stop the loud sound of it meeting the door frame. Either way, it ties together too perfectly for me to reasonably brush it off. I know it's unlikely, especially with nothing missing, but in this small town, there have been many reports of break-ins with nothing missing, vandalizing, or just breaking and entering many times, so it's not as unlikely as it may be in a bigger city. I can't make sense of this, and I'm shaken up thinking of the possibility of someone being in my house while I was asleep, alone in the basement. There's a part of me that doesn't believe it, but I can't shake the too many coincidences that all tie together to make this as concerning as it is. I certainly am glad that my searching came up empty that night, and I did not meet this person face to face. In the summer of 2020, my friends, Alex and Violet, and I decided to go on a mountain vacation. Pandemic cabin fever had hit us hard and we were desperate to get out. We settled on a mountain estate and planned to camp and hike at several different locations. For one night, we thought it would be fun to book a cabin in the woods. Violet's parents had rented a fire tower once and loved it, but a cabin beside a fire tower was all we could find. It was cheap, clean, and secluded. Excited to have a night where we could be as obnoxious as we wanted, we booked it. In the weeks leading up to the trip, we decided it would be a great idea to drop acid at the cabin. Violet bought an entire sheet in preparation for our arrival, and it was tucked in her bag as we pulled out of the driveway to make our way to the cabin. I remember this knot in the pit of my stomach, this achy feeling that gnawed at me. I told Alex and Violet that there was no way we could drop acid that night. Violet was pissed. We turned around and got into a massive argument, but I stood my ground. I just knew that we had no business tripping that night. Finally, the fireworks settled and we were off. The cabin was roughly 30 minutes away from the near town. It sat atop a mountain. We held our breath as we rounded the busted road that spiraled toward the top. There were no pull-offs, no other campsites, just a long, windy road that led us to the cabin at the peak. We settled in and started a fire to keep warm. As dusk gave way to night, we heard the unmistakable noise of an engine on the road, then the flash of headlights. A side-by-side -side with three kids arrived and our nerves settled. They smiled, gave us a wave, climbed the fire tower, and left. We'd heard there may be occasional visitors to the fire tower, but they were the only ones who'd come 
come by. We doused the fire and moved inside, heated some hot dogs until they were lukewarm, ate them fast, and sat in the silence. You don't know how quiet it is until you're in the middle of nowhere. You can hear every rustle of the leaves, the whisper of the wind through their branches. You get so used to white noise. Living in the city, there's always the hum of an air conditioner or the dim roar of traffic to focus on. Here, the closest thing to white noise was the sound of our own breathing. We jumped at every noise, too frightened to speak to one another, and finally, I'd had enough. I cracked a few wine coolers, passed them to Alex and Violet, and slapped a board game down on the table between our bunk beds. It didn't take long for us to loosen, and we were laughing, having the raucous good time we'd envisioned. Much sober than we thought, but enough that we were able to ignore the rumble of the woods. Later, we'd all recall hearing noises in the background. The snap of a twig, the dim rumble of an engine. None of us wanted to rupture the air of nonchalance between us, so we ignored it. Until a human hand reached up to the window between us and slapped it three times. We were screaming in an instant, Alex called the cops, put them on speakerphone, and handed his cell to me. He grabbed pokers from the fireplace and passed them out. Violet started calling family members and saying her last goodbyes. I held my breath and listened for any more noise. Whoever this was, whatever this was, would have heard us call the police, and now they were being careful to make a silent retreat. Dispatch arrived 20 minutes later, a lucky thing for a one in the morning emergency call, and had their dogs comb the mountain. Nothing. They suggested it may have been a bear, but I could tell from their faces that they didn't believe that for a second. We barely cooked those hot dogs, and why would a bear smack the window by a couple of screaming kids rather than the one closest to the pan we'd used to cook? Why would a bear knock on the window like a human? Why, when we screamed, did the bear make a stealthy retreat? They had no answers. But they had one anecdote. As they'd sped to us, they'd come across a car at the base of the mountain, but that was the only sign of life they'd seen. I remember my blood ran cold, but Violet and Alex were too frazzled to absorb the weight of what they'd said. And dizzied by a new horror, Violet's car, thoroughly dusted by our drive up the mountain, was covered in handprints. Handprints that didn't match ours, that touched places we hadn't. We grabbed our stuff by the armful and threw it inside, eager to remove every part of ourselves from this mountain. We followed the police, grateful every pothole found us further and further from that wretched cabin. We made it down at record time and found lodging at a seedy hotel that reeked of cat urine. I couldn't sleep. The thought of that car on the road rang in my head. Remember, there was nothing else on that mountain. It was a narrow road to the top. No pull-offs, no other campsites. There was the fire tower. Maybe a visitor decided to spook us during their late night excursion. But the kids from earlier, we'd seen their headlights. Whoever did this had stopped their vehicle further down the road and hiked the rest of the way. They didn't want to be spotted. They wanted silence, secrecy. Whoever this was hadn't been looking for a cheap scare. They planned this. I don't think I'll ever know what the person on the mountain wanted from me. I don't know if it was a practical joke or the beginning of a night of terror. I'm grateful for Alex's quick wit and calling the police. I wonder if our visitor knew we had service. It had certainly been a welcome surprise to us. Perhaps that was a wrench in his plan, enough to spook him before he could make things ugly. In truth, I don't know if I want to know. I think I'm just content to say midnight stranger, let's not meet. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. At the time of this story, I was 21 and living in a major Midwestern city, attending the university there. Having lived there for only one month before my story began, I had witnessed a train stop stabbing. Been yelled at by a crackhead, had a homeless guy followed me and threatened to choke me outside the physics building on campus, and watched a 13 car cop raid on a drug house just across the street. The area around the university is known for being rough and has a notoriously high rate of crime. We would get a few texts a week from the campus police saying things like there had been a robbery, a break in, an assault, stalkings, attempted kidnappings, that stuff. I always ignored these texts, thinking foolishly that I would never be a victim because I was quote unquote smart enough to stay out of trouble, not go out alone late at night. All the cliches. I seriously regret this behavior now, and to anyone listening to this, please never think that you're 100% safe, no matter your level of preparedness. Always do your best to stay observant and careful. The first incident wasn't too unusual. I was just a block or two from my apartment building one day in the early evening. It was still light outside. I was walking my dog Sesame, a cute Shiba Inu who just looks like a fluffy goofy puppy and has never been frightening or particularly protective in his life. As I was heading back home, I passed a 
small parking lot and into a large van. I could see a man in his early 60s sitting in the driver's seat smoking a cigarette. He was staring at me. As I passed, he actually leaned out of his car and called out to me, Hey, you there? That's a cute dog. What's his name? I should mention this isn't even my first story like this. I have a pretty intense fear of strangers because of other incidents in my life. Being pretty wary for this reason, I ignored him and just walked faster. I heard a car door shut behind me and turned quickly to see that he had gotten out of his van and was slowly walking toward me. He called out to me again, Hey, baby, I just want to see your dog. Come back. His phrasing pissed me off and I gripped my dog's leash and started to speed walk away from him, starting to feel nervous. My heart was beginning to pound but I kept telling myself over and over that I was overreacting and it was just my paranoia acting up and there was nothing to worry about. Boy, was I wrong. I managed to turn the corner and was about to cross the final park before getting to my apartment. In my fear over the bank guy, I wasn't paying attention as much as I usually do to what was in front of me. I looked back over my shoulder and the guy had stopped following me. He was, however, standing in the middle of the sidewalk with a huge creepy grin on his face. I whirled back around with my eyes glued to my building. I only needed to walk another half a block and I'd be home. I was going to get away from him and his creepy van. Just when I thought I was safe, a group of five or six men came from the sidewalk of the park I wasn't watching. They were all tall and intimidating in stature and all of them were laughing and looking right at me. Out of the corner of my eye, the van guy had started walking towards me as well. I remember he was whistling. I again picked up my pace and desperately searched for my keys in my pocket as I hurried to the door. The group of men then veered towards me, partially cutting me off, and in all my stupid politeness I stopped. They grinned at me with sick, perverted smiles, obviously checking me out. Looking up and down my body, it made me sick. I tried not to panic and inched closer to my apartment. Hey, what's your name? Where are you going? What's your Snapchat? Is that your apartment? Can we come over? Do you smoke? They all barraged me with questions one after another. I tried to refuse them, stammering no thank you. I saw the van guy come and join their group, leering at me. While I inched away, they inched closer. One of them then reached out for me, his fingers actually touching my arm. I leapt back, trying not to start crying, but Sesame suddenly lunged at them, his teeth bared, a horrifying snarl ripping from his throat. Every bit of cute Shiba personality was gone on, and he looked like he was wanted to tear one of these guys' throats out. It startled them enough that I was able to turn and sprint the final distance to my building, locking the door behind me. I fell to the floor inside my building, hugging Sesame. However, the entire front of my building was glass, and to my horror and disbelief, the group of men came and stood in front of the windows, grinning at me, laughing, and making kissy faces and lewd gestures at me. The apartment manager came out and called the cops on them, but they ran away. I made it back home and scrubbed myself in the shower, crying and shaking with fear. Sesame got a special dinner that evening, and I kept telling myself that they just wanted to mess with me and I was never in any real danger. Stupid of me, I know now. About a month later, when I had finally managed to be able to walk outside my apartment without severe anxiety, I was actually planning on moving a bit farther away from campus. It was still going to be in a sketchy neighborhood, but the thought of those men knowing where I live kept me up at night. My apartment actually hired a security guard to be there 24-7 after someone had broken into the building, smashed all the windows, destroyed some of the furniture and stolen a bunch of bikes. Of course, my bike got stolen. Anyways, I was heading home from class and it was a beautiful day. I actually felt pretty happy for once and popped my earbuds in on the last few blocks before I got home. Stupid, I know. After a block or so, I started to feel like someone was watching me. My palms started sweaty. I glanced behind me, trying not to look obvious and a tall man was about 20 feet behind me, staring straight at me. I snapped my head back around and ripped out my earbuds. Though, I thought, it can't be one of them. I was just jumping to conclusions given my anxiety disorder and paranoia surely, but there was something familiar about him. My heart started racing as I hoped to god the others weren't waiting for me around the corner of my building, ready to jump me. I walked faster, wishing Sesame was with me. I was too afraid to look back at him as I fumbled with my keys and wrenched the door open as hard as I could. This turned out to be a crucial mistake. As I ran to the elevator, trying to breathe a sigh of relief, I saw with absolute horror that the man had caught the door I had thrown wide open and was slowly coming into the building with me. He paused, standing away from me, but close enough that I could hear his ragged breathing and smell of alcohol coming off him. My heart was thudding in my chest now, and I struggled to think clearly. The apartment manager was already home for the day, and I was completely alone in the lobby. There were no other doors out of that room, and the stranger was blocking my way to the door. The security guard, supposed to be keeping an eye on the building, was nowhere to be seen. The elevator came, and I tried to run into it and slam my hand over the door close button as fast as I could. I pushed my floor button and huddled in the far corner 
corner of the elevator. I started to once again try to catch my breath, but right when the door was almost closed, he stuck his hand in. I couldn't believe it. He waited until the door was just about to close and then he stopped it. He was standing close enough that there was no way that was a mistake. My stomach dropped and a suffocating sense of dread crept in. I kept my head down as he joined me. My desperate hope that he was just a dirty Druka resident of the building was dashed when he didn't press any buttons. I don't know why I didn't run out of the elevator or try to leave the building again. I was paralyzed with fear and all I could do was watch as the door closed and sealed my fate. The elevator was filled with the stench of alcohol and body odor. If I wasn't so terrified I may have gagged. It was nauseated. I couldn't look at it. I couldn't move. I tried to scream at myself in my head to press the wrong button and try to escape him but I was completely petrified. He leaned closer to me and I heard him breathe in deeply and very quietly sigh like he was content. I felt tears well in my eyes and the seconds it took to reach the top floor where I lived felt like hours. I saw no way I could escape the sick, drunk guy who was smelling me. In the reflection of the elevator walls I could make out his disgusting smile. He was staring directly at me, his hands in his pockets, clearly holding onto something. I'm not religious but I prayed that I would make it to my door in time. I realized he probably wasn't going to attack me in the elevator. There was a large camera in the ceiling. I looked up at it, feeling a tear spill out of my eye as I did so, hoping that whoever saw the tape eventually would identify this man. The worst part of all of this is that I've trained in martial arts and self-defense since I was about 8 years old. I thought of myself as stronger and braver than I was acting. I should know what to do. I should be strong enough to do it. But no matter how many times I had disarmed, thrown, or choked out attackers in the studio, nothing totally prepares you for the dread of a real life situation. As the elevator reached my floor, I managed to snap out of my stupor long enough to dash through the door and run to my apartment unit. I nearly missed the keyhole but I threw open my door. I was nearly through when my backpack snagged on the outside handle of the door, trapping me. I heard the man walking quickly to my door, a low chuckle building in his throat as he watched me panic and struggle to get free. I felt like a mouse bee watched by a cat, trapped and helpless, so close to escaping. I finally gave up and shoved my arms through the straps, abandoning my backpack. As I did so, the man suddenly reached out for me. I was able to slam the door shut, deadbolting it. The gust of air from the door slamming brought his disgusting smell in with me and in my terror and disgust I retched violently. I looked through the peephole. He was staring right at me, pressing his forehead against the door, his mouth bent in a furious scowl. He swore at me and ripped my backpack off the handle of the door, slamming it to the ground. I winced as I heard my laptop thud. I was still too terrified to say anything but I grabbed the knife I kept by my door in my hand, ready if he tried anything. After a few minutes of staring at my door, jiggling the handle, licking the peephole and making obscene motions at it. He unzipped my backpack, dumping its contents on the floor. He picked up my bag, sniffing it and leering at the peephole as he did so, like he knew I was watching him. I couldn't look away, again paralyzed in fear. Finally he left, using the elevator visible from my door like nothing had happened. I continued to stare out the peephole for what felt like an eternity and then finally called the apartment manager, feeling my anger sinking and that the security guard hadn't been anywhere in sight, not paying attention. It turns out he had fallen asleep eating Taco Bell and watching movies on his phone. He was only 10 feet away from the elevator the entire time, sleeping in the office behind a closed door. They fired him, but the creepy guy was never caught, and neither were any of the others. I don't even know for sure if this man was part of the original group. I was honestly too terrified to look much at their faces during the first incident. I moved out of my apartment a week later, staying with my boyfriend at the time for the remainder of my lease, and keeping Sesame with me at all times when possible. A few more things happened while I lived in that city, from having to call in a gunfight from outside my new apartment window to having to pick up my friend who was being followed by a van, to having to evacuate during an arson incident. There are nice things about that city too, but during my time there, besides learning the police department was absolutely useless and corrupt to nearly escape me with my life multiple times, I couldn't be happier to be far far away from there, and doing a lot better with my fear and anxiety. I want to start by saying that this isn't the first bad experience I've had dog sitting, but it's definitely the worst. So I started dog sitting back when I was 13 and made good money doing it. I'm currently 19 and this happened when I was 18. I set up an easy way for people to contact me about dog sitting. I put out a post on Facebook and Instagram about it often and would get people in my messages asking to dog sit. I got a notification from Instagram one day stating someone was trying to message me. I accepted it and the message said that me and my wife are looking to find a dog sitter while we go away 
away for a week to Florida. You will have to work the 4th to the 11th this month. We will pay you $300 for the week. You're welcome to stay at our house or go back to your own home. I started talking back and forth with this man and we're going to call him Mr. Brown for the sake of privacy. So I agreed to take the gig and told him I would stay at his house for the week. Once I got to his house, I was introduced to his two dogs, Mina and Letty. Mina was a little Yorkie and Letty was a blue hound. I was shown around his house, which was surrounded by 76 acres. I live in a farm town and live on 32 acres myself, so staying here didn't really freak me out. The closest neighbors were pretty far away and you would actually have to drive there if you wanted to talk to them. They told me their rules and when to feed them, stuff like that. Then Mrs. Brown told me about the nearest neighbor. In her words, she was a nice person, just a little drugged up and confused. She mentioned how sometimes she would pull into their driveway instead of hers it would end up mistaking Mrs. Brown for her dead daughter. Hearing this made me feel pretty bad for her and I know all too well how hard it is for parents to lose their child because of how my parents were after losing my brother in a car accident. Mrs. Brown said she shouldn't do anything bad though and if she came up to the house just play her back home and she should leave with no problems. After they left I was down to watch movies and just chill with the dogs. The first two days were fine with no hiccups. The third day however the old woman who I call Ms. Rose did pull into the driveway. I came outside as she was getting out of the car. She looked up to see me and immediately she got back in her car and left. I chalked it up to her realizing it was the wrong house which she saw me and went back inside. Later that night though I got a call from Mrs. Brown asking if I was okay. I said yes and asked why. She then went on to tell me about how she got a call from Ms. Rose and that she said there was a robber at their house. I explained what happened and she just laughed and said she must have been confused and forgot that they were out of town. I ended the phone call making a note to go over there tomorrow to clear the air about me being a robber. Once I went to bed that night though things got crazy. I woke up at around 2 in the morning hearing a light scratching sound that almost sounded like ticking coming from outside the window. At first I thought it might have been a bird or some sort of mite creature and left it alone. But at the noise kept me from falling back asleep I wanted to scare it away so I got up and went to open the blinds but screamed when I lifted the blinds at the sight of Ms. Rose trying to pry the window open with a pair of pliers. Once she saw me though she started banging on the window with the pliers. The dog started barking now and I quickly got up, told the dogs to follow me, grabbed my phone, and ran to a room with no windows which was the bathroom. I locked the door in case she got in. I called the cops and explained the situation quickly giving them the address from what I could remember. She said that police would be there in 10 minutes, which for the area I was in is pretty good considering their house is in a pretty rural area. I had gotten the dogs to be quiet and put them in the closet connected to the bathroom to make sure she didn't hear them. I was trying to stay calm and I could still hear the pounding on the window as I continued to talk to the operator and then I heard glass shatter. I cursed under my breath trying trying not to cry. I was really scared and pretty much ready to cry from the fear of being beaten to death by someone who was clearly not in the right state of mind. I was whispering what was happening to the operator hiding in the back of the bathroom in the tub. After about 4 minutes of pretty much silence I heard footsteps and I could see feet under the other side of the door and I cursed to myself again. I then see Ms. Rose get on her hands looking under the crack and I mistakenly let out a gasp. She gets up quickly pounding at the door. I can tell she's still using the pliers. I am at this point crying asking the operator where the police or to which she responds three minutes. Those three minutes felt like forever. I screamed at Ms. Rose to please go away and she screamed back that I shouldn't be here. Once I heard the sound of police cars and about a minute later of them trying to kick the door down though I felt a little better. I was told to stay on the line until the intruder was caught and that police were not trying to get into the house. Eventually they did get into the house and I yelled to get their attention not that they needed it. She was still banging on the door. Once they got into the room she was told to drop her weapon and she obeyed saying she didn't do anything wrong. They got her in cuffs and a police officer told me it was okay to unlock the door to which I slowly got up and unlocked the door. After being taken to the police station and giving them my story for their report, I went to my parents house I was just as scared to be alone. The next day I called Mrs. Brown and explained the situation. I got full payment even after telling them I wasn't going back to the house. They called me a few days later saying that Ms. Rose was under the influence of drugs and in her words she told the police she decided to take care of the robber, which was me, herself and that she did nothing wrong. She was charged with breaking and entry which is kind of ironic. After that I quit dog sitting and I am a lot more paranoid and always make sure my doors and windows are locked. So Ms. Rose let's not meet again. this happened years ago. I was walking through the hills of a provincial park with my dog during winter, so the sun set much faster than I expected and before I could get back to my car. Once the sun was gone and all you could see was darkness, I was walking slowly through a field when out of nowhere I had, to this day, the most gut-wrenching, undeniable feeling I was being watched. I turned around, and in the distance, I saw a figure standing there, darker than the night sky around us. The instant I saw him, my stomach dropped and my body literally froze. I knew at that moment, somehow, he was coming from 
for me. I grab my dog's leash and we book it. I mean sprinting, full speed, up and down hills, around trees, down embankments. I was running so fast as if my life was dependent on it, and to this day I'm sure it was. I make the 30 to 45 minute trip in 10, and all that stands before me in my car is this switchback you have to go back and forth up if you want to reach the top. So once again, I am giving it all I got, running up this switchback as fast as I possibly can, and once I reach the top and look back down, who else but this person chasing me, and does he go up the switchback like how any sane person would? Of course not. He starts sprinting right up the middle of this switchback, headed straight for me. I scream at him, screw off, and he doesn't say anything, not a single word, just continues running right at me. I am so lucky my car was at the top of that hill, because as I ran towards it, I dropped my keys and are fiddly with him trying to open the door. Just in time, I get the door open, throw my dog in and shut the door behind me just as this guy reaches us. Best part is, there were no other vehicles parked anywhere around us, but where did this person park? Yeah, right next to me, of all places. Now this guy literally jumps into his truck so fast, and to this day I have never seen a better example of speeds out of there like a bear on cocaine. He guns the engine so hard, black smoke is blasting out the back as he swerves out of there, leaving skin marks behind him. I sat in the back of my vehicle for hours afterwards, shaking and crying, knowing I was this close to whatever he had planned for me. And that's why I'm sharing this story in hopes that people won't ignore that gut feeling, the little voice in the back of your head that tells you to run. If I did that day, I never would have noticed him in time and would not have had the head start I needed to escape. Always trust your gut feelings and intuition. It might really be the deciding factor in if this is your final day on earth or not. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. gin, smokable stimulants, and sleep deprivation. The perfect ingredients in a recipe for disaster, especially when the pot they're brewing in is a mentally ill squatter that likes to wave around big sticks when he's mad. The man described as Darrell, my dad's old high school buddy, the 40-something year old antagonist of one of my life's more traumatic events, which took place back in 2015. It was a warm, fragrant springtime afternoon, and I was an 18-year-old kid coming home from a day of class at the local community college, coming home to my dad's anarchist trap house that my friend and I decided to move into as roommates a year before. It was a small, one-story, downtown house in an upscale neighborhood, and it had five to seven vagabond guests or couch surfers at any given time. That's up to ten people under one roof, or two, if you count the shed. Conflict was inevitable. I entered in through the side gate, from the well-manicured, street-facing front into the neglected, junk-filled back. There he was, sitting at his crooked, worn-out metal table placed right in my path to the bent-up screen door. Daryl was dressed in his finest filthy, brown jacket, as he carved his his latest piece of stick art. He looked up at me with glazed eyes and an absent expression. This struck me as odd, since, although he was weird, he wasn't usually this weird. When I looked closer at his table, I saw why. Along with his usual random pieces of metal and rocks he used for his wands, there was a blackened glass tube, a lighter, and a four-fifths empty gallon jug of rock gut gin. The gin I had watched him bring home with him the night before. The night before, he had been partying, having fun, and acting fairly normal. But the presence of the charred, straight shot glass pipe on the table explained how he had stayed awake this whole time. I gave Darrell a modest greeting, to which he responded with an awkward head movement and unfriendly grunt as he continued to aggressively carve a stick. This body language gave me a dark vibe, full of animosity. What I experienced while walking it was unusual, but nothing too crazy to me. I had seen worse in that house, and at such a chip on my shoulder, I was almost itching for some kind of altercation to take my anger out on on a daily basis. If this was my opportunity to protect my territory, I would do it with pleasure. I was a massive stoner and a bit of an alcoholic at the time, and upon arriving home, I usually would have stopped by my friend's room to say hi and smoke a bowl or two, but he was at his mom's house that night, which meant that, unfortunately, he was not able to witness the events that would be taking place over the following couple of hours. Although I had substance issues, I was still an honor roll student, so instead of smoking a bowl, I just went straight back to my room to get some economics homework done. I had worked for about 45 minutes before focusing became impossible due to loud noises and yelling coming from the kitchen which was just beyond the hallway entrance, mere feet from my bedroom door. This was simply not something I would tolerate, so I grabbed my 2009 digital camera, I didn't have a smartphone, and made my way to the heart of the commotion. Holding my camera, I entered the kitchen to find my dad and his two tough biker friends huddled together near the sink. Daryl had, more or less, cornered the dent. His arms were outstretched, making his jacket appear like brown wings as he held up his largest stick in one hand, like Rafiki's staff in The Lion King. When I had walked in, I said nothing to alert him to my presence. 
minutes. I simply held up the camera to record him as he verbally spilled his darkest demons on all of us. He was belligerently screaming at my dad and his friends, but his biggest target was Joe, our lovable old biker dude who has been my dad's friend my whole life, and who never treated Darl with anything but friendliness and respect. Darl was screaming about how he was a racist, while Joe continued to deny it, raising his voice to match. While I can't speak for Joe's personal beliefs, I will emphasize that Daryl did not face any sort of discrimination under our roof. He may have felt disrespected at times, but his behavior was often unacceptable and any confrontation was well deserved. During one of his loud, drunken, barely coherent rants, Daryl had begun hitting all the wooden cabinets with his stick, pairing his screamy with the crazed rhythms of a wild man. I continued to hold the camera out towards him, making no attempt to hide it or leave the room, all while he creeped his way towards me, whacking each cabinet along the way. You may see me as naive and crazy to do this, but I was filled with excitement. My desire to record him was mainly for evidence. He turned his head to face mine at an unnatural speed. His face squinched into a scowl as he laid eyes on me and my camera. With his rock gut gym breath, he got up in my face, waving his stick around in his hand as if to threaten me. Get that camera out of my face, boy. He slurred. I cursed back at him in defiance and held firm as he tried to grab it from me. We wrestled back and forth from my green digital camera for about 10 seconds as it continued to record. Fortunately, I was able to get it back, and as I did, he moved to get close and intimidate me again, more aggressively now. Even though he was 10 inches taller than me, 18 year old Mimi had a tendency to be numb to situations like this, and my fear response had lessened with time. As he towered over me, my right hand rested around the closed lid of an empty cookie jar sitting on the kitchen table. At that moment, I knew, if he got out of hand, that jar would be my last resort. I loosened my grip on the jar, pushed Daryl away, and watched him move back from me and make his way back to torment my dad and his friends again. I took this opportunity to put my camera back in my room room. It came out a minute later to find that my dad and the biker dudes had gone to my dad's back room. Daryl had gone back to his dirty mattress in the dark shadows of the living room in the front of the house. Things had lulled, and I still had homework to do, so I went back to my room. After about a half hour, darkness had fallen outside, and things were too quiet. Something had to be wrong. I wanted to check on my dad and his friends, so I left my room and found myself alone in an eerie, grimy kitchen with the lights on and dark windows facing the night. There was a soft mumbling to my left. Daryl was kneeling in the dim rays of light, cast from the kitchen to the contrasting darkness of the living room. He was holding two billiard balls he had taken from the pool table, one in each upward facing hand, and outstretched arms. His head rolled back to face the ceiling, in a perfect position to channel demons like an antenna. Like his head, his eyes were rolled back, with only the bloodshot whites being visible. As his head gently jerked around with his satanic mumbling, the dim light reflected off his bald scalp, shaven smooth with a razor. His unkempt salt and pepper goatee was specked with foamy dribble. Second Seconds after I saw him, he jolted into life like an animated corpse. His face contorted into a hatred I haven't seen before or since, as he lodged toward me from his kneeled position, still holding the pool balls in each hand. Thinking quickly, I grabbed the cookie jar and, with Daryl close on my tail, retreated to my dad's room. Fortunately, the lights were on here as well, and the room had a door connecting to the backyard. He caught up to me there, so I pushed him back into a ragged wooden table in the corner, which broke under his weight. He quickly recovered, and sneered back at me as he bolted up from the wreckage. As he did so, I stumbled out the back door, tripped backward down the two concrete steps, and landed on the cement patio bordering the grass. Time had condensed in that moment, as all of this occurred in just a few seconds. When I landed, the cookie jar in my right hand had broken and I was bleeding heavily from a large gash on my palm caused by the broken porcelain, but there was no pain. I wound up my pitching arm from my position on the ground and, as he was about to make his way through the back door, I launched the jagged remnants of the cookie jar, which still weighed at least a pound or two, through the air. Lucky strike, the cookie jar crashed through the glass window in the back door and hit Daryl squarely on the forehead. He went limp and collapsed onto the floor of my dad's room. He didn't get up. It was his turn to bleed. Abby faced this entire situation alone, I made my way to the shed to find my dad, his 60-year-old biker friend friend Joe, and Joe's other biker friend. I opened the shed door and there they were, all sitting in a close circle, whispering to each other. Tough men, cowery, and this tiny one-room living space in the corner of the yard. These three grown men left 18-year-old me alone to fend for myself in a house with a violent psychopath, but I forgave them. They genuinely seemed terrified, and I was thanked profusely by all of them for solving their problem. I appreciated the ego boost, but we still had two problems. I was bleeding heavily, and Daryl was unconscious and bleeding twice as much as I was. I was advised to wrap my wounds, get in my car, and drive the 25 minutes to my grandma's house in the woods. I bled in my car all the way to grandma's house. When I was there, I soaked my wounds in soapy water, hoping to avoid getting stitches since I still didn't know if I was considered a criminal or not. 
and wanted to lie low. About 20 minutes into soaking, I got a call from a number I didn't recognize. I had a feeling it was related to the event that had just taken place and I was correct. It was a deputy from the sheriff's department at the scene of the crime. I was quaking but explained to her exactly what happened in complete honesty. Her response filled me with lightness like a helium balloon. It was self-defense, she had said, and Daryl was obviously blacked out and having a psychotic episode. According to the police, Daryl was found lying in a pool of blood on the front porch. A neighbor had called the police and, when they arrived, Daryl had woken up and begun to attack them, screaming about racism. Apparently, he believed the police were racist and there to harass him. He believed he was becoming a victim of racist police brutality and decided to attack the police before they attacked him. He attacked a female police officer too. That cool. After learning that, I got back in the car to drive myself to the emergency room and continued to make a bloody mess of it for the whole 25 minute drive there. That night, I stayed over at my grandma's house. When I went back to my dad's house the next day, I learned a few details from my dad about what happened after I left. Daryl had bled so much that my dad and his friends were unable to absorb it faster than it was coming out, even after using all the towels in the house. It was at that point that they dragged him onto the front porch. They wanted to be done with him and let society deal with it. Daryl got treated at the hospital himself that night and spent the next two weeks in jail for disorderly conduct. I'm happy to say that he never came back to our house and I never saw him again. In a sense, my dad and his friends were right. I did solve a problem. The guy was a squatter and a menace, and now he was gone. This part, he was so messed up on drugs, he could hardly remember what happened. He thought it was Joe the biker who hit him. He has no memory of fighting with me. Now, seven years later, this event is still stands out to me in the story of my life. I learned a lot from spending a year living in an anarchist trap house, but the biggest thing I learned is to stand up for yourself and your territory, even when it makes people not like you, and to always watch out for tweakers when they drink cheap gin. For some context, I'm a 32 year old female. This happened to me when I was about 25 or 26. I work full time as a researcher at a university, which is where these encounters took place. I'm not a professor or anything, and because of my age at the time, I could have easily been mistaken for just another student wandering around campus. On some days, when the weather was nice, I would prefer to spend my lunch hour strolling around the university grounds outside, or sitting underneath a shady tree on a bench, enjoying the time I was not sitting in a cramped corner of a lab. On one of these days, I was sitting on a bench enjoying the fresh air, and a male student walking by asked if he could sit next to me. I'm a pretty shy and awkward kind of person, so even though I really would have preferred sitting alone, I said, sure. He initiated simple conversation, to which I obliged, but being careful not to be too forthcoming. He mentioned he had seen which departmental building I came and went from, which slightly alarmed me, given I had never seen this person before in my life. But, I pushed the thought from my mind. After all, the weather had been decent lately, and I had spent nearly all my lunch hours for the past week outside. He asked if I was studying within the mentioned department, to which I told him that I was not a student, but rather I worked there. He told me he was an engineering student, and then followed up with asking me out to coffee sometime. I apologized, and told him that I had a boyfriend and would have to decline. We parted ways after that, and I assumed I probably wouldn't see him around again. About a week or two went by, and I was spending another lunch hour outside on campus, sitting on a different bench somewhere. Seemingly out of nowhere, the same man from before asked if he could sit next to me again. Admittedly, I don't remember what he started talking to me about at first. My mind was really and I was rather uncomfortable having to potentially turn this guy down a second time. Sure enough, he asked me again if we could go out for coffee sometime. I apologized and reminded him that I had a boyfriend and would not be meeting him for coffee. And again, he left after that. I was feeling rather anxious now, but it still hadn't reached a level where I felt I had to be too concerned. A few days later, I had finished work and was leaving the building to walk to where I had parked my car. The university charges a fortune for parking passes, even if you're employed by them, so I had always opted for free street parking about a 10 minute walk away from campus. My walkie route would take me down several quiet residential streets with minimal car traffic. Even pedestrian traffic was pretty sparse on the busiest of days. It wasn't until I was about halfway to my car, down one of these quiet back streets, that I noticed someone walking directly across the street from me, but keeping a few paces behind. I noticed him from my peripheral vision and didn't want to fly out turn around to stare at him. It was wasn't uncommon to see someone else by any means, I was just always trying to be aware of my surroundings by walking the streets alone. I had to make a few turns coming up anyways, and the chance that they would be going the same way as me was slim. But he did. He made all the turns I did, still walking on the sidewalk across from me, a few steps behind. I still did not want to look at whoever this was. I didn't want him to know that I was aware of what I thought he was doing. I quickened my pace to a 
speedy walk, I was approaching the first of two busier streets before I would reach my car. His pace quickened to keep up with me. That was the moment I panicked, the moment I was sure that he was indeed following me. After that, I started a full-out jog to cross the first of the busier streets. He ran to keep up behind me and was now on the same side of the street I was. I was now nearly at my car. I had to cross the last busy street and get about 100 meters and I would be there. But it was crossing the street that worried me. I often had to stop and wait a good minute or so before it was clear enough to do so. If this were the case, he would catch up with me. As if the stars aligned, as soon as I made it running to the busy street, I had a gap to cross. I booked it as fast as I could, finally turning around once I had made it, to look and yell at the man who had been pursuing me. It was him, and I could have suspected, but now it was confirmed. It was the engineering student whom I had turned down for coffee. Stop following me. I yelled at him from across the busy street. Can I just talk to you? He yelled back. I didn't even answer him, but I mean, the answer should have been obvious from the start, and I was certainly never going to give my time to anyone who had just followed and then chased me for about one kilometer. I keep moving quickly to my car, so determined to get out of there that I didn't even care if he saw which car was mine. He had given up following me and never tried to cross the road to, to my relief. I got hold and broke down. I mean, worse things had happened to other people, no doubt, and I was not harmed, fortunately, but I was shook. I had some anxieties walking to and from work after that. It wasn't long before a coworker and I would walk most of the distance back to our cars together after work. I'd even changed where I started parking for a time. A few weeks had passed since the incident, and I had not seen him around campus at all. I had started spending my lunches in the lab instead of outside, but occasionally I would go to the student center to buy lunch instead. This one particular day, the food court in the student center was packed, almost shoulder to shoulder. I was standing in line at a burger stall, and I heard a guy try and get someone's attention through the crowd. I look up, and it's him again, waving to me and trying to make his way through the people. I panicked, and even though I'm terribly shy, I started a scene and yelled to him to leave me alone. His face dropped instantly as people stared at us, and he slinked back into the sea of students. My heart was pounding, and I was shaking. I don't even remember if I ended up getting food after that. I went back to work, and from then on, was even more focused on my surroundings than I ever was before. It's been five or six years since then now, and I still work at the university. I am so relieved to say I never saw him again after the food court, and haven't had any other harrowing accounts on campus. I am still diligent about being aware of my surroundings, especially when I have to walk to and from campus alone. I never asked the guy's name, so I couldn't even report an incident to campus police or anything. All in all, I'm just glad I never saw him again, and I can only hope he never did this to any other girl before or after me. I was 17 when this story happened three years ago now. I was working at an old pizza shop right on the edge of my town. For context, the town I was in is an affluent, suburban town, surrounded by a bypass which loops around the town. Around my town is some farmland and main roads, where all of the blue-collar workers moved to after the town was gentrified 10 to 15 years back. This pizza shop was around for 20 years, and was very catered to these same blue-collar workers. It's around 9 at night, and a call comes in for two pizzas and a 2 liter of soda. I'm the only driver in in, so I have to take the delivery out. It's about a 10 minute drive to get to the location. There I have to drive up a long, gravel driveway that took 5 minutes to get up. My car really couldn't handle the gravel and how rough it was. Arriving at the place I see a nice house, and two barns plotted across the land, with weak 5 to 6 feet tall surrounding the whole property. I've always been really anxious around farms because of how creepy I think they are. Being at this place when I felt truly all alone really started to make my anxiety flare. I decided to call the number on the order because I have no idea where this guy wants me to go and drop off his food. After about another five minutes of absolute silence, the man picks up. He had a very deep and raspy voice, like he's been a career smoker, which didn't do anything to help me feel better. I was told to meet him at his truck at the far barn on his property. I am now properly pooping myself as my mind races of all of the worst possible things that could happen to me. I pull myself together and muster further into this guy's property. I see the man's truck as I round one of those cylinder storage units where I see his truck and him inside. Instead of getting out, I call him and ask him how we should do the transaction. In that same deep voice, he instructs me to get out of my car and put all of the food onto his truck bed. Since he paid with his credit card already, I thought this would have been over in 10 seconds. I do what he tells me to do and walk over to the passenger window so that he can sign his receipt. The man looks to be around in his middle 40s, heavy set, with a scraggly black beard and a trucker hat. I'm a pretty skinny guy, so with my mind already racing on the being kidnapped or murdered, I really don't feel safe around this guy. I ask him if he has a pen on him because I forgot to bring one. I was pretty bad at my job and he did not have any cash on him. He stares at me with these 
cold eyes and points into the back of his truck saying to me if you ask me for a tip I'm going to be sticking this tip down your throat where he has a double barrel shotgun just in the back of his car. I'm frozen in fear as I'm registering that this man has just threatened to kill me. Not only that, but this is the second time this has happened this shift. Yeah, I kid you not. The first time was because I messed up the address for a house and a man in his 60s wearing a cowboy hat comes outside and says he has the right to shoot trespassers when I was just trying to see if I was at the right house. The only thing I can muster out is okay and I get back into my car and I get out of that farm. I was going so fast that I screwed up my car from my car bouncing around on that gravel path. I go 80 all the way back to the pizza parlor where I tell my coworkers what happened. None of my coworkers took me seriously and just thought I was playing this up for a joke. I go home and forget about it pretty quickly but a year later I'm working the lunch shift and the same man calls in and orders a pizza. Now at this point I am refusing to take this order but this was during the pandemic and the place was on its last legs already so management forced me to go in anyways. It was only one or two in the afternoon on a Sunday so at least my fear of the dark would be covered. I get there and the man is waiting for me at his actual house. He recognized me and out of all things started apologizing to me for what he said. He was excusing it saying that he just started going through a divorce and was struggling with his emotions. I just wanted the whole thing to be over with and he gave me $60 for what happened. Still, to the man on the farm, I hope we never meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. So, I'm at the mindset that everyone should know a little bit about cars. I've always been mechanically inclined and I think that may have saved me. I was using dating apps a few years ago, met this guy, he seemed super nice. We talked for a few weeks before I was willing to meet with him. His dad owned a local gun store where I would go get my target stuff. I used to be in a woman's league for competition shooting, so I had seen this guy around and had a decent impression of him, but wanted to be safe. He invited me to a concert at a local town site. It was a concert I really wanted to go to, and I figured it would be safe since it was at a well-known place with a lot of security. I let him pick me up because he had talked about mechanics and cars and he wanted to show me his Mustang. He bragged about how well he kept it running and how he babied it. I was into time trial racing at the time, so I was interested to see what he had done. He picks me up and we start heading to the event. Right before the exit, he says his car is acting funny. I was watching the dash, and if you've been in racing, you know our cars and trucks usually have extra accessories. Whether it's aftermarket racks and gauges or switches, there's usually something aftermarket inside the car. There was nothing extra, the car felt like it was shifting correctly, there was no shutter or noise, nothing to indicate any problems. I was like that's weird, and all I said was we should try and lip it to the concert venue, it's less than a mile away, and it's better than being stuck on Interstate 15. He agrees, and drives us very carefully the last mile. We get to the concert, and things were okay. He kept watching me, and buying me drinks. I refused to drink, so every time he gave me what I would make up an excuse and go to the bathroom and flush it. He kept making comments about how well I was handling my alcohol. I was super uncomfortable. The concert ends and it's time to leave. For context, this concert happened at the local reservation town site. And at the time, the res did not have great cell service, so I couldn't get a hold of anyone to come get me. I decided to bite the bullet, and I talk him into taking the old highway instead of the 15. It sounds silly, but when you take the old highway, even though it's slower, people are more willing to stop and help you than they are on the freeway. I figured if he was having car troubles, it would be safer, and we wouldn't have people flying by us at 80 miles per hour. We make it halfway between the town site and our town and he says the car is acting funny again and pulls over. I'm stone cold sober and didn't notice anything wrong so when I get out of the car to check it out with him. He starts making comments about how I'm drunk and I should wait in the car and that it's safer because you can't trust drunk Indians especially with a little girl like you. This dude had no idea that I'm actually native and I just had an albinism. The hair on the back of my neck are standing up so I check my phone. I just barely have service and start texting my dad. As I'm walking Walking away from the engine compartment, I noticed he was watching me, so I started acting like I was trying to get cell service to get help. Out of the corner of my eye, I watched this man take the spark plug wires off the distributor cap and switch the order. Your spark plug wires connect to the distributor cap based on the order your cylinders fire in, so doing that will either make the car run terrible or not even turn on. I managed to send my dad a picture of what he's doing, and my dad tells me to start walking. As I go to walk away, this guy gets back in the car and opens his glove box, which exposes a pistol he had. He tells me not to worry and we will be safe. I probably broke a world record for how fast I was texting my dad. He 
says to start walking and tell the guy that he is on his way and that our friends live up the road. So I do. I start walking with a purpose and take off as quick as I can. The guy is yelling after me and I yell back the wind is too loud and I can't hear you. I'll be back with our friends. I'm scared out of my mind. We are 10 miles out of town with no one around. The closest road actually lead to a cemetery so there is really no one here to help me. I get a really bad feeling the farther I get from the car. So I turn around and look. The hood is closed. His lights are on. So I decide to hide in the farm irrigation next to the road. I keep walking towards town and text my dad what's happening. I hear a car slowly coming up behind me and see a flashlight. So I press against the side of the ditch and wait for it to pass. Once I can't hear anywhere I crawl out and just kind of keep walking along the weeds. My dad texts me that he sees me. So when he pulls up I run to the truck. As we make it towards town we pass the dude and he's got like three cop cars around him. My dad tells me not to worry about what happened. I heard through the grapevine later on he had been charged with violent crimes in the past and that he had been arrested that night for concealed carry without a permit. The police never talked to me but I haven't seen that guy in town since. If I didn't have experience with cars and didn't know what he was doing I could have been dead in that ditch instead of hiding. Most communities have where you can take basic car care and maintenance courses. I highly recommend everyone takes them and at least know the basics. This dude knew I knew cars but his whole goal was to get me so drunk I wouldn't realize what was happening. So let's not meet again fake car troubles guy. I got a new job and at my job, there was this guy who used to watch me whenever he was around. We didn't work together but we worked in the same department. We did sometimes work together but it was rarely. All the weird stuff started a few months after I started a new job and moved within walking distance to my new job. One October night, I was walking home when a tall man wearing a hoodie came suddenly out of some bushes as I was walking by. I found this bizarre so before I entered my apartment, I looked back and saw him standing by some trees watching me. When he realized I saw him, he jumped behind the trees to hide. I told my boyfriend and he thought it was drug dealer. Anyway, I started walking through a different trail when a month later, I saw the same man. This time he was crouching by the trailer of some parking lot. He got up and started walking away from me but kept watching me. After a week, he showed up again but this time I was halfway to my home and he came out of hiding behind the trailer and started walking towards me. I beelined from my apartment's door and ran inside. This time he knew that I lived in which apartment as the previous times I would walk around the front door so that he wouldn't know which apartment I was in. He seemed like he was trying to figure out where I lived as he could have attacked me multiple times. It doesn't end there. I got laid off and got a new job. After three weeks of working there, I was getting on the bus when this guy who looked similar to the guy in the parking lot was watching me get on. I quickly hurried to the back of the bus. When we got to my stop, he pulled the string and got off. I got off as well, but then decided to wait for this guy to keep walking but unfortunately he slowed down his pace seemingly waiting for me to pass him. I ended up walking behind him until we got to some lights and he wouldn't move. I decided to walk fast and hide from him in case he was looking for my new job's location. During the time I worked there, I saw my ex-coworker on the train when I was heading back from my interview. He saw me going in the same direction as him and started running. He ran pretty slowly, like he had a limp or something. It was kind of strange, but anyway, I also saw him hanging out the mall when I was there with my mom, but this doesn't really matter as it's a popular place. Anyway, I got laid off from this job due to the pandemic and had a month where I did not go outside much. After a month, I got a new job with a walking distance. After one week, I was leaving work when there was a guy just watching me again and he looked similar to the previous guy watching me when I was walking home. So I ran away and got to some lights and didn't see him. For a month and a bit, I didn't see anyone. One night it was relatively warm. I was closing close to midnight and was walking home when I saw a white car parked behind some store, seemingly out of view of any security cameras. I was suspicious of it as it had its headlights and it seemed like someone was sitting in there. I'm walking by it and keep looking over my shoulder at it until I decided it was probably safe. Anyway, not a second goes by and I get this feeling I should look behind me. I look and I see my ex coworker walking towards me. I start running as fast as I could and the adrenal helped me get away. I didn't look back until I cleared some space between us and I didn't see him. Luckily, there were some men waiting for the bus at the end of the road, so I wasn't too worried he'd come running for me as I've seen him running. So, a month goes by and I didn't see him, but I assumed he was on vacation as he showed up approximately a month later. Anyway, one night in early May, I was walking over to a grocery store to pick up some groceries I really needed after work as it was only 9 at night. So as I'm walking there, some guy wearing a hoodie comes up from behind me. He starts walking towards the bus terminal 
personal, but I guess he overheard my conversation to my boyfriend as I was telling my boyfriend that I was going to the grocery store to pick up some stuff and walking home. So I get to the grocery store and get my stuff when I'm about to start walking home. I see some old looking guy dressed like a teenager standing outside of the grocery store. He was wearing the same clothes as the guy I saw earlier and he was watching me and trying to get close to me. I start telling my boyfriend to get me Uber instead and I walk over to some bags of fertilizer to hide from this guy, but he goes and starts looking for me. I stare at him letting him know that I know he is up to something messed up. He stares back with these soulless eyes and luckily then, my Uber showed up and I hopped in. I'm not sure if this guy has anything to do with my ex coworker or if he was a random psycho, but I do know that it helped me look out and it ended up saving me as I made my boyfriend meet me after work. After that, I was extremely paranoid and always on the lookout for creeps and I made my boyfriend meet me after work if it was dark out. A few days later, after no bizarre events, my boyfriend comes and meets me when I see some car with its headlights on parked in front of a store we had to pass. We start walking by it when it slowly starts driving away, seemingly watching us walking away. We get to some lights, and I see the same car now and another plaza driving slowly and watching us. Freaked out, I tell my boyfriend and he gets scared. I assumed it was my ex coworker as the car this time looked like his mom's car. I saw his mom come to pick him up at work once as she was driving a car that looked like this one. The next night, we also saw some man with a black van with the passenger door wide open hovering around it. When we passed him, he started to follow us, so we started to run a bit until we got farther away. Ten minutes later, I saw some guy wearing a hoodie hiding behind some building with his back against the wall. I don't know if the last two incidents are related, but it sure terrified me and my boyfriend. Mind you, I used to walk home by myself for a month without incidents, so I'm assuming once it was warm out. Whoever had been watching me was planning something terrifying. And after this, I changed my hours at work even though my managers gave me a hard time despite all the insane stuff I was seeing at night. I got my managers to give me rides home anytime I had to close or I would get Ubers, but I never walked again at midnight or after 10 at night even with my boyfriend. Anyway, I ended up seeing my ex coworker's car multiple times in May when my managers drove me home. Eventually, I stopped seeing his car as he realized I would never be out again at midnight. Anyway, I started getting morning shifts at work and I finally don't close anymore at work. However, I don't know if I'm done being stalked or not. Last month, the sun was starting to set at around 9 at night. I was walking by myself to the grocery store when I saw my ex coworker drive past me. I ignored it as I've seen him in this area and it's probably unrelated. Anyway, 30 minutes later as I'm walking back with my boyfriend, my boyfriend had gone to a store so my ex coworker might have thought I was alone. I see the guy who was watching me in the parking lot in the same parking lot. He's back and lurking around. He sees my boyfriend and me and starts walking away but keeping an eye on us until we get into our apartment. Unfortunately, due to having in-person classes at my university, I'm back to working until 10 at night but I have my boyfriend meet anytime I do. I'm worried it's all going to start back up again. I'm genuinely scared to be honest as this has been going on for almost a year. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This happened in 2000 or 2001. I had just moved to Southern California for college. My roommate and I, both males, early 20s, thought it would be fun to drive into Mexico because it was not that far away, maybe a couple hours, and we had never been. One set late morning, we made the drive into Tijuana, parked, and immediately hit a bar slash restaurant. It was around 1 or 2 in the afternoon. We ate tacos and drank a lot of beer and tequila. We got pretty faded. I think we had cigars too. After a couple hours, we exited onto the street pretty drunk and in very good spirits. It was still daylight, maybe in the middle of the afternoon. I think our plan was to hang out a while longer and then drive back home at dusk once we sobered up a bit. We were approached on the street by a very friendly Hispanic male. He was very short, maybe 5 foot 2, in his 30s in age, and stocky. He was literally dressed like Louis from Revenge of the Nerds, white dress shirt buttoned up all the way, tucked in, trousers hiked up high, flooding socks showing, the whole thing. He was very friendly and presented himself almost as a tour guide. Hey you guys, not from around here. Let me show you the local spots kind of presentation my first impression was very friendly and we disregarded him and said no thank you i did notice that although he was dressed like a stereotypical nerd he had some pretty hardcore tattoos on his neck still was not scared of him just didn't care for his service we kept walking and were in a busy part of town with a lot of people so really were not concerned about him at all 
but he kept on us just following us around trying to make chit chat about what bars or clubs were the best. It just seemed like he was a promoter or something. We were kind of aimlessly walking and he began to recommend different strip joints which we also disregarded. Slowly it seemed we were walking more into the outskirts of town unknowingly. I don't know how this happened, but he was always right there following us. I don't recall how, but he was finally able to get us interested in a strip joint. He pointed it out and said it was the best or something. Maybe just because he was relentless we agreed to walk over and go in. Oddly, we couldn't get in as my roommate didn't have his identification on him where we had just been drinking without issue. We ultimately walked away from this place and the follower began to ask if we had any interest in drugs and he rattled off the name of the few. This was the first time he had mentioned drugs. Like an idiot I said I was interested in a drug he mentioned. He said follow me and then led us towards a nearby bar which was now really on the outskirts of town. On the walkover my roommate quietly asked me what was I doing buying drugs from this guy but we continued. I told him it was fine. We walked into this bad two-story bar and he told my roommate to wait at the bar. He and I walked into the bathroom but I recall going into a bathroom stall with him and him asking how much drugs I wanted. I said $20 worth which was all the money I had on me. I gave him the 20 and the bathroom door opened shortly thereafter. Some other random guy came in and gave the tour guide a small bag of drugs which he then gave to me. I looked at it quickly and it seemed legit. I put it in my pocket. Well I guess it's time to get out of here right? Well this guy is kind of in my way so I make a move to pass him and say thank you. He said something like hold on a second what about the 20 you owe me? I said I already gave it to you and he reached into his pocket I remember this clear as day and pulled out a pathetic crumpled one dollar bill and said no you just gave me a one dollar bill. I got really scared. I told him I didn't have any more money which was true. The bathroom door opened and my roommate walked in and began to use the urinal on the other side from us. I felt relief he was nearby. The tour guide was telling me something about does your friend have money. I told him I didn't know. The tour guide suggested that we go to the ATM. I agreed and told my roommate to follow us. We were now back on the street in daylight following him to an ATM. My roommate didn't understand what was going on. I was whispering to him to give me $20, but he was saying he didn't have it. He may have suspected something weird was going down. We were getting back into a part of town with more people on the streets, which was comforting. I kept asking my roommate to just give me $20 so I can get this guy off our back. He finally gave me the 20 just as we were nearing an ATM. I turned confidently to the tour guide, partly because there were more people around now, and gave him the 20 with a remark like here is the 20, now screw off. He immediately grabbed the 20 and shoved it into his pocket. He demanded more money. We began walking away from him in another direction but towards a populated shopping area. He stuck right behind us and was saying scary things I can't remember. He seized my right wrist where I had a watch on that cost about $150. I wrenched my arm away from him and we kept walking away at a brisk pace, now with a lot of people around. I quickly took the watch off and put in my cargo shorts pocket. We passed by a market and two Hispanic males exited in front of us and we passed them. The tour guide yelled to them and spoke to them briefly and then all three were suddenly running at us. They pinned me to the wall off the sidewalk and the tour guide approached and put a ballpoint pin to my neck. It hurts. One of them began looking for the watch and I stopped him and simply retrieved it and gave it him. Once this happened they fought for it and my roommate and I ran away. I looked back over my shoulder and they were literally fighting each other for this watch, a metal swatch watch. We got to our car, tossed the drugs, and drove back across the border safely. Many, many years ago, before kids, rescue animals, a mortgage, and a husband, I was a travel writer in Europe. I did most of my trips alone, and this story is about the first time I visited Prague. I had never been to Prague, and the trip was last minute, so I had little time to prepare. My travel partner had dumped me in another country, and I was determined to make the best out of trip by visiting a place I'd never been. Upon arrival at the train station, I visited the accommodation office and asked for a hostel not far from the center. In my early 20s, winging it was part of the fun. These days, I'm far less adventurous. The hostel they sent me to was a sprawling, crumbling, slate gray, art decoration building on a nondescript street about a 10 minute walk to Stairmesto. The inside was probably beautiful at one time, but by the time I checked in it was full of shabby, mismatched furniture and cheap stained carpet. Most of the light fixtures were broken, leaving everything but the lobby dark and gloomy. It smelled of standy water and dust. I found my room, a double for $12 per night, and made note of the fact that I had a roommate. She wasn't there, but on her side of the room there was a suitcase 
suitcase, dressed neatly folded across the back of a plastic chair, a scattering of makeup containers on the beat-up desk, and a stack of German fashion magazines on the bed. As I had no plans or goals on this impromptu trip, so I spent the afternoon exploring Old Town Square, the Jewish Quarter, and Winchester Square. I purchased some Czech crystal for my mom and painted eggs from a street vendor for myself. I also made reservations for a sunset dinner cruise at 1 in the afternoon. At around 6 in the afternoon, I returned to my room to shower, change clothes, and unload my purchases. When I left my room about an hour later, there was no indication that my roommate had returned at any point during the day. After the cruise, I stopped at a tiny bar on Tinska and had a glass of wine. I'd heard horror stories about the dangers of Prague, but I felt no more trepidation than I did in any other large city. Sure, the cobblestone streets, fog rolling off the Via Taba, backlit gothic architecture, and winding alleys made me think of Jack the Ripper and Dracula, but in a good way. It was nearly midnight when I returned to my hostel, so I was surprised to find that my roommate still hadn't returned. That wasn't uncommon, though. Backpackers are a fickle lot. She could have gone on a short overnight trip and just left her stuff behind, hooked up with a guy or girl, and was holed up at their place or hanging out at another hostel. So I was surprised but not concerned. I took another shower before bed, however, and was surprised to find that things in the room had changed up in my return. Her bed was neatly turned down, the magazines had moved to the nightstand, and the dress was gone. The strangest thing, though, was the addition of a pink silky nightgown spread across the bed, my bed. Maybe she thought she still had the room to herself. I didn't see how, though. My shopping bags, clothes, and toiletries were in plain view. I gently moved the nightgown over to her bed and then settled it for the night as I wrote in my journal. I assumed she was in the shower or somewhere nearby, so I expected her return shortly. After about an hour, though, her side was still empty. I needed to use the restroom before I went to sleep, so I made one last trip down the hall. The building was unusually quiet. There weren't the regular sounds of chatty backpackers, the clinking of glasses, or music that would normally leak through the walls. There was nothing. It was hushed, like a church after the congregation has left. I found myself practically tiptoeing back. My room was near the end of the hall, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the corridor was darker than before. The few worky lights were blinking as they struggled to stay lit, and it reminded me of a funhouse. A tightness began to fill my stomach, and I subconsciously quickened my steps. There wasn't a soul behind me yet. I kept glancing back over my shoulder, convinced I'd see someone gaining momentum on me. The only sound was the soft bed of my flip-flops as they struck my soles. I was flooded with relief as I flung open my door, but it didn't last long. Everything was exactly as it left it, except for the silky nightgown which was now back on my bed. Sleep came at fits and starts. I left the lamp on for a while, still convinced my roommate would be right back, but the shadows it cast made the room even spookier. It was too dark with the light off. I had finally slipped into a deep sleep when I suddenly heard the door open. A man stood in the darkened doorway, the hall light behind him showing just enough for me to see his contorted face. I didn't mean to. He sobbed. You have to help me. Too confused and disoriented to be scared, I sat up, scrubbed up my eyes, and reached for the lamp switch. But once the room was light, I saw that the door was closed. There was no man in. I quickly bounded off the bed and went for the door. It was locked. Nobody could have entered without a key. In the hallway, empty. I passed the rest of the night fully clothed, sitting up in bed, and with the light on. Though I'd paid for two more nights, at 7 in the morning I gathered all my stuff and went down to the reception desk to check out. By the way, I said to the 20-something year old receptionist, my roommate never returned. I'm a little concerned. She picked up the room key, looked at it hard, frowned, and then glanced at her computer. What room were you in again? When I repeated it to her, she looked back at her screen. Ma'am, that room's been empty for three weeks and it's been clean since then. We only have six people in the whole building. The hostel has since been renovated and is now a luxury hotel. I realized that we didn't physically meet, but I thought irrelevant since I seemed to have met someone. Someone entered and left my room. I live in a medium-sized apartment building in a fairly major city. While the neighborhood I live in is more on the safe side, gun violence is very high in my city as a whole and we have a big trafficking problem. Despite this, I feel pretty safe going out, especially close to my apartment building where it is mostly well lit and I am friendly with a few of the regular homeless people. Last night, I got a reminder that my safety isn't guaranteed, and I have been pretty shaken since. Last night at around 12.20, I asked my partner if he wanted to share a joint with me, and when he declined, I locked the apartment and went downstairs myself. The exit I take spits me out on the main street, where there is still the occasional car driving by at this time. Usually, this type of human presence comforts me walking late at night, but tonight a lone black and dark blue van approached in my peripheral, and started to drive slowly, matching my walkie pace 
pace until I rounded the corner and the van was stopped by a stoplight. I found it very strange at the time, but the van was on the other side of the street and there were two other cars, so I brushed it off. Around the corner there is a little food truck area with a bunch of picnic tables. They have like Christmas tree lights hung up and a few other ambient lights that are kept on the whole night but it barely illuminates the area. As I'm walking past the picnic tables, I notice a large man dressed in dark clothes sitting alone at one of the back tables. He was wearing a hood or hat, so I couldn't see his whole face, but his eyes followed me as I walked the border of the picnic area. My usual smoke spot is behind a fence on the other side of the picnic area. I was a little shaken by spotting that man, and also didn't want to upset him by smoking near him, so I chose a slightly further spot against the side of a construction vehicle. I lit my joy and start puffing away and reading something on my phone. I soon start getting this really uneasy sensation. It felt like all my hairs were standing up and I got the most intense goosebumps I've ever felt. My phone was still playing music and as I turned it off I heard this shifting and rustling of gravel on the ground behind me. I swung my head around and saw a man reaching towards me with huge hands. I only caught a glimpse of his face before I fell to the ground. His eyes were wide, bulging, and extremely dark. They terrified me. His mouth was agape and he was basically snarling at me. He scared me so bad I fell to the ground, stumbled, and broke into a run all in like one one second. I ran for a few seconds before I peeked behind my shoulder and saw him a couple yards behind me. At this point I saw it was definitely the man who was sitting at the picnic table and I now saw he was wearing what looked like a dirty bucket hat slash fishing hat. He had shoulder length dirty light colored hair and was way taller than me so at least 6 foot. He was definitely gating on me as I had lost ground by turning around and I am not in the best of shape to begin with. I was about to reach the first entrance to the building but the issue was one there were double doors at this entrance that closed quite slowly slowly into. The only way up was an elevator so if he got inside with me I was out of luck. I kept running, taking my chances with my running ability versus quickly opening doors ability. I kept running along the other side of the building to get to the second entrance to the building. This one is just two single doors which open to the stairwell up to my apartment. It's above the second floor, that's all I'll say because I'm still scared. As I'm nearing this entrance, I see another man who appears to be speed walking directly towards me from the opposite direction. I should note that throughout this I have been hearing the growling slash snarling of the first guy behind me, and as the second man gets closer I hear he is also growling. I reach the keypad, unlock the first door, and quickly slam it closed behind me until I hear the lock click again. The second man reached the door first, and I saw his face more clearly as it slammed against the glass window of the door. He was also tall with longer hair, and I remember he was wearing overalls. But I mostly remember his wild eyes and his teeth that he gnashed at me right before I turned away, opened the second door, and booked it up the stairs. I didn't even stop until I was in my apartment mid, had all the doors locked, and was under the covers. I think in retrospect I didn't hear any sign of them following me up the stairs, but I was so convinced they were still on my tail. I think the only reason I got away from them was that they didn't know about this side entrance to my building, so they didn't expect me to keep running past the first entrance. I got up to get my inhaler, was having a near asthma attack at this point, and peeked out the window, my heart sank. I saw the same van that had creeped me out earlier parked across the street from the entrance to my building. The entrance is like right below my apartment window. I then looked down to see three men pacing along the side of the building, including the two that had chased me. I ducked down fearing they would see me. A few minutes later they start shining flashlights into the windows of apartments. At first I think of course it's only my apartment but after a while it's clear they're just searching for me. At this point I try to call my building manager to let him know about the situation and he sent out a text alert to our all building list. I was so paranoid another innocent person would be accosted by them so I called the police. They told me they were on their way and to stay out of the window in case they were armed. A few minutes later the men are spooked by a faraway police siren and get in the van and peel away. I think it was from a different police call though because when the officer arrived to our building the siren wasn't on. I spent a long sleepless night thinking they'd come back but they never did. Definitely going to avoid being alone at night from now on. I asked one of the homeless guys I am friendly with if he saw anything suspicious last night but he said he hadn't. They couldn't have been residents because they didn't leave after management sent that alert to us. The part that sticks with me the most is the growling and intense look in both their eyes. I don't know if they were on drugs or what, they never said any words to me or each other. Haven't heard any updates from the cops but it's only been a few hours and they didn't seem that interested in my statement as the van had disappeared when they left. To the two men who growled at me and chased me into my apartment, let's not meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
I went on a Tinder date some time ago while I was adjusting to a new city I had moved to. I didn't really know anybody there so I used some online dating apps to see the dating scene around town. I landed one from a girl that seemed just like an artsy hippie type of girl. We had a few exchanges through the Tinder app and then decided to meet up for a drink. I picked her up at her house and she greeted me at the door and gave me a hug. She said the name of a local bar she wanted to go to for us to chat and get to know each other. I told her I would drive and proceeded to my car. The first red flag I noticed was when I walked to my car and opened the door, she had just followed me to the driver's side and was standing behind me staring. I looked at her blankly for about 15 seconds and asked her, her if she was going to get in. She said sure I would love to. It went the long way to the passenger side around the back of the car. Since I had just met the girl, I figured she had just maybe smoked some weed or something as I had kind of got the vibe she was a bit of a stoner. As I was driving to the bar, she talked in a very low voice, almost as if she was trying to whisper. I am not hard of hearing or anything, but I had to ask her to repeat herself several times just so I could make out the full sentences she was saying. When we got to the bar, I made sure we got a seat closer to the back away from most people, just so it could be a little quiet in order to hear her. The conversations honestly carried on as normal from this point, and it was actually a fun time for the time being. We talked about different things we were interested in, and she did bring up she did recreationally use weed and a few other tripping substances, like shrooms and such. I am not much of a fan of these, but it at least made me relax in the back of my mind to think maybe she was just high off marijuana, and that rationally explains some of the weird stuff of her behavior. Granted, I had a few drinks at this point so I was honestly not thinking straight. I asked her if she wanted to go to my place after drinks and she agreed. When we got to my place we had a few more drinks then she started talking about her jewelry. This is where it gets weird. She told me her jewelry was her big secret and it defined her. When I asked her why it was so important she said, I'm actually Anastasia. I was never killed in Russia. My jewelry is my link to my past. It was hard for me to take that serious at this point with how much I drank so I kind of challenged challenged that statement using the little bit I knew about history. At this point she freaked out and started yelling at the top of her lungs about how I don't respect ancestors in history. Then she got quiet and tiptoed right up to me and grabbed me by the neck. She then brought my face eye to eye with hers while still holding my neck. She says at this point, I am a shaman and I will curse you. My ancestors have destroyed many people and you do not respect that. You are from oppressive ancestors and they will be punished. Then she put her hand in a whiskey glass and made a cross on my face and kissed my forehead. At this point, I started to sober up a little. I talked her into calming down telling her I was only joking. Then she slowly started getting back to normal. Then she started talking about her cat fetish. She tells me she has a list of people who she tames to act as cats. I am not about judging people on their fetishes so I listen in. She then tells me all the things she does to them and starts acting like a cat in my living room. If she had not yelled at me earlier on, I might have almost been turned on by it. My red flags in my head were tingling like crazy at this point so I just listened and tried not to set her off. She noticed Sage on my kitchen counter and asked me to let her light it and bless the house. Side note, I use sage to make my house smell better occasionally. It's kind of a ritual I like to do but it's mine and mine alone. Something I take very personally and like to do myself. I tell her no, she can't light it and that it's my thing to do on my own. Then, she freaks out telling me I am a horrible human being and screaming all over the place. I tell her I can take her home now and she runs to the door and goes outside. As I get outside, she is screaming at the top of her lungs that I am a horrible person and I should go die. I tell her she can walk herself home then and I go back to my place and lock the door. She then starts banging on the door hard for about 10 minutes saying she left her phone in there. I grab her phone off the kitchen counter and open the door to hand it to her. She tries to barge inside and I block her with my forearm. She then acts like she is about to punch me. I just hold my ground and tell her she is not coming in. She screams she wanted the whiskey bottle we were drinking from. I told her no because I paid for it. I slam the door at that point and lock it. I hear her bang on the door for a minute. I then hear her footsteps going down the stairs. I waited about an hour and then went walking outside to see if she was still hanging around. I didn't see her, nor did I ever see her again after that. I hope to never see her again. In 2019, I had bought my sister and I tickets to see 21 pilots in Oklahoma City. At the time, I was a 20 year old petite woman. I am a super fan of their music, so made my sister pack and be ready to line up at the venue around 2 to 3 in the morning to get decent spots in the pit. We got there and were greeted by other fans and had a pretty good time. I was able to park my car in a lot pretty close to the venue and got away with it until about 5 to 6 in the morning with police slash venue management, I can't remember which, told us that anyone parked on that lot would be towed if not moved in the next hour. 
door. At that time, the venue management had made an actual line clear up to the door. My sister didn't have her license at the time and we were able to become acquainted with some of the people in line, so I felt comfortable for her to stay in line while I found somewhere new to park. Fast forward to me finding a Sonic that was close by and I figured I could get away with free parking. I started the close to a mile walk back to the venue. I then found an alleyway that looked to be one of those nightlife streets that are connected to bars. Since it was broad daylight and I knew I would save time going this route, I wasn't apprehensive about taking the alleyway back. About halfway through the alleyway, I saw a thin man no later than his 40s sitting at one of the bar's back patios. When he saw me, he made a joke about a pillow I was carrying. My sister had texted me and asked me to bring one back so she could take a nap before the concert. He then asked me where I was headed, in which I stupidly told him the concert downtown. He asked me if I wanted drugs, in which I replied no, and then asked if he could come with, which I lied and told him it was sold out. This entire exchange I kept walking while he was talking to hopefully shake him off or show no interest in the conversation. When I had reached the end of the alley I had a bad feeling that I was being followed so when I turned the corner I quickly jogged to hopefully gain some distance between us if that was the case. Unfortunately I was correct. I remember hearing fast footsteps follow me behind me and then abruptly stopping when I turned to look behind me. It was almost like a movie where he would rush behind something when I turned, thinking I didn't see him. At this point I panicked and started trying to spot the closest store to me. It was around 5.30 to 6 in the morning at this point so anything I did pass was closed plus I was in a suburban area with more apartment buildings than stores. I turned another corner and saw a man was coming out of his home. I hurried up to the man and remember asking him if he could help me because I was scared and felt unsafe because there was someone following me. At this point the scrawny man from the alley had gained on me and was a few feet away from us. The man following me then began telling the guy I was asking for help that I was a liar and don't listen her man. The guy coming out of his home then looked at me and then the creep and told me, sorry I can't help you and proceeded to close this door in my face. I have never to this day felt so utterly helpless in my life. I turned to the creepy guy and pled with him to please leave me alone. He kept telling me that I wasn't going anywhere and I wasn't going to no concert and a bunch of other threatening comments. By some luck, I was able to spot a group of people and 21 pilots marched across the street and sprinted across and started walking next to them. I quickly told them what was happening and if I could walk with them to the venue and they told me yes. I think the creepy man lost interest in me and I saw his walking slowly back in the opposite direction. I was able to make it back to the venue fine but immediately broke down upon seeing my sister. I thanked my new acquaintances and called the cops. I was told he does that a lot and he's not harmless. I was told by the venue's bodyguards that they would walk me to my car after the concert but upon returning to the same spot spot for them to do so. They were there. To say I was pretty disappointed on how it was handled is an understatement. It still freaks me out to this day how easily I could have been taken or if I'd even be here to tell anyone this story. A couple of years before the pandemic started, a friend of mine, Mary, introduced me to a guy. He wasn't really my type, but she's one of those people who turns into a matchmaker when she's in a relationship, so I agreed to go on a couple of dates with him so she wouldn't feel as worried that I might die alone and so on. The first time I met up with this guy, it was a group date with Mary, her boyfriend Tim, and another friend and her boyfriend. This guy Mary was trying to set me up with, Joe, seemed alright. We talked, traded jokes, that sort of thing. I was comfortable with him because I wasn't interested in him. At the end of the night, he asked if we could meet up again sometime, and I agreed. Afterwards, I told Mary, and she was delighted. Her boyfriend Tim was not very happy, though. Tim's training to become a doctor. He's a very smart guy, and my friend said I greatly value his opinion. There's something off about Joe, Tim said, and I agreed, and Tim and I talked it over for a bit, but neither of us had seen or felt anything worse than a bit of weirdness. Be careful with Joe, Tim said, when I hugged my friends goodnight at the train station. Joe and I texted for a couple of weeks before we met up again, and those exchanges only cemented my first impressions. I just wasn't into him, and something about it was off. He began to reveal a side of himself that was less friendly as well. He had very low self-esteem, and was always looking for reassurance. At first that wasn't so bad, but it turned toxic pretty quickly. He seemed to get off on that sort of attention. I didn't really want to go out with him again, but Mary was really invested in the idea of Joe and I getting together. Mary is a sweetheart, but she doesn't really have any instincts. Occasionally that gets me, or someone else in our friend group into trouble. Mary's cute and everyone wants to make her happy. She has good intentions, but because she has no instinct she can't sense danger and sometimes drags people into dangerous situations unwittingly. I was hoping this was not going to be one of those episodes. Anyway, Mary was excited about the next date and Joe kept asking when I was going to meet him again, so I invited Joe to an event my hobby club was holding. I figured that was safe because we'd be surrounded by people I knew well. The evening was alright. Joe wasn't as creepy in person as he had been over text messages 
messages lately. After the event, we walked along the river for a bit. On a walkway crowded with families and tourists, we parted ways at a busy train station. I figured I'd just gently push this thing further into the realm of platonic and everything would be alright. Then, on one night a couple of weeks later, Joe called me and told me he was going to off himself. I freaked out and tried to calm him down. I stayed up all night talking to him from when he called around 10 at night until the sun rose. Every time he calmed down, I tried to say goodbye, but he kept saying that if I hung up he would off himself, so I stayed on the line, talking him down over and over again. Something about the situation felt wrong, but what else was I going to do? I wouldn't leave anyone to end themselves. As I sat on my patio, watching the sun rise over the forest behind my house, he finally let me off the hook. He said thank you, and for a moment I felt that I'd done the right thing. Maybe I'd just saved a life. Then, Joe said, with a voice full of glee, that was the best night of my life, and hung up. I was stunned, but had this psycho really kept me up all night, knowing full well the next day was going to be busy for me. Just to get off on the attention, I decided there was no way I was ever going to see this guy again. I told Mary what had happened, and she was very apologetic. She agreed that Joe was a complete psycho, said she was sorry she had set me up with him, and told me to call the cops if he came to my house. I didn't think he would. Joe didn't have my address, and neither did the person Mary had met him through. I don't give out my address to anyone but trustworthy family members, because I don't want my abusive ex-step-parent to find me. That precaution probably saved me from a much worse experience. As it was, when I broke it off with Joe, he took it pretty badly. He threatened to end himself again, so I messaged Mary and she contacted her and Joe's mutual friend, who kept an eye on Joe for a few days. Not long after that, I started getting creepy phone calls after midnight. They were often at 2 or 3 in the morning. The caller never said anything, just breathed heavily down the line. It was so unnerving. I blocked the number every time and Joe must have gone through 4 or 5 numbers before he switched his phone to a private number to get around caller identification. I couldn't block him anymore. I didn't know what to do. For more than a year and a half after Joe got a private number, I was forced to answer every one of his calls. A whole branch of my family had private numbers because one of them was scammed a while back. Luckily, the police caught the scammer and they didn't end up losing any money, but unfortunately for me, that meant that if I received a call from a private number at night, I had to pick it up, just in case something had happened to a member of my family. On one particular night, my phone went off at 3 in the morning. He was a private number. I knew it was probably Joe. I was staring at my phone, trying to work out what to do. I never let the calls go to voicemail, because apart from the whole family issue, even if he didn't know where I lived, he certainly knew where Mary and Tim's house was. I was afraid that if I didn't play along, he might go after my friends. The phone was still ringing, and I reached out to swipe up and answer the call, then paused. I had an idea. Back when I was in high school, my dad would sometimes call early in the morning. If no one else was in the house, I'd be woken up, stumble over to the phone half awake, and answer it with a slightly croaky voice. I have a low voice for a woman, so every time I answered the phone like that, my dad would mistake me for my brother, John. I realized that I could use that. I cleared my throat, dropped my voice as low as I could, then said hello. I was delighted with the result. I sounded exactly like John. It was uncanny. It made me a little sad, really. John died about a year before I met Joe. It was a bit of a jolt, hearing something so close to his voice again after almost three years. I quickly grabbed my phone before it could ring out, tapped the answer button, then said that deep hello again. This time there was no creepy heavy breathing, only silence. I said another deep hello. After a moment's pause, Joe hung up on me. I was overjoyed. Every other time, I'd had to hang up on him. No matter what I said before, he had always wanted as much of my time as he could get. I let myself feel a flicker of hope. Maybe I was free. It's been over a year now, and it looks like I am free of Joe. I haven't gotten any creepy calls since I pulled out my John impersonation, and I can only guess that Joe thinks I've changed my number, or given it to someone else. Joe never met John, so when I said hello, he probably just heard a young man's voice. If John were still here, I know he'd approve. If I could tell him now, he'd be very happy to know a part of him could still protect me, even so many years after he was gone. I've heard from mutual friends that Joe has said some awful things about me. He's told some people he slept with me, which he didn't, of course, who would sleep with someone that creepy. Worse than that, Joe and Mary's mutual friend has said that Joe told her he wants to kill me. Mary and I were horrified by that. The friend has since told him I've moved to another city, so that might be enough. She's very close to him, distantly related actually, so he believes what she tells him. When I'm done with my studies, I'm going to move across the country. Until then, I'm keeping my head down. My campus and Joe's are a 30 minute train ride apart. That's nowhere near far enough away, but it will have to do. There is one positive thing that has come out of this. Mary is now completely cured of any desire to play matchmaker. Oh, and Joe, let's never meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
The following events took place over the space of a year. It took me a while to link them all and realize what had happened, so I'm going to try and relay it as I experienced it. I'm 31 now, but this took place when I was roughly 18. For the majority of my career, I've been a support worker. This involves supporting adults with learning disabilities slash health issues in their own homes and out in the community, basically with all and any aspects of their lives. The job involves long hours and often sleepovers or waking nights. In this case, the other two staff members went home at 8 at night or 10 at night to depending on if the service users were overnighting at their parents, which was a regular occurrence, and the sleepover would stay with the remaining clients in case they had a health concern or needed support with something overnight. At the time, I was working in a service with three young men who were very active within their community. This meant I was also very active in their community, out and about all the time helping them to aim for more during college slash work slash recreational. We got the bus a lot because they had concession passes. I live in the United Kingdom and can't drive, so I commuted to and from work on public transport. Keep a watch. The service we worked in was based across the road from a nursing home or possibly a respite center. To this day, I'm unsure what it actually is slash was. This building had parking spaces outside it intended for that facility, but after certain hours, anyone could use them. At 10 every night, I was on shift. Whether I was a sleepover or finishing for the day, a car would park across from us and shine its high beams right through our window. This would also light up the adjacent front door so anyone interested could see who was leaving. Even though the clients were in bed by this time, there was still a lot to do for the remaining staff member like ensuring the property was secured and the fire doors throughout the house were closed. Just general health and safety things. So a car across the road blinding our staff as they left was low down on the list of concerns. Personally, I assumed that it was also the facility staff going home. 10 at night is a normal finishing time in the care sector. This went on for a few months before one eagle-eyed colleague told me this only happened on days when I would come into work. We made a joke about how I had a fancy man picking me up but I wrote it off. Charting my movements. Not really an event, but whilst out and about with the people I supported, they would often say my name, that man is looking at you. My service users were young men, who liked a joke, and had limited mental capacity so often their jokes did not seem like jokes but were intended as such. This started with one client specifically. I worked with him more than the others because I was his key worker which meant I had additional duties relating to that client, which included arranging special outings slash events. But before long they were all telling me there was a man who was staring at me slash following me. They often said this in crowded public areas and because they struggled to communicate they could never describe him fully but one of them said it was always the same man and they gave the odd vague detail which we pieced together into a wider description and will be relevant later. Again, the other staff found it odd this behavior was only directed at me. They never said this to anyone else though they did say it in the presence of other staff if I was part of the group. The escalation. This event had such an impact that I still don't use public transport alone in the evening. I got a call from the mother of the person I was supporting that day. He had earlier gone for a visit to his parents and his brother was home from university so they decided he would sleep over so he could spend the following day with his brother. It was 7.30 in the afternoon and dark because it was winter. I had worked over my contracted hours that month as we were short staffed so I called on our call manager who offered me an early finish. I did all the admin care quality commission work required us to do daily, cheerily said goodbye to everyone before leaving to catch the 8 at night bus. It had been laundry day so I had been ironing and hadn't eaten the food I had brought with me. I called my partner at the time and because I had to pass through the city center I decided to grab us a chicken bucket and pick up the newest Dance of Dragons book which I had pre-ordered from Waterstones as it was December and the shops were open late for Christmas. I got off the bus, wearing my headphones as usual, picked up the book, walked down to the fast food place to get the bucket of chicken, which was next to the metro, underground slash subway station, got my food and was on my way down the steps to the ticket barrier. Halfway down the steps, I had a tap on my shoulder, I had my hands full of chicken, so turned, unable to take my headphones out to see a man who I assumed was asking about which line he should be on or something. Anyway, I tried to brush him off, but he he followed me to the barrier. He bought a ticket but I had a pass, which I scanned but he ran down the escalator to catch up with me. As I was sitting on the platform, he sat next to me. It was late and people were sparse and spread out. It was super uncomfortable that he had all this space and chose to invade mine. Having a seat for my chicken, I took a headphone out because he seemed angry with me. He was rambling, but in a nutshell he told me he has seen me about often with different men, people I was supporting I assume. Sometimes I'm in a group with people much older, I assume my co-workers as I was the youngest employed he said a lot of odd things which didn't actually register as creepy until I got home. He said I live on road I work on and often go between two houses. At the time we had another service a few doors up again with three young men. That was my original service but it was better conditions at my current service so I had hopped over when they needed staff. It was ran by the same company. As I knew the service users I'd often cover there if they needed me rather than call agency staff. He described my commute, 
commute, including times, the clothing I wore, which was dress code, that I was either with someone or had headphones in. He said my hair changed a lot. I had semi-permanent colors that I changed regular. There was a lot that looking back indicated he had been watching me a while but I was tired and he was rambling and I wanted him to go away. He was inexplicably angry at me and saying he just wanted to look after me and I kept ignoring him. This was the first time I had ever seen the man. I can't remember how I responded exactly but I basically told him he had the wrong person. However, it did freak me out enough that I changed lines in metros a few times. I was on the phone to my partner the whole time after I got on the metro. He followed me at first, at a distance, next car over, but eventually lost track of me. He was unable to describe anything I did after the city center so I think this was the first time he had followed me beyond my change over from bus to metro. I did end up safely at home that night but over an hour late with cold chicken. I told my manager about this as she gave me a personal alarm. I hadn't yet connected it to prior events so I just let it go thinking it was a one-off. Final event. I was either not at work or on annual leave and only have a vague recollection about hearing about this event. In fact, I had forgotten it entirely until a co-worker at the time, a current friend, reminded me. It took place at a vulnerable person's home. Two of my co-workers were upstairs sorting out medication. They came down to find a man the same ethnicity and later we confirmed it was the same general description as my stalker. He was sat at the table. The guys we supported were in their rooms so downstairs had been empty. As you can imagine, they were quite shocked. This was a secure service that protected vulnerable adults. He had managed to bypass multiple doors all of which were both locked and alarmed. He was just sitting in silence looking around the room. We still don't know how he got in but he didn't respond to their questions and after a while just got up and left without saying a word. This obviously got reported but nothing was really done about it. The company was one of the first I worked for so I didn't know better but it's just generally bad. At the time the other staff assumed he was an agency staff member who maybe had the wrong house and was meant to go to the other service a few doors up but he didn't present them with identification when asked. I'm not sure why they didn't call the police because I would have. Shortly after this event, I got offered a new job in a different city, meaning I left the area entirely for about five years. I now live back in the same vicinity but different area and with a different name through marriage. I also look a lot different now. I have never seen the man again. I can't prove these events were connected, just that the description of the man was consistent across them all. After the metro incident, I started getting taxis home because I was so afraid, which I still do if I'm out late. I'm now also extra vulnerable as I myself am now disabled. Luckily, I work a 9 to 5 job which is based at home since the pandemic. I have the worst luck and a good bit of traumatic experiences I've dealt with throughout my life. 2022 was no different and the year started out awful when the heat lamp from my pet frog caught on fire and started a nasty fire in my bedroom. Due to the smoke damage throughout the house and me having nowhere to sleep, my parents and I were put into a two bedroom suite at a residence inn in the next town over, a quiet medium sized town with little to no crime while the house was gutted and renovated. We lived in this hotel from January 5th to late October. It's actually a town known for being a more wealthy, stuck type. The hotel was nice, but I am used to living in a pretty woodsy and rural neighborhood where I don't hear too much going on. I'm not used to apartment living, but having access to a pool, hot tub, fire pit, and nice propane outdoor kitchen that people rarely use was very nice. About a month after the fire, I ended up getting a part-time job five minutes away from the hotel and started dating my coworker. The story starts that my boyfriend and I got out of work around 12 at night and then hung out with our friend until we decided to all head home at around 12.50. My mom texts me asking, where I am, which I didn't reply because I would be there in less than five minutes. It was driving and she would probably see me before I could even enter the hotel through the door near our room because most nights she would stand out there on the phone with a friend or on Facebook drinking a truly and chain smoking. She mainly did this because she's a night owl like me and the walls inside the hotel room were like paper. My dad had to get up every morning at five for work and we would both give her an ear for talking on the phone late at night with friends or watching videos as no matter what volume she talked at, we could hear her. When I pulled into the the parking spot. I walked up to my mom and she starts telling me off for not replying to her quickly enough because something was going on. I asked her what happened because of course we already had witnessed some weird behavior at the hotel before. Basically, when she had gotten home, due to most of the parking spaces up against the building being taken, she parked in the overflow lot for the hotel and a car that was sitting there peeled off as soon as she went and parked with their lights off. She went inside, dropped off her purse and other items, and went outside to smoke and noticed the same car was again parked next to hers Eileen. 
evening. She told me she had been standing there, drinking her drink, leaning up against the wall, watching videos on her phone when she heard footsteps approach. She looked up and there was a man there who was staring at her and she stared back. He ended up walking a little bit down the walkway and then raised his fist up at a first floor window and smacked it, possibly attempting to break it. My mom, who unfortunately is not afraid of anything but spiders, yelled hey, what are you doing? And he said something about trying to open a beer bottle. He had no bottle in his hand and alarm bells were going off for my mom so she just yelled okay, I'm calling the cops. And he started sprinting down the side of the building away from her and around the corner. My mom started to follow him once he rounded the corner of the building and when she got to the corner he was gone. There was an older couple, probably late 50s or early 60s who would frequently sit on the curb by that door that he rounded the corner on drinking and the woman asked my mom what she thinks is up with that guy and my mom was like I have no clue, did you see him doing anything? And the lady then told my mom that he had sat down with him for like an hour basically being like oh, I have nowhere to stay tonight, I have nowhere to go, I have no money. It was trying to convince them to let him stay in their hotel room tonight. She basically said he was acting cracked out of his mind. Only like 30 seconds has passed when my mom hears his car start and he peels out of the overflow lot again. This time lights on. She walks back over to the door closest to our room and continues smoking. Not even three minutes later, he pulls into the overflow flow lot again and starts walking down the walkway and passes my mom staring at her. My mom said something like this is getting ridiculous. I'm going to call the cops on you and he just said okay. He kept walking past her. This is at the point where I had pulled into my parking spot and my mom was telling me all of this. I hear footsteps in the parking lot and I see a tall man in khaki shorts and a hoodie walking into the overflow lot and my mom is telling me that's him. That's him. So I take a video of him in case I need evidence or something. He had apparently been walking around the building again, then got in his car and left again. My mom had called the non-emergency number because we were on the ground floor and she didn't want it trying to come back and break one of our windows for our room. The police department is actually across the street from the hotel and they said they would come by and take a look yet no one has come. I used weed to help me get tired and a bit less anxious for bed. I decided to go to the door on the other side of the building, which was a bit more sheltered and also because I didn't want my mom to see me smoking weed. Even if she knew I was doing it, it felt weird to be doing it in front of her. I sit down on the curb of the walkway and light up, texting my boyfriend about all of this when I hear a car door close behind me. I look out into the lot and don't see any headlights or anything, but I'm not too worried because again, it's a hotel, lots of people get dropped off and come by late at night. I start scrolling through Twitter and hear a loud roar from a bed. I get up, already shaking, and look around, and I see his Volkswagen Golf parked about 10 feet away from me. The lights in the car are on, and there's a bunch of smoke in the car. He's rooting through stuff in his backseat, making sounds like an animal and just talking talking gibberish. I immediately call my mom and start walking down to the other end of the building where she is and she's looking at me head on and tells me to run through the phone and don't look back. Apparently at that point he was walking behind me quickly. By the time I get to her, I turn around and he's already walking back. I'm so shaken my mom said screw this and calls the police this time because it's now been around 35 minutes and no officer has come from just dialing the police department. An officer comes 10 minutes later which I recorded on my phone and tells us that she actually had responded to the first call and at that point he had gone to an ATM, got in cash, and bought a room for the night at our hotel. She said she personally talked to him herself. She has a bit of an attitude with my mom. I'm now listing this completely based off of the recording, who after my mom had said do you not see the odd behavior, and the cop literally went it's not illegal to have odd behavior, ma'am. He is a guest to her, and my mom says he's acting like he's on drugs, and the cop said he may be. It's not illegal to be on drugs, it's only illegal to possess them. That was the most outrageous thing I ever heard. If he's high, it's it's only if he's possessing them that I can take criminal action. To which my mom replies, well clearly if he's high he's most likely got drugs in his possession, don't you think? The cop then basically said she understood my mom's concerns and while his behavior is a little bizarre, the attempted window smashing is a he said she said and because he is now a paying guest she cannot go against the matter any further and leaves. My mom and I are inside for the night in our room and in my bedroom I kept the window cracked because the air conditioner wasn't the best and I heard him walk around the building time and time again until I eventually fell asleep. When I woke up around 7 in the morning, he was gone. I have so many other creepy stories staying at this place, and it really is shocking if you knew what town it was. I would witness drug deals going down at 3 in the morning when
when we first started staying there and I lived on the third floor. People engaging in affairs. One night I got over to my aunt's house, which was about 35 minutes away, and on the way home had a friend on the phone to keep me company. I pulled into a parking spot right at the door, and it was around 9.30 at night. I was just sitting there for about 5 minutes when I saw a man's silhouette walking down the walkway slowly, coming closer to my car. I didn't think much of it because people walk their dogs a lot at night, or go out to smoke. But then he slowed way down as he got to my car and stood directly in front of the hood, staring at me through the windshield. I stared back, but I couldn't see anything besides the black silhouette and the end of the cigarette lit, and just said to my friend there's a guy just standing, like right outside my car staring at me, and she yelled text her dad. Text her dad right now. I'm assuming he had heard my friend, because he then swiftly walked around the corner and disappeared. My dad came running down the stairs, bless him because at that point we were on the third floor, and by the time he had come running out the man was gone. At that point, my parents wouldn't even let myself out at the pool and hot tub area by myself anymore because they noticed that the hotel was being used for human trafficking with pimps and so on. They wanted me to text them as soon as I arrived to the hotel and not dilly dally in the parking lot. Just get inside and keep a close eye on my surroundings. Again, really surprising for that area. I'm thankful I'm back in my house, where the only sounds I hear at night are bears or raccoons trying to root through my trash, and I hope I never have to live in a hotel ever again. background information. This happened at a travel hockey tournament. I've never had an experience like this before so it was shocking as somebody who has been playing for 13 years. At the time I was a 13 year old girl. However, at 13 I gained the privilege of being able to walk around in public without having an adult's eyes on me 24-7. In hindsight, probably not the best decision of my dad. I was on a team this year and all of the kids were 13 to 14 years old. We were headed down nearby DC for a tournament in December. Our team manager booked a hotel that was in the projects. I'm talking hearing a gunshot and seeing abandoned houses nearby when I pulled into the parking lot of this hotel. This was already a red flag, but I continued to unload my suitcase from my dad's truck and grab my backpack too. As we were headed towards the doors of the hotel, I heard a man behind me calling some girl's name. I think he was screaming Annie or something that sounded like that. I turned around just to see if he was anywhere near us and he was standing next to a large pillar connected to the hotel. This man had bloodshot red eyes It was definitely on some sort of substance. I decided to start walking faster and my dad must have thought the same thing as me because we started hightailing it to the hotel doors. Less than a minute had passed once we reached the hotel doors, probably about 10 seconds. I decided to look back to see if this man was still there, but he disappeared. Eventually my teammates all texted the group chat saying they had arrived and they were hanging down in the lobby. I rushed to the elevator to go join them. I clicked the start button which leads to the lobby, but when the door opened, it wasn't the lobby. The elevator had taken me to the basement. I was frightened because it kind of looked like the back room's except tile flooring, with some 60s music playing faintly. I took a peek outside the elevator door and there was absolutely nobody in sight. I tried the start button again, absolutely horrified from that. I didn't feel myself go up or down. The door opened to the basement again. I figured maybe the start button was the basement and it was just different from other hotels. Maybe I just had made a mistake and was supposed to press floor 1 to get to the lobby. I hit the floor 1 button. This time it took me to a hallway. The button lead me to the first floor of hotel rooms, still not taking me to the lobby. At this point, I started to get confused and an eerie feeling overcame me. I decided to head back onto the elevator, go to my floor, the third floor, and walk down the stairs. I knew my entire team was roomed on the third floor, so I felt more comfortable walking down the stairs from there. I went up to floor 3 and got off of the elevator. On my way to the stairs, I saw weird crumbs in front of a hotel door and bent down to take a look at what it was. It was weed on the floor. I was kind of taken aback a bit and fell back. The person on the inside must have heard me because the door opened. The crazy man man from the parking lot was the one behind the door. After seeing this, I bolted to the stairwell and ran down the stairs. I was running so fast that I was skipping some steps. I even ended up accidentally tripping at one point, but I got up as fast as my little legs could carry me. I made it down to the lobby and my team saw me in a panic. They all asked me what's wrong and I explained my story. I got a few looks from them and they probably thought I was delusional. But one of the boys convinced the whole team to follow me onto the elevator so I could show them in person what happened. I clicked the start button and lo and behold, the door reopened without any movement from the elevator. This was the same elevator and same button I had pressed previously. I still have no explanation behind this. The weekend ended up continuing but being completely normal until we had to leave for our last game. We all were standing in the lobby, about to leave. We walked out into the park parking lot to see that one of the cars had been broken into and it was my teammates. This car had a back window that was pretty big so you could see what was inside of the trunk. Well, turns out that somebody had broken into the vehicle thinking it was full of something valuable. The only 
only thing left behind in the trunk was both of my teammates' sticks, so he definitely wasn't looking for equipment. Joke's on him though, because hockey equipment smells absolutely rancid and he probably had a not so nice surprise when opening up the bag. The hotel workers actually checked the cameras and guess who it showed? The crazy man from the parking lot. So, crazy man, let's not meet. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I've been holding onto this story for years now and would like to finally get it off my chest. So my sibling and I lived close to an elementary school where we would often go to walk our dog in the playing field and crop of woods, or we would let our dog roam around while we played on the playground or made pretend in the woods. I think I was around 14 when this happened, about 10 years ago. This schoolyard had a playing field, a playground near the building, and a playground farther away from the building and a crop of trees. We were swinging on the swing set at this more distant playground, but from this play area you can clearly see residents residential streets and the parking lot of the school which kind of all wrap around the crop of forest. As we are swinging, I see an SUV drive up one of the roads and pull into the parking lot. It's a weekend, so there is no other cars around and not very many people, maybe the odd passerby also walking their dog through the school grounds. The SUV is about 40 meters or 130 feet away from where we are and I wear glasses, so I can't see very well what the people look like as they exit the car, but I can see some distinct clothing pieces. There are three people, two look older and are dressed as if they are older middle-aged, like in their 50s. I remember one of these people was wearing a wide-brimmed women's sun hat. The third person looks like an older teen or young adult in his 20s and is wearing a green and white striped jersey and cleats. It is not uncommon for people to walk or drive to the school to use its field for play or sport practice, though looking back now I realize it is odd they parked in the slot and not on the side of the road nearer to the field which is on the opposite side of the property. In any case, I think okay, just some grandparents and their grandson going to practice in the field and go about playing with my sibling. I remember watching the trio walk away around the school building, completely opposite to where we were on the property. We have our dog with us, and after a time we decide to stop swinging and take the dog on a walk through the trails in the forest brush. Maybe 15 to 20 minutes have passed since the car pulled up. The brush we are walking in is basically in the very corner of the school property. There is a metal chain link fence in front of us, and beyond it is the sidewalk a residential road. To our right is another fence which separates people's backyards from the school grounds. These homes all have tall trees growing along the school fence for added privacy so it's almost impossible for anyone to see into the schoolyard. My sibling and I were just at that age where playing pretend didn't really feel genuine and spur of the moment like we were about to grow out of it. I'm feeling bored but don't want to go home yet so I pick a branch of these red berries that grow in the schoolyard and say to my sibling hey want to play a game which was our code for let's play pretend and I bet down to offer the berries to my dog as a starting point for the game. They've never hurt her. I'm still speaking to my sibling, who is walking in front of me as I bend down, but my voice trails off as I see my dog's behavior. She is completely ignoring the berries in me, and is instead moving past me slowly, ears back and nose pointed, as if she is approaching something. I follow her movements, still looking down, and when I finally look up, there are the three people from the SUV not two meters, six feet in front of me. They are certainly not a couple of grandparents and a kid, but three grown men. I remember the faces of the two older men pretending to be grandparents. The foremost man had short white hair and a white scruff of facial hair. His mouth was open in a faint shape as he breathed quietly and focused on keeping his steps light. The other man was extremely thin, his cheekbones popping out in shoulder length, greasy brown hair hung around his skeletal features. They had crept up behind my sibling and I silently and remained just as quiet as they all turned their backs quickly and pretend to point off into the trees like they were bird watching or something. It was bizarre how silent the whole encounter was. I immediately realize we need to get out of there and turn my attention back to my sibling as I grab my dog's collar and get her hooked up to the leash. My sibling is about a foot from me but seems oblivious still to the three creeps in the woods right behind us. I tell them over and over that we need to leave, but they become wrapped up in the imaginary game I proposed moments ago. Finally, they see the men. I never look back at the creeps, only to my sibling. My sibling also stops talking and starts walking with me. Thankfully, an opening in the fence between these now haunted woods and the road is only a few meters ahead and we get some distance and obstacles between us and these creeps. To my frustration, my sibling wants to stop on the sidewalk and pick some more berries through the fence, and I frantically tell them to come on. Let's go. I still never look back towards the men, my vision tunneling to the safety of the open roads and sidewalks and homes in front of us. We get home without incident, at least to my knowledge, had the men followed us on foot, going back to their car and followed it, or simply gave up. I didn't care, I just wanted to get home, which was only a couple blocks away. When we got home, I broke down 
now is I told my mom what happened and I remember her reaction being kind of nonchalant. I had always been an anxious child and she had developed a habit of downplaying things in a kind of exposure therapy way. I realized I still didn't feel fully safe with this reaction and retreated to my basement to cry alone. In recounting the story with my mom years later, she said she did call the police but nothing came of it. I am also very thankful for my dog as it is likely she saved the lives of myself and my sibling that day. this story happened to be back when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time and had three siblings that also lived at home, my brother and two sisters. For some context, we lived on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at two in the morning, so I had always felt like it my job to be the man at the house because he was gone during the times when you would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was the weekend, my dad was home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs and coming out of our rooms you could look down over the banister and to see our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock and it was around 2.30 in the morning and my brother told me there were two men at our front door. Now this really woke me up. We quietly walk out of my room and peek over to look down at the front door. When we looked, there was no one at the door but I noticed my parents off to the side, out of view of the glass on the front door. I whispered down to my dad and he told me there were two guys who had been talking to each other and knocking on the door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my pistol, quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs as it is in direct view of the door. My brother is right behind me as we head over to where my parents are, whispering to try and find out what is going on. My parents had awoken to the sound of our dog barking and had come out to find these two men knocking loudly at the door. At this point, the men were turn and begin knocking again, despite the fact that no one had come to the door and our dog was still actively barking. The fact that they were there at this time, in a location where houses are spread out hundreds of yards, and still knocking with a dog barking, made the situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes, the men walked away, and we all shuffle across the kitchen into the family room to peek out the windows into our driveway, which is lit up by our outside light. There was a black Cadillac sitting there, but no one was inside from what we could see. Immediately, the question was where did these guys go? They were in their car, and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately, we figured out the answer when the handles on our back French door started jiggling. They were actively trying to enter the back of our house, which enters into the kitchen. At this point, I just remember my mom frantically saying David to my dad as pure terror overwhelmed her. Then two things happened. Adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun, horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to shoot these men. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed the phone, called the police, and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute of jiggling, they stopped at the back door and disappeared again, only to return to their knocking at the front. However, at this point, several minutes had gone by and suddenly we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and front yard, the two men bolted away, attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of our view, but the other one was intercepted by an officer yelling for him to get on the ground. He didn't, and he was immediately tased and fell on the ground. Some of the officers went around the house after the other guy, and one of them came to talk to my dad and I as we came out the front. They ended up finding the other man hiding in my sister's little playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk and or high, as the one who hit at cocaine on him. While they were both arrested that night, we never did find out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, the whole experience wasn't fun. So, random men at our door in the middle of the night, let's not meet again. My parents had purchased a condo about 10 minutes from their home around the time my older brother was born, with the intention that my siblings and I had the option of renting it when we would come of age. I moved in alongside my brother a few weeks after my 18th birthday, exhilarated by the freedom from our childhood home which had become laden with traumatic memories over the years. The move took two or three days, and we had a U-Haul coming in and out of the driveway during that time. My first day of college occurred a few days later. I had a full schedule three days a week, which I would later regret, with my last class getting out at six in the afternoon. The city I live in is notorious for heavy traffic, and I would not get home until roughly an hour and a half later, despite the university being less than 15 miles away. The sun was mostly down by the time I turned into my street, and there were a few people, some accompanied and well 
well alone taking their evening strolls. There was nothing remarkable about it. The driveway was occupied, so I parked on the street and made my way home. The following day, I got off by closing shift at 9 at night. It was dark by the time I got home, and there was a man walking on the strip of sidewalk that faces the condo. I would not have noticed that he was the lone man from the evening before if it was not for him wearing the same outfit. A bright yellow hoodie, black nylon track pants with white pinstripes, gray Nike trainers, and a tan baseball cap. As I got out of my car, we shared a quick glance and continued on our ways. Two days later, I got off my closing shift and picked my, now ex, boyfriend up for a date. We went back to the condo so that I could change, and in the dark, I saw the man again, wearing the same outfit and on the same strip of sidewalk. It's him again. I sounded more surprised than suspicious, and my boyfriend was confused. I explained that I had been seeing him walking around and that he was always wearing the same thing. We got out of the car and stared at him. Our bodies turned toward him. He ducked behind a car. Now properly freaked out. We got back in my car and watched him get into his and drive away with his lights off. It was too dark and he was too far away for us to catch a license plate. At this point, I was not sure if this man even lived in the neighborhood. We went about our night and I dropped my boyfriend back off at his parents' house. He told me to call him and or the police if I saw the man again and I agreed. I got home around midnight. The man was a street away from his usual spot, crouching below a tree and hugging his knees under his chin. I drove past him and noticed a different man in a blue flannel and jeans approaching a street light. He got under the illuminating glow and pulled his phone out, attempting to make a call. I was unsure if the two men had any association with each other until I looked back over at the yellow hoodie man. He was no longer under the tree. He was also under a street light, a few meters away from the tree. His back was turned to me, but it appeared as though he was taking a call. As I looked back and forth between the two men, it became pretty obvious that they were communicating with each other. I drove away and called the police. They told me to stay where I was or go to another safe location and that they would contact me when the matter was taken care of. I dozed off and was awoken maybe an hour later by the promised phone call. I was told that neither of the two men were residents of the area and that they were simply told not to come back all reports of suspicious activity. After being advised to call again if they came back, I went home. I was tired enough that I had no trouble sleeping for a little while. Around 4 in the morning I was sharply roused by the metal screen door rattling against its frame. The force slowly grew in intensity and eventually the walls and floor were quaking. I peeked through the blinds at my second story window which overlooks the front door and of course saw the man in the yellow hoodie aggressively attempting to open the screen door. I was shaking in my boots on my mattress which was still on the floor as I had not yet purchased a bed frame. I received a call from my equally bewildered brother who was in his room. I told him to call my dad while I called the police. It has now been almost four years and I can assure you all that my street smarts have markedly improved. If you're liking this video all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. For context, I am now 26 and I met my stalker at 14 to 15. So when I was 14, I decided to take ballroom dance classes that was kind of normal for teenagers in my generation in my country. Though you had to change partners each song, so every girl would dance with every boy. In my group that consisted of mostly teens between 14 to 17, there was a really tall, almost 2 meter tall guy who was 21 years old. His name was Philip. We had a nice chat with the times we danced, but he seemed weird. Because I was young and naive, and that's how I normally made friends. I told him where I lived when he asked me. So the stalking began. At that time, I did not realize that it was stalking. I just thought he had a lot of time on his hands and that he was annoying. Philip would ride on his bike from his house. He lived one town over to my house and asked if I wanted to spend time outside with him and play. After doing that for a few times, I asked my parents to tell him that I was not home when he would come over. Both my parents and I were very oblivious about his actions for a very long time. At one point in time, the stalking ended for a few weeks and Philip also did not come to dance classes. At that time, I became a part of a friend group of a boy I liked. For some months he had a girlfriend but they split soon after and I became his girlfriend. Unfortunately Philip was also friends with the best friend of my boyfriend so he was also a part of the group. They told me Philip was in a mental hospital. In the span of his stalking Philip was in mental hospitals multiple times and every time he was I was glad because then I had some peace. When I was 16 my family and I had to move because our landlady had thrown us out. She wanted to live in the property herself so we moved one town over. We started living two streets apart from my stalker, and every time Philip was out of the hospital he would be at my house. At my father's birthday he rang again and because my family had guests they told me to open the door, and there he was, looming over me like a dark
dark menacing shadow man. I told him to leave and I tried to close the door but he blocked it. So I was standing there afraid and begging him to leave. At one time I even ran inside to get my dad to send him away but my dad said he is your friend so it's your problem. So I went back to the door and I begged and pleaded that Philip please leave. At one point he was kneeling slash sitting in my doorway. After almost two hours he finally left and at that point it was obvious for me. Finally I had realized what type of behavior it was. He was a stalker and he was fixated on me. The next day I sat down with my parents and told them that I was afraid of Philip and my dad also apologized to me for putting me in that situation and not helping me. The next time Philip came to my house, my dad was there and told him that I do not want any contact with him. So he left. After a few more incidents like that he stopped showing up at my door and I thought we got rid of my stalker. But every time I started to live happily starting to forget my fear of him, a letter, an email, or a gift showed up and would send my back into my fears. At 20 I was out of school and to pass the year I had to wait to start my job. I worked in a grade school in a voluntary after school care club for grade schoolers. After a month or two my mom woke me up in the morning and told me to get dressed because she had called the cops. Apparently Philip was at my house again every morning at our door and asked for me and my parents didn't tell me so I wouldn't get scared again. Finally after the cops told Philip three times to leave and he ignored them they arrested him and he screamed and screamed my name and that he was burning for me and that the cops heard him. My parents and I were standing in the kitchen listening. The situation was so absurd and so much for me that I started laughing hysterically. We filed a report at the police for stalking and trespassing but the officers said that they could not do anything because he hadn't hurt me physically. We tried to get a restraining order but it didn't go through. A week later Philip had sneaked into our garden and like in a movie he threw rocks at my window. Idiot me opened the window but did not see anything until it clicked and I ran downstairs and told my dad that my stalker was in the garden. Philip escaped. A week after that I was in the kitchen cooking when Philip rang the doorbell again and because we have no way of seeing who is at the door I opened. And there he was again telling me that he missed me and saying that he had peeked through the blinds of the windows in the living room the past week to see if I was there. My parents were not home. If they had been I would have ran. But like this, I had to swallow my fear and stand in the doorway listening to Philip talk until my boyfriend came in. I had sent him an SMS and he was on his way. After my boyfriend arrived he told Philip to leave and he did. Philip mentioned in passing that he now also has a girlfriend. After that I did not see Philip again for a long time. A friend told me that he was taken by the men in white coats because he had believed that his mom was possessed by the devil. I was glad. It wasn't until two years later when I got a letter from court. I was a witness and was told to attend in the case of an assault related to Philip. Apparently after coming out of the mental hospital he had a big fight with his girlfriend and hit her and because she was scared she played dead. Philip called an ambulance and the police finally had something against him. After the hearing he was admitted again to a mental hospital. I finally was able to get a restraining order and he was ordered to stay at least 30 meters away from our property. I was so glad. The restraining order also implied that if he broke any of the requirements he would go to jail. So it was over. Two years ago I also moved out of my parents house. I, a 29 year old woman, grew up in a nice suburban neighborhood. I lived in the same house my entire childhood and only left once I moved out as an adult. I always felt safe, leaving our doors unlocked, window open, going for late night walks as a teenager. I was around 17 when I noticed strange things started happening around my house. My house was also haunted, so weird noises and things moving on their own were not a new thing. This is probably why I, and my family, dismissed my experiences for too long. As a teenager, I worked in a movie theater and I did not work until the afternoon and would get off very late at night. I turned into quite the night owl and it was normal for me to stay awake until about 3 in the morning. It started off as my dog reacting to things outside. I would peek outside my window and I would never see anything so I assumed my dog was just hearing noises and overreacting. Not too long after this started, I was outside and noticed there were handprints and a mark between them on my window, as if somebody was pressing their forehead against the glass. At the time I just dismissed it. I had plenty of friends coming in and out of my house and they would knock on my window some times as they arrived. My window was by the driveway as you walked to the front door. The weird thing is that this window is very large. The window would start about 3 feet from the ground. It went at least 8 feet high and was about 4 feet wide. I lived in a one story house. The forehead and hand marks were at least 6 foot 5 feet high from the ground. I definitely did not have any friends who were that tall and everyone in my family is less than 5 foot 6. Soon after that, I woke up around 5 in the morning to my car alarm going off. Again, I did not think anything of it and dismissed the situation. 
done. This happened a few more times within the next few weeks, always between 4 or 5 in the morning, but the last time I noticed handprints on the top of my car as if somebody was trying to crawl through my open sunroof. After that, I made sure to close all my windows and lock the doors. Again, I dismissed it thinking just some hoodlums were trying to get into unlocked open cars. Not long after the car incident, things started to escalate. One morning as I was leaving to school, I found a small step ladder outside of my window, leaning against the house as if somebody was looking through my window. I had blinds that would move from the top and bottom. I normally had the blinds closed on the bottom and left about two feet open on top to allow sunlight in, but still have privacy. When I looked at my window, I could still see the handprints and forehead mark replaced right above the opening of my blinds. This means they were able to use a step ladder to get a good look into my room. With the ladder against my window, I started to piece together the events over the last few months and realized I had a peeping tom. I brought this up to my parents, but they did not seem to worry and made no effort to do anything about it. Over the next year, I found the ladder against my window many more times. This person would use an old step ladder that we had in the side yard that was unlocked. I would continue put the step ladder back in the side yard, but it would continue to show up next to my window on many mornings. I don't know why I did not just put the step ladder in a place that was not accessible. To be honest, I was a teenager smoking a lot of weed at this time, so I feel as though I was not using very much critical thinking. I have two other sisters who lived with us, but they did not seem to notice anything weird happening. About a year after I noticed the occurrences, we found my sister's bra was out in the yard and we did not have any explanation. This made me think that somebody may be trying to actually get in the house when we were gone with success. I became extremely paranoid. Again, my parents were aware that all of this was happening, but did not care to do anything about it. The last incident before we called the police was after a rainy night we found bare footprints outside of my sister's window in the mud. The screen had been fiddled with as if somebody was trying to get it off of the window. Once this happened, my parents started to take it more seriously. It's funny because they did not care what incidents were happening directly to me, but the moment my sister had this experience, they decided to report it. The police could not do anything about it. They offered to send police every once in a while to fill out their paperwork in front of our house to make it seem like there was a police presence. This only happened one time and they never came back. My older sister made her boyfriend aware of the situation so they decided to sit in the car all night and watch for the pervert to show up. Every time he would try to pull an all-nighter to watch for this person, no one would show up. Looking back now, it makes me think that someone very close to my house must be the peeping Tom because he must have been close enough to see we had another person watching out for us. After a few years of these experiences, my sisters and I all moved out and we have not noticed anything weird happen since. It still bothers me knowing that this person was never caught and that we still have no idea who it was. It makes me frustrated knowing that it could be a next door neighbor who we thought was normal but was actually a pervert. This all was happening around 2010 to 2013, it was before we had easy affordable access to security cameras such as Ring and Blink. I wish we had cameras so we could know who this person was, but there is no point in dwelling over the past. All I know is now that I am an adult, I will always have security cameras around my house, especially if I have young daughters. I have also bought my parents some security cameras. They still live in the house. Maybe one day those cameras will catch the peeping Tom, but I don't think he will come back now that my sisters and I are all moved out. My story takes place two years ago, between the two first containment in France. I was home alone in my small apartment, working on something for my internship that I was stressed about. It was the beginning of the afternoon at 12. Someone knocked on my door, but I wasn't expecting anyone. I went to open up, and it was a guy I knew, let's call him Jim. Jim and I had slept together a few times a few weeks before, until he pushed me away without explanation. We were still friends, but I was a little hurt. Was I that bad? Had he gotten what he wanted and wasn't interested anymore? I didn't dare ask the question because I was getting a little attached and I preferred to wait for it to pass, especially since we were bound to run into each other again. Indeed, Jim had recently got a room in the flat of a friend of mine. The situation was quite funny because he had stumbled upon the advertisement without knowing that I knew the other tenants and my friend didn't know yet that I knew the new roommate. I was going to tell her about it in person when we met again in college for our middle terms, so I knew I was going to see Jim again, but I didn't expect to run into him so soon after he moved in, let alone during a surprise visit from him to my apartment. I asked him what he was doing there. He said he was bored at the dormitory and was just passing through. I invited him in. I was a bit uncomfortable because I still liked him and we had left without any explanation about his rejection before he moved in with my friend. We talked for a while about trivial things, but strangely enough I still remember the main points. Then he wanted to show me a new kind of massage against my stress that he had seen on a video. I hesitated a bit as I was still uncomfortable. Do you trust me? He asked. Yes. I sat on the floor and he touched my back for a while, then did it once I was 
lying down. I don't remember everything except that at one point his arm was around my neck and I thought I'm not sure I can breathe. And then blackouts. Of course the memory of choking didn't come back right away. It took several months but I'm trying to tell you the story in chronological order. When I woke up, it is dark. I was still on the ground, bleeding. I don't remember if I noticed the injury right away but I had a large hole in my right side with many cuts underneath. The events are pretty fuzzy in my memory but I wondered where Jim had gone and why I was alone. I went to look in the hallway but my keys, which are normally always in the lock, were missing. I found the spare and looked outside. No one was there. Then I had my first stupid reflex. I thought I'm hurt. I need to disinfect and started to take a shower. I think I fell asleep and had nightmares of being tortured and kidnapped in the shower, probably a way for my brain to try to warn me that something bad was happening. I then looked for my phone, which was also missing from the apartment. I was confused. Probably drugged I realized later, I decided to go to bed to resume the search after resting. I told myself if I'm still hurt when I wake up, it must be real. It seemed very logical in my mind at that moment. When I woke up, my mind was already a little clear, but I was still not totally myself. It was 8 or 9 at night I think. I was still bleeding. I looked for my phone again, and I started to panic as I couldn't find it. I tried to calm down. I told myself that it was probably there somewhere. I just had to ask someone to call me. I contacted my best friend. Let's call him Tom. They a messenger through my computer. I still had a hard time unlocking my computer. I couldn't type my code. I think I was still drugged. And luckily, Tom was online. He tried to call me on my phone, but no ringing could be heard in the apartment. I think he figured out that I wasn't in my right mind because he called me on messenger to see if I was okay. It was he who gave me the details of our conversation. I have almost no memory of it. I said, if you think you've been hurt, do you call the fire department or the police first? He freaked out and asked me to explain what was going on. I was very confused, but I think he got the gist of it. He asked, did Jim do this to you? I don't know, baby. I was still in denial at that point. Tom called the police on me. He couldn't come to help me himself because he was studying in another city. As I waited for the cops to arrive, I began to realize that I had completely messed up the crime scene by touching everything looking for my phone, not to mention the shower and the nap, which could have killed me in retrospect. I was still in no pain though. The hole in my side started to hurt when I was taken care of by the paramedics that the cops called when they saw the extent of my injuries. I had to undergo surgery as a result of this assault, which took me months to accept as an attempted murder with a knife. I had a hole in my liver and was bleeding a lot. Luckily, my other organs were not affected. While I was in the hospital, the cops came to take my statement and took Jim into custody. Imagine the surprise of my friend and her roommates when they found out that the new roommate not only knew me but was also accused of assaulting and robbing me. One week after the assault, when I got out of the hospital, the first bad news was that the cops had not been able to retrieve the recordings from the surveillance cameras in my building, which had already been erased because the procedures had been too long. The next day, the policewoman in charge of the investigation told me that, of course, Jim denied having been at my place that day, and nobody was at the flat to confirm if he was indeed at home all day. That's it for now. Go home to your parents and get some therapy. Right. Big up to my psychologist who is an incredible person and helped me a lot. And then I waited for a long time and I had to have the seals from my building analyzed for Jim's DNA. Without video or witnesses, it was the only way to prove that he was my attacker or at least that he was in my apartment that day. It took a year and a half to get the prosecutor's verdict. No further action. No identifiable DNA other than mine had been found at the crime scene. I probably destroyed everything with the shower. So there you have it. We can't pursue the investigation. I could never prove it was Jim. I don't have any memory of the assault itself. I don't think I'll ever find them, but I have no doubt that Jim did this to me. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I just remembered a fun encounter that might serve as a warning to those working late at night. I was 24 at the time, working at a nightclub about a 10 minute walk from my home. I used to close on Tuesday nights slightly earlier than most nights as it was generally our slowest night of the week closing around 12 at night instead of keeping customers until 2.30 at night. Usually I'd be the only one left as I'd start cutting staff as the night went on and since it was a slower day of the week we didn't have security on. About two months in of regularly closing at 12 at night, I was walking home. I used to bring in bulkier clothes to hide my figure when leaving alone as I'd been followed slash chased home multiple times before and we'd often get men waiting after hours for us girls to come out knowing we'd eventually come out after closing and didn't want to attract attention to myself. I also used to walk home 
was I didn't have a car and had a few terrifying experiences with Uber drivers not actually driving me home, turning out to be fake cabs slash Uber drivers or harassing me until I pretended to show interest or give them some way of contacting me to which Uber would just give me a $5 coupon for the trouble, but that's a story for another time. The bar was located along a main road that was home to the majority of the other bars and restaurants in the city downtown. Often at this time I'd maybe see a handful of people but the streets were generally empty. I'm walking and notice a parked car about a block away. The driver noticed me and U-turns around to be on the same side of the street as me. Now he's catcalling me and trying to get me to come into his car. I don't engage and keep walking. We're maybe a block or two past the initial spot I saw him and he's been slowly driving alongside the sidewalk. I crossed the street but didn't want to get near his car. He keeps this up until about the halfway mark when he takes off in his car and I'm just relieved he's gone. Psych. This who comes blasting back down the road. He does. Now my walk has turned into a light jog which then turns into me full on running. I'm running behind closed bars and businesses now trying to find a back route to get home without him seeing where I live. At one point I'm running through bushes and mud. No matter what street I end up on his car is waiting for me. Eventually I run right in front of his car while it's parked on the side street beside my place and run into my house through the back entrance. The back entrance is obscured by plenty of trees and car and the surrounding houses are multiple unit homes so I was confident he didn't see what door I got in through. Fast forward to the following Tuesday and I'm walking home. Guess whose car is parked at the halfway mark. This went on for the next four Tuesdays, except he started parking on the street in front of my house until I begged my manager to take me off closing that specific shift. The last time I saw him, one of the apartment buildings along the way had a few cop cars and cops standing around the entrance and I stayed with him which led him to drive off for the night. A week passes and I'm no longer on that shift. A coworker of mine sends me a news article via text. I open it and see that the man who's been following me was arrested for doing this to multiple girls in the city along the street my work was on and that I lived on. He got caught because he'd followed a university student up to her house and wouldn't drive away. She called the cops and he was still there by the time they came to arrest him. He got out the next day I believe and was arrested a few more times and was put on restrictions. Couldn't be out of his parents house between certain hours unaccompanied by either parent before he was deported. I've also heard he didn't actually get deported but I moved away shortly after and didn't keep up with the news on him. I don't live there anymore and wouldn't be giving myself away. So did the creep in the car who used to follow me and multiple other young women home. Let's not meet ever again. Quick backstory, I've had a stalker for about 4 years. He was never aggressive or sent me proper threats, so, stubborn as I am, I did my best to ignore him and not give him the satisfaction of showing him any fear. To be honest, after a while I also wasn't scared anymore since he almost never came close to me. I know being stalked can affect people severely even in a case like mine and that's totally valid but I guess I just got lucky and was never really psychologically affected by it. This stalky behavior mostly just consisted of sending me letters and gifts such as photos of my own apartment building from the outside, things he dug out of my trash can, and so on. I called the police many times, but they weren't able to, or really tried to be honest, catch or identify him. About three weeks ago, I discovered the German version of r slash IMA, you know the next word here, and thought that people might want to know about what it's like to have a stalker. Since I barely use any social media aside from Reddit and have no personally identifying information here I didn't think he'd ever see it. One person even asked does he know you're putting him on blast on reddit and I answered maybe. Maybe it would make him angry, maybe he'd be turned on. Don't know, don't care well, I know the real answer now, he did see it and he did not like it. Like I said, he was never aggressive and never came close to me. The closest I know of was when he sent me a picture of myself, unlocking my apartment door, taken from the corner of the steps above, sorry if that makes no sense. I don't know how else to explain it, but I consider myself a pretty vigilant person Person, and I'm thinking that he might have hit a camera there instead of being there to take the photo himself. I think I would have noticed him if he did. I don't know how he got wind of the posts I made but he did. The next week was quiet, no letters and I didn't see him anywhere. Then he left me letters with printed out questions and my answers from the post I made. He also left me a long hateful letter towards my boyfriend about an issue I had posted on the subreddit. His letters were never hateful like that before, though he never seemed happy with my boyfriend. He wrote about how I should share the spotlight with him since I got so much attention thanks to him. A few days later I got a gift, but this time he didn't leave it in my mailbox or at my car like he usually did. No, this time he left it inside the apartment building right in front of my door. I didn't take it inside my apartment but opened it outside. It was a pretty big box, which was also unusual, and it was taped shut. As I'm typing it out I realized that wasn't a good idea at all and could have ended badly for me, but luckily he didn't send me a bomb or anything. He did, however, send me several zip ties, a roll of tape, the kind he used to tape off walls when painting nothing 
nothing you could use to restrain someone, a television remote with most buttons picked off, a pack of band-aids with a few used ones, not actually, just made to look that way according to the police, and a framed picture of me. I could tell the picture was taken a few days ago and my boyfriend was next to me but cut out of the photo. The frame was shattered and the package was full of glass shards, clearly more than just what could have fallen out of the frame and they were also intentionally put inside the crumbled newspaper that was stuffed in there to keep it all in place. I called the police right away and gave it to them. They were more concerned this time, finally, thanks, and told me they'd send patrol cars more frequently. He didn't show up or leave me any letters slash gifts for about another week and a half. But eight days ago, it started again. I found letters in my mailbox where he wrote about how he wasted his time on me, how I haven't been appreciating his effort, how he was wrong about me being special. Five days ago, I left my apartment in the morning and heard a crunch sound as I stepped on my doormat. He put broken glass under it in the night. I went off to work because I was in a hurry and was just going to make my boyfriend call the police, but then I found my car had also been vandalized. The sides were scratched, lights smashed, and the windshield had a phrase panted on. It's time soon. Missed my last name. I went back back inside and called the cops myself. They found the same phrase on a note under the doormat. This time they really, really, really took me seriously, which might have been because I was just pissed at this point, which I made very clear. If, for some reason, you're like me and just too stubborn to be afraid of a stalker like mine, then all of this, the letters, gifts, photos, even the glass under my doormat, are just really annoying and inconvenient. But my car was useless to me now and the threat scared even me. I did, however, have a dash cam in my car and it caught everything. The police took the footage as evidence, even though the dash cam footage wasn't of high quality and I had given them photos of him that were just as good before but they said it's not enough and they told me they'll look into it further and promise to send more patrol cars again. Then it was quiet for two more days. Until two days ago, someone rang the doorbell at just after four in the morning. My boyfriend and I got up but we were both hesitant but I saw blue lights outside and just as I got up I heard them shouting this is the police please open the door. They told us they were called by one of our downstairs neighbors who came home from his night shift about an hour earlier and heard someone else enter the building after them before the door fell shut. My neighbors know of my situation and I've asked them to make sure they don't let strangers into the building. This neighbor then went into his own apartment and looked through the peephole. We have motion activated lights in the stairway so he waited to see if they turned back on. They did. Then he saw a middle aged man walk upstairs. Above this neighbor are only me and my boyfriend and a single mom with three kids who probably won't be getting any visitors at 3 in the morning. So he called the police. They came and found my stalker one half floor above me on the stairs. He should have been able to see the cop cars since there's a little window up there and they had their lights on but he either missed them or wanted to get caught. They found a pocket knife on him and he confessed to be my stalker right away. He's finally caught. They got him. It took four years, a provocative reddit post, and one very vigilant and caring neighbor but he's finally done. For now, at least, he's facing several charges and I've collected every single piece of evidence over the past four years. I don't know what kind of outcome I can expect, but for now, I've finally got some peace. If not for being five miles from cell reception and the way this story ends, there would be a police report for verification. I will be changing names, locations, and some details in order to protect the privacy of the innocent. A buddy of mine and I try to camp twice a month now that I have a vehicle that can be trusted to get me to some of the more remote areas of our state. We planned a camping trip for this past weekend from the 18th of February to the 20th. We chose a fairly remote location we had been to the previous weekend. The previous weekend, we were the only people we'd seen within one mile of our camp spot. Friday night we got there and set up. This story takes place at a night. It's about 9 at night, so the sun is long gone and the mood hasn't quite risen yet. It's pitch black out, other than when our fire lights up. Suddenly, we hear a man screaming. We listen intently, silently sharing an anxious look. At first, we were hoping it was someone drunk and having a little too much fun, but it quickly becomes obvious this isn't fun party screaming. It isn't even like he's hurt. It sounds full of despair, anger, and anguish. I'm going to take a moment to remind you that this is at 9 at night, pitch black night, in the middle of nowhere woods five miles from the nearest cell phone signal. We hadn't seen anyone in hours. The screaming continues for what felt like hours, but was probably about five solid minutes. We had no idea what to make of it, and started feeling extremely paranoid. We gathered up anything remotely close to a weapon, and tried to come up with explanations of the screaming while keeping our eyes on the forest around us. After about 15 tense minutes of fear-induced paranoia, I nearly fell out of my seat as I watched a flashlight and lantern slowly enter our camp. 
camp. I greeted the stranger with a basic how's it going before he was even lit up by the fire. He responded quickly but flatly by asking if we could do him a favor. That depends on the favor my buddy and I said in unison, obviously tense, holding our weapons close to us. The stranger proceeded to ask if he could hang out for a second by the fire, giving the two of us a one of them. Plus our myriad of weapons gathered from around camp to within our arms reach, we decided to agree and let him hang out. After a short second of awkward silence, I asked him what is going on. He proceeds to tell me and my buddy that he was camping down the trail with his buddy and that his buddy had snapped and tried to kill him. Wait, what? I said before the thought even finished processing in my head. Is that the screaming we heard earlier? The man slowly nods, staring blankly into the fire and begins his story. We were just hanging out, man. We came up earlier today and, and my buddy just freaked out. He started screaming and screaming and just wouldn't stop. Then he attacked me and he launched at me and I told him to just back off and chill, you know. Well, he kept coming after me and it started getting pretty violent and I'm pretty sure he was going to kill me so I grabbed my car keys, the lights, and ran. I don't know what to do, man. He chased me when I ran and I don't know what to do. We don't have firearms or anything, but we do have a hatchet. My buddy and I look at each other for a second, completely astonished. Then something horrible dawned on me. Wait, he chased you? Like, he's on his way here, right now. The man just slowly nods in reply and right on cue we hear screaming from maybe 30 to 40 feet from our camp, down on the main trail. I just want your balance, Gary. I want your balance. Where are you? Where? Gary. I never in my life heard a man scream like this. I've never heard anything like it in my life. It was a brutal, guttural scream that was shrill to the ears yet deep in pitch. The sound of someone got completely mad, and the way he said the stranger's name would switch erratically from long and sing song to short, guttural punches of sound. We killed our lights, became silent, and listened. By some miracle, the madman didn't notice our camp and continued walking down the trail, screaming the whole way. We ended up chatting with who we'll call Gary for hours, listening to the screaming getting further and further. Come to find out, they had taken 5 grams of magic mushrooms each and his buddy, who we'll call Tyler, who was a co-worker of his, it was fine for 3 and a half hours, then suddenly snapped. It seemed as though Tyler thought he could kill Gary and steal his good trip. We hear the screams get further and further for over 2 hours. By this time it's 11 at night, the mood is starting to come out, and it's below 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Tyler had no jacket or flashlight according to Gary. My buddy and I are way too drunk to drive out of camp to get cell service, as it was snowy and icy and required 2-3 to three miles of highway driving after getting off the trail, and Gary was still lightly feeling the effects of weed and mushrooms so he couldn't drive either. We had to make the decision to let the guy wander, hope he sobered up, and could find his way back. And it did. Oh he did right into our camp. We hear yelling after about an hour of no screams, maybe 30 to 50 feet from camp again, hey, help, please help me, I'm lost. And we could tell the man's walking from the woods into our camp. We tell Gary to hide just in case, and greet the man with me carrying my 12 gauge shotgun and my 40 caliber pistol holstered, my buddy carrying his rifle and his two 9mm glocks holstered, and with our flashlights on our brightest settings in his face. He was about 6 foot 3 and approximately 300 pounds. We talked to him, deciding he was calm enough to walk with, and walked him back to his camp. He seemed really remorseful, said he blacked out and didn't remember anything, and had a falling out with his buddy. We escorted him back to his camp down the trail, returned and told Gary that Tyler seemed cool, and if anything else happened to scream and come running. We would come out and help him out, and ended up being a happy ending. We made friends with Gary, and I got his phone number to make sure the next day he got back into town safely, back to his wife and kid, and were actually planning a camping trip with him soon. But Tyler, who wandered screaming like a deranged maniac into the forest, potentially wielding a hat it to murder your friend to steal this good trip or whatever it is your psychosis filled mind was thinking for the love of god let's not meet again if you're liking this video all i ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video thank you Our story begins on a crisp September evening. Since our hotel's restaurants was closed on Mondays and Tuesdays, I was the only employee in the building past 5.30 in the afternoon. Us at the front desk had a habit of sitting in the office and stepping out when we heard a guest approach. This particular evening, my chest was very sore, so I was not in the best mood. While in the office, I hear the lobby door open, so I walk out to the desk. Hi, how are you today? The only description I can give for this man is that he just barely looks like one of the actors who has portrayed Spider-Man, so that is how I will be referring to him. Hi, I just came from insert military base here. Is it okay if I use the restroom and charge my phone for a little bit? A little background on the hotel. We were located within a state park and had six different buildings spread out. The main building where operations was located was a high traffic area, so random people coming in was not unusual. Yeah, go ahead. I go back into the office. Spider-Man takes care of his business and stops back at the desk. 
he began striking up a conversation with me about different things. We sold beer at the desk, and he had asked me for a recommendation, to which I told him that I was not of age, I was 19 at the time, and all that I told him about myself was that I was in school for hospitality management, and that I wanted to open my own hotel one day. Spider-Man then begins to go on and on about his line of work, he's a life coach, how he's written two books, and just about how he loves customer service. In response to him unnecessarily talking at me, not with me, for like 45 minutes, I'm giving him a lot of yeah and oh, really. As mentioned before, I had chest pain and was not in the mood to converse with guests about things not pertaining to my job or their stay. As we near the end of our conversation, Spider-Man says, I really enjoyed our conversation and would love to keep in touch. Of course, my response is, oh, I'm sorry, I can't give out my personal information. No, not your personal information, your business information. At this job, I was at FDA, so I had no business information, which I let him know. Spider-Man was being very pushy, so I eventually say, oh, I work full time in the evenings, so if you ever come back, you'll probably see me. Hindsight is 2020. Obviously, looking back, I would not have relayed this to him, but to everyone else who works in the front office, telling people the general time you're in is not inherently weird. Usually, when I check someone in, I tell them that I'm there until whatever amount of time if they need anything. I guess that satisfied him, so he left for the night. Fast forward a week or so, and it is busy. My property had event spaces in three different buildings, and I believe this night we had weddings in two of them. Since it was a weekend, my coworker and I were split up, so I was doing check-ins at the main building, and she was doing check-ins at the secondary building. The secondary building was on the same road as the cabins we rented out, so we would call all of the guests checking into any of those buildings and let them know to head over there for check-in instead of the main building. We were a smaller property, but since we were located in a state park, I had to deal with hotel guests, wedding guests, and park people not even mentioning the phone. I was slammed, the phone would ring, I would take care of the guest, then someone would come to check-in or buy something, so I couldn't stop to use the restroom. Amid this chaos, a walk Spider-Man in. He comes straight to the desk. How are you? Imagine you're me, who had told a random person who was not staying at the hotel the hours you worked the week prior, and they come back and remember your name shortly after. Obviously, you would believe he came back in to see you. I'm shocked, but do not have time for his pointless attempt at a conversation with me. I respond coldly, Hi, is there anything I can help you with? Yeah, just thinking of grabbing a beer from you and heading up to the bar. You should head up there first. What? The bar? It's closing soon. Go there first. Spider-Man was taken aback, but goes up anyway. He comes back down and has the gall to ask me, Last time I was here you were so nice and talked to me, but now you're being very cold. I snap at him. I'm not in the mood to have a conversation right now. I'm extremely busy, the phone keeps on ringing, and I can't even stop to use the restroom. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. You can go to the bathroom if you need. I'm fine waiting. That moment, my coworker calls me and asks me to bring her something to the secondary building. I'm very irritated at this point but at least it will get me away from Spider-Man. No, I have to go over to the secondary building. What can I grab for you? He begins to look over at our selection, but just says he would come back later and walks away. My coworker calls me back and tells me that she didn't need me to go over there anymore. I tell her briefly about the guy and go on to finally take a leak. My coworker calls me and is asking for help. Our cabins had six individually rentable guest rooms, and the lobby area had a communal fireplace. The fireplaces had a tendency to smoke out the building, partially due to guests not knowing how to use a fireplace, them not being cleaned out for the season, and the building's age. Of course, one of the guests used the fireplace, it smoked out the building, and all of the guests were upset. We were sold out and had no management on duty, so there was nothing we could do for them in the moment. She tells me that this guy keeps bugging her about a solution, but she would tell me more when she got back to the main building. When she gets back, she tells fully about everything going on with the guests while we are sitting in the office. Someone comes to the desk and she goes out to speak to them. I walk out as well, and behold, Spider-Man was standing in front of me. Did you get that break you needed? I said yeah. They walk back into the office. When my coworker comes back, she tells me that was the guy who had been bugging her. Turns out, he was a guest and I had no idea. I tell her everything that happened with Spider-Man and she lets me know that he was talking to her about my quote unquote amazing customer service and just went on and on about me. I never did anything special for him. I wouldn't even say the bare minimum. The following day, I tell my department manager about Spider-Man and say that if a complaint came through about me be rude to a guest, it is because I thought he was coming in specifically to see me. My manager told me it was alright, and that the guy was weird. Spider-Man spoke to my manager earlier in the day when he checked out, and was talking about something with him being on the run and having police involved. Fast forward to a setting in October, we had an event in the main building, so a lot of people were meandering around. My manager, whose hours were always 9 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon, came into work the evening shift with me for whatever reason. By working, he sat down in the office the whole time doing whatever no what. There were some guests 
tests that needed a ride to the train station and were unable to find one, so my manager, who was a rideshare driver on the side, took two separate groups of people over, so he was gone for two hours sporadically. Since my manager was there on and off, I couldn't sit in the back and had to stay out front the whole time. I would like to say around 8.30 at night, I was standing at the desk when it walked Spider-Man. Of course, I recognized him immediately, but decided to pretend I had no idea who he was in hopes he didn't remember me. Hi, how can I help you today? How are you? There goes that idea. He begins to make small talk with me about random things. I politely respond, not getting emotional about anything. Spider-Man then looks at me and asks, so the other day when I came in, I asked you for a beer recommendation and you told me you weren't of age. I'm just curious, how old are you? What? I stare at him for a good 5 seconds with a blank expression before responding. I'm by T. Okay, okay, good to know. You know, I really enjoy talking to you. I love our conversations. Are you comfortable talking with me? Or is it more if I have a question about booking? When I'm conversing with guests, I keep my body very close to the front desk. When talking with Spider-Man, I backed up all the way so I was leaning on the shelving unit that blocked the guest view of our office. Well, I do feel the second way. By the grace of God, he says whatever and walks upstairs to the bar and leaves me alone. My manager was sitting in the office during this whole interaction. I walk back, grab my phone, and make a panicked phone call to my then-partner. I go back to the office and tell my manager that I was going to stay in the back until I knew he was off property. Spider-Man ended up leaving maybe 15 minutes before the end of my shift. The next day, I was scheduled to work at the secondary building. I've had a lot of issues with my department manager and he ended up being the reason why I left that job. This day in particular, one of my morning co-workers had told me that he was saying things about me to her. Something about me always sitting in the back. One, we all collectively sat in the back when it was not busy and had never received a guest complaint about this. Two, why are you talking to my co-workers about me? While I was at the secondary building, I needed to have the room keys brought over. We couldn't make keys there, so my manager and supervisor came down. Before they left, I cursed him out, to which he tried saying that he was telling my coworker that I was sitting in the back the day prior because of Spider-Man. I started saying something else, but a guest came to check in, so this was cut short. This interaction had me on edge the whole day. Later on during my shift, I called to have my middle shift coworker bring me some supplies. She calls me when she gets to her car and tells me that she saw and talked to Spider-Man. When she arrives at the secondary building, she tells me about the conversation she had with him. We knew his first name offhand, but I wanted to remember what his last name was. I looked up his first name and first initial of his Latin name in our system, and what do I see but a reservation under his name booked for that night in the secondary building that was checked in 5 minutes prior by the coworker I was with. I turned to her and asked if she checked him in, to which she said no. I called down to the main building and asked my supervisor if she checked him in, to which she did. I informed her that that man was the one who was being weird with me. She hadn't worked on those days he had come in, so she didn't know who he was. Supervisor let me know that she had told Spider-Man that I was up in the secondary building if you need anything. And he had replied with some compliment about my amazing customer service. The coworker that came over to me had clocked out for her break, but I made her sit at the desk until he arrived. When Spider-Man did come, his face fell as he saw my coworker sitting there instead of myself. He talks to her for a little bit, then makes his way to his room. His was one of the closest to the FD. I don't remember exactly what happened after, but I ended up leaving the secondary building a little before 7 in the afternoon, instead of staying there until 10.30 at night, in an attempt to avoid him. Of course, this was no use since he was already aware that I was on property. Eventually, Spider-Man did see me and kept trying to make conversation with myself as if I didn't already make it clear I had no desire to speak to him in matters unrelated with his stay. He was a very talkative person and kept talking to my supervisor. Already on edge because of the issue with my manager, I needed to let off some steam. I go to the restaurant kitchen and start venting about Spider-Man to the cooks. The manager walks into the kitchen and is like, oh, are you talking about Spider-Man? And he's a little weird, but harmless. He talks about you the other day when he came in, I let him know that you were dating someone. You just have to learn when to tell men that you are uninterested. Being a young woman that works in hospitality, it is not uncommon to have guests hit on you from time to time. Whenever that does occur, I will politely tell them that I am not interested. Spider-Man was different, however, he never outwardly said that he was interested in me or wanted to take me out, and I did not want to be one of those girls who assumes everyone is into them. My manager also let me know that Spider-Man was 36. I go back down and try to sit in the office for the remaining 
remainder of my shift, keeping myself busy with schoolwork, only going out when my supervisor needed another body. Spider-Man was at the desk with my supervisor talking about God knows what. We had temps working in the kitchen who only spoke Spanish. Someone asked for me to go help them since I spoke Spanish. When I came back, he goes, oh, you speak Spanish. He asks in Spanish, how much does a bottle of water cost? I reply back in English, two dollars. It walked back into the office, oh, I wanted to talk with you in Spanish. Ignored. I continue doing my schoolwork in the back. My supervisor is up front at the desk taking her 30, still talking to the guy since she didn't want to leave me there with him. I felt bad, even though it was slow, so when a guest came to the desk with a question, I ran out to help them. After assisting the guest, Spider-Man asks, may I speak with you please? Again, ignored. Continue doing schoolwork. Supervisor has to walk away from the desk to clock back in. While she's gone, Spider-Man repeats himself, may I speak with you please? I'm not sure if it was intentional, but it sounded very authoritative. I go out to the desk. I'm sorry, I was taking an exam that was timed to do at midnight. Is there anything I can help you with? I just wanted to apologize about asking your age the other day. I didn't mean anything by it. I was just curious. I thanked him and he continued, like I've said before, I love talking to you. I love our conversations. I've been going through something lately and I feel as though we've really connected. I interrupted them. May I be honest with you? Sir, sir, there's a certain way I have to interact with everyone I come in contact with while I'm working. We never had a conversation. You were just talking at me. I don't know if you've noticed, but you make me very uncomfortable and I've been trying to avoid you every time that you've returned. Yes, I have noticed, and I'm curious as to why that is. Now, Spider-Man has never said anything explicit to me, but his vibe is just so off. Since I'm on the clock, I can't just tell him to screw off, so I try explaining myself in the most professional way possible. Well, you give me a weird vibe. You put me off to be quite frank with you. Well, I never did anything inappropriate. Even yesterday when you said that you were comfortable talking to me, I just went up to the bar. I'm just trying to express that you make me uncomfortable. I'm trying to set a boundary. I understand that you're trying to set a boundary, but I never did anything inappropriate. At this point, we're going back and forth. He had actually gotten upset with me because I kept calling him sir instead of his first name. My supervisor returns and stands at the other end of the desk silently, letting me blow up on the sky. Spider-Man is just not getting the hint, you guys. Remember how the manager told me he was 36. I end up telling him, for a man that is old enough enough to be my father, you should know well enough not to flirt with a 19 year old. The face this man made. He looks at me, over to my supervisor, and back at me, and goes flirting. I was never flirting, and I don't think you know how old I am, but for Mr. to have been your father, I would have had to have you at. This guy literally stands there counting on his fingers. 17 years old. Is that impossible? People literally have kids at 14. When I'm upset, my voice will get progressively louder. Spider-Man puts his hands up and says there is no need for you to yell at me. I'm standing right here. I snap back with if you have any issue with the way I am speaking to you, you can contact my manager. His card is right there. We don't need to escalate this. Eventually, I say to him, sir, you make me very uncomfortable. It feels as though you are coming back in specifically to see me, and for that I would prefer if you don't come back again. I was an FDA and had no authority to ban anyone, so this wasn't an official thing. More so me expressing my feelings. I have every right to come back here. Yes, sir, you do have every right to come back here, just as I have every right to leave this conversation. Have a wonderful night. I stomp back into the office. Spider-Man begins ranting about me to my supervisor, being all I never did anything wrong. She's overacting. My supervisor is just giving him the head nod, because she knows everything that happened, and that this was out of character for me in terms of guest relations. Spider-Man tries going up to the bar, realizes it closed for the night, and walks out of the building. My supervisor had to take over all of the end of shift duties, so I didn't have to be at the desk. Night audit comes in, and as I try to explain what happened, Spider-Man walks back in. Night audit goes out and greets him. What is your position here? Spider-Man gruffly asks. Night Audit replies in a matter-of-fact tone. Night Audit. Spider-Man asks for my supervisor, who is unavailable, so he tries waiting a few minutes, but ends up leaving for the night. I ended up having Night Audit and my supervisor's partner walk me out to my car that night to make sure he wasn't waiting for me or anything. I head off the day after I blew up on Spider-Man. Following my supervisor's advice, I texted my manager asking if I could call him at some point in the day about what had happened. We agreed to call around 1 in the afternoon afternoon as I was attending classes in the morning. My morning coworker had texted me after I got out of class. Here is our conversation. My morning manager, he is here complaining about you to I'm trying to eavesdrop. Me, I went off on him yesterday in front of I'm talking to my manager in an hour or so. Let me know what happens. My morning manager, I will and I think he heard me warning our sales coordinator about it today so it's about me too. But is taking his side so far so that's fun. My morning manager, this man is telling you had feelings for him. Me, what? My morning manager, he is describing to about how you guys were having banter and said
said you shouldn't do that if you don't want anything. The we never bantered though, given all of this new information, I was able to provide more evidence to my manager about Spider-Man. Surprisingly, my manager actually took the situation seriously. Yeah, no, I'll ban him when I'm back in tomorrow. That's my first win in a while. After I got off the phone with my Morty manager, I called and texted my other co-workers giving them a full debrief on Spider-Man. The Morty co-worker that had texted me about him let me know that he was hanging around her as well. She comes in for her shift at 7 in the morning and he was hanging around in the lobby of the main building so not even the building he was staying in for a while. My morning co-worker also told me that our manager was not aware that she had overheard his conversation with Spider-Man. My manager had a whole conversation with me about he was a safe man and my manager didn't realize I was there when they were having the conversation and came back and told me completely different things than what I heard them talking about. This part I'm not 100% I heard right but I'm pretty sure my manager told the guy you owed him an apology. The next day, I came in for my shift at 3 in the afternoon. My morning coworker lets me know that Spider-Man was waiting in the lobby for her that day. He was there when she came in and kept trying to talk to her. Night audit stayed with her until around 8 in the morning when our morning manager came. Spider-Man would come over to the desk, realize she was there, would walk off for a few minutes, rinse repeat. Eventually, he checked out with the both of them. Spider-Man handed them his room keys. It was like I'm expecting a written letter of apology from her. He and my morning manager actually crossed paths in the parking lot. When my morning manager came in, she was like that's the guy. He's weird. Anyway, my morning manager pulls my other manager and supervisor into his office for a little bit, then grabs me. He basically was like you need to protect yourself. Why would you entertain the conversation with him for that long? If I wasn't on the clock, I basically would have told him to screw off. I can't be rude to guests. If someone is acting like that, I'm perfectly fine with you telling them whatever so they can leave you alone. Oh word. So my manager was the one who made the call telling him he wasn't allowed back. What was funny is that whenever my manager was on the phone, he would always have it on speaker. This time, he held that phone up to his ear and was speaking very low, so I couldn't hear the conversation. He told me that Spider-Man was all but I love staying with you guys on the phone. I ended up leaving that property in early December. Luckily, I had accepted a higher paying position at the hotel in the local military base. Since Spider-Man had mentioned that he had been staying at that hotel, I was very nervous about accepting the position in fear that I would see him again. My first or second day, I was hanging around the office when a reservations agent got off of the phone with a difficult guest. Agent and supervisor who was training me began talking about difficult and weird guests. I had asked them if they knew someone by the name of Spider-Man. Supervisor turns to me in disbelief and says, yes, we banned him. What? She brings me into my manager's office and they tell me the whole story. Manager explains that Spider-Man came and stayed with them in early September and was being very odd. He owed some people money and they were after him, so he was trying to be stealth by staying in our hotel since we were located in a military base. You needed to show identification before being let in. He kept all pestering the employees about knowing if these guys had come in looking for him, and that they should be verifying everyone's identifications as they enter our hotel. Quite literally none of us were paid enough to do that, nor cared, as if that was anyone's job. He would hang around in the lobby areas for a while, and just kept bothering the employees. Someone had let me know that he had actually come in with a woman, who appeared to be around his age, if anyone was wondering, and a few days later he came to the desk and said that she had broken up with him, and he didn't understand understand why. Spider-Man had even mailed a copy of both of his books addressed to one of the supervisors to the hotel. I think some of the valet mentioned that he may or may not be racist, which I'm not sure of as I myself am visibly a person of color, and so was my old manager. Given all of this, my manager went to the higher manager and was like something needs to be done about this guy. My higher ranking manager went to Spider-Man's room, told him he needed to leave and was no longer welcome for the next three months. He waited in the door while Spider-Man packed his belongings up, which he didn't even have a suitcase. All of his things were in laundry baskets and garbage bags. I tell them everything that happened at my previous hotel with Spider-Man. So according to the timeline, he stayed at the military base hotel first, got banned, and then stayed at my previous property. Since there were only three actual hotels in the area that I worked, two of them being properties I had worked at, and the other one being a chain hotel, I wanted to know if he was banned from the third hotel as well. Spider-Man was to call my higher ranking manager before he came back to check and see if he was good to return on property. He did call a few times, but my higher ranking manager let him know that he was permitted to return. Luckily, I have not seen him since I blew up on him in October. A funny bit for you all, the employees at the military hotel actually held onto the books he mailed in, and I read one of them during a boring shift. This book was terrible. I could open my butt, take a dump on a page, publish it, and it would be better than what he wrote. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
This story happened when I was about 13 or 14. I grew up in a town with a lot of walking and biking trails in a forest area about a 10 minute walk from my house, so I spent a lot of time outside. One of my best friends, we'll call him Anthony, lived in the neighborhood across from mine. I would frequently walk to his house to knock on his door and see whether he wanted to join me in biking aimlessly around town. On this particular day, he decided to join me and we went down to the local lake, an extremely popular spot during the summer. It's never empty. There's a trail right next to the local library which leads to the lake. We decided to hang out by the trail entrance as it was right next to a tunnel that ran under the street above, providing good shade and amplification for listening to music together off our iPods. This tunnel is probably a good 20 feet long or so, with the only easy path back up to the street above being the paved one on one side. The trail itself is gravel, with trees on both sides, no easy way to get off with a bike unless you use the designated entrances and exits. Anthony and I were hanging out on the opposite side of the tunnel from the trail entrance so as not to bother any family families getting on the trail with our music. We had our bikes leaned up on the side of the tunnel when I noticed a man coming through the opposite end, right next to the trail entrance. He entered the tunnel and, once he was about 15 feet away, called out I may insert our city name here, police officer. It didn't take more than a two second glance to tell that he wasn't. He was wearing cargo shorts, a green tank top, sandals, and a big military style backpack. Even from about 15 feet away I could tell that his skin looked really greasy, his hair was unkempt. I immediately knew something bad was about to happen and my adrenaline started to rush. I turned to my friend and just yelled at him Anthony run, to which he got on his bike and began to ride off. The man was standing between us and the trail entrance, so there was no easy way for us to take off without either needing to go directly past him or down the trail in the opposite direction. Anthony chose to try for the main entrance that the man was blocking. As he rode past the man reached out and grabbed his arm. Anthony sort of stopped but the man was more focused on me and ended up letting go to which Anthony quickly took off. I knew I wouldn't be as lucky as Anthony was if I tried tried to push my way past the man, so I immediately started looking for other ways to run. I noticed that there was actually a small dirt trail on the same end of the tunnel that we had been. I tried to take my bike up it and the man yelled out behind me, didn't your parents ever teach you not to run from the cops? The trail grew too small for me to carry my bike down so I just dropped it on the ground and continued running. Hoping that this side trail led back up to the street where he at least wouldn't be able to hurt me without witnesses. He chased me about halfway down the trail but eventually turned around. I ended up coming out at the library and quickly ran to the top of the tunnel so that I could see what he was doing. All I saw was him riding off on my bike. I called the cops and they came to my house to give me a lineup after I walked home. I instantly identified the guy. Apparently he and his twin brother were homeless and all meth which would explain his demeanor and motivation. They were known for stealing bikes in the area but never so brazenly. I was just glad that the situation wasn't worse because based on his substance use he very easily could have chosen violence at the drop of a hat. To the fake cop that stole my bike, let's not meet. The incident I'm about to share was when I was 21 years old. I'm a dude, so I'm part of an online friend group on Discord. We're all from the same country, but most of us are from different cities. Only two other people are from the same city as me. Everything was going fine between us, until suddenly there were a series of unfortunate incidents where I had minor fallouts with them. I went through personal frustrations, and I unknowingly projected them onto people on the server. These fallouts continued over April and May until one day I left the group in a frenzy. Side note, I admit, I was pretty childish and how I acted with the group. I remember to apologize to all the people there for my actions, and most of them forgave me. Afterward, the night before June began, one of the people, let's call him person one, texted me asking if I knew certain people from my high school. I told him I did. I asked person one how he knew them, and he revealed to me that he knew a lot of people from there. Suddenly, the conversation took a dark turn. Person one started talking to me in a sinister tone, telling me he had some of my personal information. What college I went to, my route to college, who I hung out with both in my old high school and college, and he even claimed to have some of the photos from my personal Instagram. When I asked him how he had all of that, he claimed he had tailed my car and kept repeating the phrase that people at your college are bad at providing information. At that point, I was scared to death. He told me if I didn't return to the group and if I didn't apologize to a specific person, let's call her person two, the girl he threatened me over, he'd first dox me and then wait outside my college to kidnap and kill me. After the conversation ended, I rejoined the discord group out of fear and then went to bed 
bed. The next couple of days were rough. The fear of what person one could do to me gripped me tightly. I lost my energy and motivation, the ability to engage in my usual day-to-day -day interests, and I even lost my appetite for food. My family and friends both noticed that something was wrong with me. I was too scared to even tell other people about what was going on. Fearing for your safety is a fate I wouldn't even wish on my worst enemy. Normally, death threats like these wouldn't scare me, but what made this situation different were the following points. Person 1 lived in the same city as me and relatively close to my neighborhood. Before this incident and my fallouts, he'd often tell us stories of how he got into major gang fights and dangerous situations. I had never received serious death threats before. I've pretty much been safe my whole life. Since this was my first time facing such a situation, it seriously traumatized me. A couple of days later, I contacted Person 1 again and begged him to stop dictating me like that. Finally, he revealed to me his reason for scaring me. He told me he wanted to humble me so I stopped being too moody in the group and rejoined. He said he wasn't dictating me anymore, but still wanted me to remember the conditions he put on me as a request this time, and not a threat. The situation was technically over after that. I did talk to other people from the group, including Person 2, about what Person 1 did to me and they all responded the same way. They assured me that Person 1's threats seemed mostly empty and that everything was okay. None of them approved of what Person 1 had done, but I also told them not to talk to him about it out of fear for my safety. I know, that was probably a stupid move on my part. This whole ordeal left me shocked. Even though Person 1 told me he wasn't dictating me anymore, the effects of the whole situation took a toll on me. It's been a month and a half since this happened, but it still hasn't left me. My image of the group has been tainted. Every time I come across the Discord server and see Person 1 and others, my heart suddenly fills with dread. I've been thinking about leaving the group one day, but right now, I feel stuck. Normally, people would tell you to cut abusive friends off, but I find that difficult because he's part of the same group and everyone else in the group has been incredibly kind and supportive of me. My mind keeps telling me that cutting person one off means cutting everyone else off. Secondly, yes, I do have the option of just cutting him off on my private socials, but I'm scared that he might threaten me again, even though he never implied he was going to force me to stay friends with him. So, this is my present situation. I'm stuck in a friend group that I don't want to be part of anymore because one of the people in that group thought it was a good idea to humble me by traumatizing me with threats. I know that leaving the group is the best thing for me, but I'm too scared of what's going to happen to me if I do so. I keep thinking about how peaceful life would have been had I not made the mistake of joining their Discord server all those months ago. My incident with Person 1 has made me realize just how evil some people can be. I want to avoid him, but because of my paranoia, I sometimes force myself to engage with the group normally. I don't ever want to meet person 1 or interact with him in any way. I want to cut him off and forget about him completely, but I don't see any way out as of right now. It feels like I was slowly lured into a cage and immediately imprisoned the moment I settled in. I know very well that leaving the group is the right option for me right now because if I don't, my mental health will continue to decline, but I need help in finally achieving that goal. When I was 14, I worked at a McDonald's that was connected to a gas station. It was a truck stop, so it was very busy 90% of the time. The only downside to working at a truck stop fast food place was that the bathroom was on the complete other side of the building. I was a freshman in high school. At the time, I was pretty small, maybe not in height, but in size. I was around 5 foot 6 and anywhere from 130 to 150 pounds. Not super tiny, but small enough to where I probably have made an easy target. This wasn't a fear of mine, however, but maybe it should have been. I remember I was in gym class. It was maybe the middle of the school day, and it was one of those days where we could just sit on the side and catch up on work for other classes if we didn't want to participate in the game. My friends and I did this almost all the time, and almost never actually worked on anything important. We were laughing and joking around until I received power school notifications my school iPad excusing me from the remaining classes of the day. I was really confused, considering my mom hadn't mentioned anything about picking me up early, and I was only seeing my dad every other weekend and he wasn't the type to pick me up from school. I was grounded, so I didn't have a phone with me other than a cheap flip phone my mom had gotten me from Walmart. I texted her about the notifications, but before I got a response back from her, my gym teacher told me I needed to grab my things and go to the office because my mom would be picking me up. This confused me even more, and I shot my mom another text, asking if she was picking me up from school. She freaked out and told me not to leave the building. At this point, I was sitting in the office by the window, waiting for apparently nobody to come pick me up until the situation was figured out. My mom ended up calling the school and letting them know I wasn't allowed to leave with anyone that day. Apparently, whoever called claimed to be my mom and said they were coming to pick me up. As far as I know, nobody ever showed up to pick me up, and I didn't hear anything else about it. My mom wasn't comfortable with me working at a 
truck stop and we got my location switched to a McDonald's that was closer in town and wasn't connected to a gas station. What we think might have happened is someone saw my name tag and possibly called all the schools in the area until they found me, but I still have no idea how they would have known my last name. With that being said, creepy stranger who pretended to be my mom over the phone and tried to pull me out of school, let's not meet. The story I'm going to tell you happened over the course of roughly five or six years. Names have, of course, been changed. When I was in college, I met this dude named Steve. He was good looking, well spoken, and confident. He was instantly well liked by most of the people that he met, but was a bit intimidating to me at first due to the fact that he was pretty jacked and didn't speak to me a whole lot in the beginning. Here I was, an 18 going on 19 fat kid with an inferiority complex that made me act out to get attention. I would wear women's clothes to class to get a laugh, or interrupt the professors with a witticism here and a joke there, again for a laugh. I was that kid, the one that people didn't exactly dislike, but weren't too eager to hang out with because I could be a bit much at times. This did nothing to help with my feelings of inadequacy, but I didn't make the connection there until a couple years later. Steve and I didn't exactly become fast and hard friends because I got pretty drunk at a party once and he decided instantly that I was annoying. Still, we were civil to each other as we were in the same department and had a couple of classes together. We kind of hung with different crowds too, even inside the department. Steve had recently been kicked out of boot camp in the military. He told everyone that it was because he had injured himself badly enough that he had been discharged, but that wasn't true. However, we'll get to that part later. Cut to about three or four months after my first meeting Steve, and I had been invited by a mutual friend, Corey, to come to a small get-together at his place where he incidentally was roommates with Steve. I told Corey that I was kind of wary of Steve It felt like he didn't like me, to which he replied that I was right and that was why he wanted me to come over. He wanted me and Steve to get to know each other better because he was positive we would become friends if we just gave each other a chance. After some more prodding, I finally agreed. When I arrived at Corey's house, there were maybe three other people from the department there. It seemed like a pretty chill setting. There was some alcohol being passed around and I drank a little bit, but I kept my distance from Steve. After a couple hours and quite a few beers, I was starting to feel pretty good. Someone brought out a couple of joints and those started getting passed around the room. When one of them made its way to me, Steve spoke up. Don't bother passing to him, he said with a mocking laugh. He's a goody good. I'm not exactly sure why he said or even thought that. It might have been because I once mentioned in passing that I had never smoked weed before. Regardless of why he said it, it made me mad that he was making fun of me. So I did what any 19 year old, drunk dude would do. I grabbed the joint and took the biggest hit I could possibly take. This, as anyone who has ever smoked knows, is a huge mistake for a marijuana virgin with quality cush is handed to him. After my coughing fit and all of the laughter at my expense, had subsided I looked at Steve challengingly and he just kind of nodded in my direction before resuming his conversation. Now, no one told me that you shouldn't mix alcohol and weed. Had I stopped there, I would have been fine. However, I continued to drink which exacerbated all the stuff that comes along with being high. By the time I knew I was high, I was starting to get paranoid. I am, or at least was, a bit of a hypochondriac. Dry mouth felt like my tongue was swelling up and my throat was starting to close. The feeling of almost weightlessness that sometimes accompanies being high made me feel like I wasn't anchored to the floor anymore. The time dilation that you experience with weed made me feel like I was literally frozen in time. I started to panic. By this point, everyone else had gone home and it was just me, Steve, and Corey. I explained to Corey that I thought I was allergic to weed because I wasn't feeling right, and oddly enough, Steve asked me to explain what I was feeling. When I did, he walked me through all of it and calmed me down. Once I was calm, he put a controller in my hands and we played video games until I sobered up enough to drive. It was honestly really cool of him, and it was the start of one of the best friendships I've ever had until it became the worst, most abusive relationship I've ever been in. Over the next year or so, Steve and I became really close. I considered him one of my best friends. Being around him was almost like a drug. He just had this way of making you feel like you mattered. I know now that he was a complete sociopath, but you don't really see those signs until it's too late. He harassed me until I started working out with him, which meant I had more energy and confidence in myself. I got into pretty decent shape. I wasn't ripped. I wasn't even what most people would call fit, but I wasn't the fat kid anymore either. He would come to my house and forced me to go out and do stuff. Before I became friends with him, I was kind of a loner and a hermit. We would go to the lake just to screw around, or go hiking in the woods, or any number of outdoorsy type activities. For the first time in years, I had confidence in myself and I was actually quite happy. Enter Lisa. Lisa was the love of my life. The one who got away, or rather the one that I stupidly dumped twice over a five-year relationship because I was scared. She's not a huge part of the ballad of Steve, but she plays a role. She had come to my hometown to go to school, and she had a boyfriend back home 
home, but we clicked immediately. I know you're wondering, and no, we didn't hook up or anything while she was with him. She made her intentions toward me clear, and I made it clear that nothing would happen while she was dating someone else. She told me that she had been considering breaking things off with him as he was a bit controlling and a jerk, and the next day she walked up to me and kissed me full on the mouth. When I started to push her away, she laughed and said, I broke up with Jason last night. You're my Dell. I smiled back and our relationship began. I apologize for getting into these details that have nothing to do with Steve. It was just an immensely happy time of my life, and I never would have had the confidence to flirt with Lisa in the first place if it weren't for Steve. The next year after Lisa and I got together was rather uneventful. I will admit there were some red flags with Steve that I either didn't see or just outright ignored. Looking back on it now, one of the most obvious signs was that one day I was hanging out with Lisa when Steve showed up. She had always gotten a bad vibe from him, rightly so, and so when he showed up she left to go to class 45 minutes early. Watching her walk away, Steve said, I could take her from you if I wanted. I gave him an incredulous look, slightly panicking that this man who called himself my friend might actually want to and be able to sway Lisa to date him instead. He laughed at my expression and added, don't worry, I don't want her. She's like a six at best. She's perfect for you, but just thought you should know that if I wanted, I could take her from you. It should be noted that Lisa was absolutely gorgeous in a very classical way. I am now convinced that Steve actually was attracted to her. I did get angry and told him not to talk to her about my girlfriend in such a gross manner, but once he gave a half-hearted apology, I just kind of shrugged it off. The next year, there were even more red flags that I chose to ignore. I know the story is moving rather quickly right now, but those first couple of years weren't really that bad. Yes, Steve was starting to show his true colors, but the really bad stuff was still to come. Also, if you're keeping track, I was at a two-year college for three years. Years. That's just how long it took me to get my associate's degree. That's neither here nor there. Steve started dating one of the freshmen in our department. I heard from others that the relationship was incredibly psychologically abusive on his end, but I kept brushing it off because the girl he was dating hadn't spoken up and Steve was a good guy, right? I mean, I hadn't witnessed it. Other people must just be misinterpreting Steve's unusual sense of humor in a way that painted him in a bad light in their minds. I was unaware at the time that of course she wouldn't speak out against him because that's what psychological abuse is. It's gaslighting and insults and ensuring that the victim believes themselves to be absolutely worthless and deserving of the treatment that they receive. During the end of year departmental party, I proposed to Lisa and she said yes. When Lisa and I graduated from the college with an associate's degree, we decided to move to a new school together. Despite the fact that our relationship grew stronger than ever without Steve in our lives, a dot that I didn't connect due to still being firmly in his psychotic grasp, the college we decided to transfer to was absolute garbage and after the year was over, we had decided to transfer again into a better and cheaper school this time about an hour away. Coincidentally, it was the same school that Steve now attended. That summer, Lisa moved back to her hometown while transitioning between schools, and I ended things with her for the first time over the phone. Bad, I know, but we were like five hours apart since I had stayed behind to live on campus and work, and neither of us could find the time to visit the other. The only reason I can logically come up with is that I was scared of the commitment. I've always said that when I marry, I want it to be for life. I got in my own head and started to worry about whether or not Lisa was the person I really wanted to spend the rest of my life with. When I moved to the new city, Steve helped me get an apartment in the same complex where he and Corey, the friend from earlier, both lived. We were in separate buildings, but the apartments were set up in a way that the courtyard between the two buildings was only like 40 feet across. I could actually see into Steve's basement apartment window from my second floor one when we both had our blinds open. There were many times that I would glance out the window while playing video games or something and Steve would catch my eye and wave me over, so I would obediently turn my game off and head over to his place to smoke a little weed and watch one of his four DVDs for the billionth time. During this time in my life, I became a major alcoholic. I'm fairly certain that Steve realized this was happening, but said nothing because he wanted to be able to hold it over me later. He may have contributed to my alcoholism a bit. He began to use the same bullying tactics he had once employed to get me to work out and go do things. This time, he was using them to get me to go out drinking. If I told him that I had class early the next day or homework that needed doing, he would just wave it off and tell me we would be back in plenty of time for me to get my homework done or get plenty of sleep. We would often stay out until 2 in the morning when the bars closed, or later if he met someone cool and decided we were going to go to their house to hang for a bit afterward. If I said I didn't have money, he would promise to pay for me. At the end of the night, I would get a bill I could barely afford and he would explain that clearly he meant he would pay for the first couple of rounds and if I drank more than that it was my fault. Several times I had to borrow money from him to pay rent, which further put me in his control. I would like to take a brief break and address the elephant in the room. I realized that every single one of the previously mentioned problems 
problem stem from me. I could have moderated my drinking. I could have told him no when he asked me to go out. I could have realized sooner that he was never truly going to pay my bar tab or that we weren't going to be home early. I take responsibility for all of these things. That being said, something you have to understand about Steve is that he would gaslight and make me feel like I was being a bad friend if I told him no, despite having a very valid reason for the refusal. What I'm trying to do by telling you this part is point out that he was never the good friend that I thought he was, or he would have pointed out that I was drinking too much. Would it have stopped me? As I know now from the numerous attempts by another really true friend, no it wouldn't have. But at least in hindsight, I would be able to say, you know, Steve tried to get me to stop drinking. He was a good friend. And back to the story, some few months after moving to the new city, Steve introduced me to a friend of his from out of town. Jennifer. She was a very pretty woman with dyed red hair, styled into a pixie cut. She was thin, with an athletic build and a gorgeous face. She was honestly every straight man's dream. Not only that, but she was intelligent, funny, quick-witted, compassionate, and kind. I instantly developed a crush on her, but I was sure she was out of my league. I asked Steve if she was seeing anyone though, because at this point I still had some confidence. He told me she wasn't and asked if I liked her. I said yes, and he assured me that he would try to get a feel for what she thought of me. Cut to a few days later, and Steve is now dating her. This confused me, because when he introduced us, they kept making jokes about how neither of them was really interested in the other and they would never work as a couple. I think even back then, I knew that he had done his psychological games to get her to date him so he could, once again, assert his dominance over me. I shrugged it off, happy that my friend had finally found a girl to make him forget that freshman he had been dating a couple years ago. He had constantly moaned about missing her when she finally got the courage to tell him to screw off one night after he had called her fat. She was maybe 95 pounds. Over the next few weeks, I started to notice that Jennifer was looking more and more exhausted and haggard. When I asked if she was okay, she would just smile and assure me that her workload was just getting to her. We had started to become friends, so I asked her not to hesitate in coming to me if there was anything I could do to help her out. She thanked me for the kind gesture, but again said she would be fine. I would later find out that Steve was treating her just the same as he had treated his previous girlfriend. She apparently told Steve about my offer for help, thinking it was sweet that I wanted to help her, and as you might guess, Steve flew off the handle. I had never seen him so angry. He came to my apartment banging on the door fit to break it down and screaming at me to get my two-faced self out in the hallway so he could kill me. I didn't know it at the time, but Steve had started taking steroids, which explained part of his unfounded rage. After nearly an hour of him pacing my living room threatening me and yelling loud enough to wake the whole neighborhood, I was finally able to convince him that my intentions were nothing but friendly toward Jennifer now. I wasn't going to pursue her since she had dated one of my best friends. Once he finally believed that I wasn't trying to stuff his girl like a Thanksgiving turkey as he put it, it was like a switch was flipped. Suddenly we were best friends again, and his earlier rage seemed to have been forgotten as if it had never happened. He dumped Jennifer shortly after. My guess is that he realized I had no romantic interest in her anymore, and therefore couldn't use his relationship with her to needle me and control me. I only saw her a handful of times after that, but the last time I saw her she looked so much happier. Yet another sign about Steve I either didn't see or chose to ignore. About a month after the yelling incident Lisa and I got back together. She was incredibly distrustful and wary of me at this point, and rightly so. I had broken her heart for no other reason than that I was an idiot. Over time, she began to trust me with her emotions again. This was a mistake on her part, and I don't mean that to sound cruel. Perhaps I had picked up some things from Steve. I know that I was fairly manipulative. I am more ashamed of that than I could ever portray with words. I hate myself to this day for some of the ways I treated her during our second stint as a couple. Lisa was still uncomfortable around Steve, and she would often leave if we were hanging out and Steve showed up. He never seemed to catch on that she didn't want to be around him. Things were made far worse when we went to a house party one night and Steve groped her. Again, I am incredibly ashamed to admit what I did when she came to me in tears of rage and disgust and told me what happened. I am ashamed because the first thing out of my mouth was, Steve wouldn't do that. Maybe you just misunderstood what was going on. He grabbed my chest. She practically yelled at me. All right, I said, I'll go talk to you. I should have just cut him out right then and there. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I should have taken Lisa home. I should have went and knocked Steve out. I should have done a lot of things, but I've always been a people pleaser, and Steve brought this out in me in the worst way. When I asked Steve about the situation, he told me that he had grabbed her waist to get around her in the kitchen which was crowded, and that he had accidentally brushed up against her while reaching for a bottle of rum. I believed him, but I went back to Lisa and conveyed what had been told to me. After a lot more enraged tears and yelling, she left. Why she didn't just dump my stupid, harassment apologist, victim blaming self right then, I still don't 
don't know. When Steve appeared a few minutes later and I explained what had happened, he put on a faux sympathetic face and said with a chuckle, man, screw her. Let's find somebody better for you. Even back then I knew that that was a huge red flag, but I still ignored the signs. I didn't cheat, but I ignored the signs. Lisa didn't speak to me for a week and she was right to do so. She should have never spoken to me again. For the next few months, things with Steve were a bit strained and we didn't hang out much. Things with Lisa improved again now that Steve wasn't around as much. We were even talking about moving in together. This would not ever happen because I was going to break up with her again before long. I didn't know I was going to do this at the time, but it was going to happen. When it did happen, there were no tears like the last time. There was no pleading that we could make it work. Lisa simply fixed me with an emotionless, almost dead gaze and said, my sister told me not to trust you again. I should have listened. Get your stuff and get out of my apartment. Now I really wish that she had just left it at that, but over the next couple of years we would go on to have a few stints as friends with benefits as we both knew what the other wanted in bed and it was just easier for both of us I think to find comfort with each other when we wanted. I obviously obliged. There were no feelings in it for her. We never got back together, but we became a sort of facsimile of friends again after a while. Shortly after our breakup, I became immensely depressed. I didn't realize that it was because I was still in love with Lisa. Why would I be? I had broken things off with her. Regardless, I started drinking even more and stopped working out. I started regaining all the weight I had lost my freshman year of college and Steve noticed, often remarking that I was a fat. I never really minded it because I I was used to my weight being the butt of every other joke. Besides, he always said it with a laugh to let me know that he was only joking. The way good friends always insult each other, right? At the same time, I started hanging out with him again. One day he came to me asking if I wanted to move into a house with him. I politely declined because I liked living alone and my rent was relatively cheap for where I lived. He got unreasonably angry, saying that I owed him everything. He proceeded to scream at me for half an hour. He didn't speak to me for three days, but did eventually calm down. He never apologized for his ridiculous outburst though when he moved out. Another mutual friend took his apartment after having just gone through a bad breakup of his own and I started hanging out with this new friend, Mark, quite a bit since he was just across the courtyard and Steve was a couple miles away. During this time I met a man through Mark who would go on to become one of the two best friends that I have ever had and one of the most amazing people I've ever known. Enter Nick. Remember the friend from earlier who I said regularly tried to get me to stop drinking? That's Nick. He was in as a man who, for some reason, I never want to disappoint point. Even today, being mostly sober, a huge part of what keeps me from drinking is the idea that if Nick found out I would be more ashamed of myself than if I publicly pooped my pants in front of the woman of my dreams. Personally, that to me is a mark of a true friend, mostly because Nick never asked for or expected me to feel this way. In fact, I think he's a little uncomfortable with it, but it's not something I can just turn off. Nick and I hit it off fairly quickly and started hanging out regularly. It was with Nick and his circle of friends, all of whom I proudly now call my own friends, that a Dungeons and Dragons group was started that lasted for nearly four years. Nick plays a bigger, if not huge, part in this story later. Things continued this way for maybe half a year before I finally decided to take Steve up on his offer and move into the house with him, mostly because money was tight and my bills would go down. His current roommates had moved away for whatever reason and he had a couple of vacancies. I took one room, and a friend of his from when he was in boot camp, Greg, took the other. For a while, things were awesome. Steve had apparently become Catholic. He was off the juice. It was like I had my old friend back from the days when we had first started becoming chummy. He, Greg, and I would often go on road trips or go out to bars or just go to some outdoor attractions around the city and walk around. Now, remember that I said that Steve had been discharged from the military and claimed that it was due to an injury. Turns out that was not true at all. One night while Steve was at work, Greg and I were hanging out with some beers and somehow the topic came up. You know he was crazy? Yeah. Greg asked, what do you mean? I said, he was kicked out before he finished boot camp. Really? He told me that he suffered some kind of injury and they had to let him go. After I said this, an incredulous look came over Greg's face and he turned slowly to look at me. He then proceeded to tell me that what Steve had told me was an utter lie. He told me that Steve had reason to suspect that his then wife was cheating on him and had been overheard by a commanding officer saying that when he finished with boot camp he was going to murder them both and the daughter that he and his wife had. He had been given an in-depth psychological evaluation and been discharged essentially for being quote-unquote too insane for the military. I later confirmed this with some of Steve's childhood friends. 
At this point, I was starting to realize who Steve really was, thinking back on some of the interactions I had with him. Unfortunately, I was stupidly loyal to someone I perceived to be a good friend. At some point, I had invited Nick to come over and hang out to play video games and whatnot, and when Steve met Nick, he immediately called him fat. Now, Nick was at the time a large man, and he has since made enormous strides in his fitness journey. Shout out to Nick for your hard work if you're reading this. You look great. Regardless, I remember the look of utter disbelief on Nick's face, but I defended Steve by saying that was just how he made friends. If he wasn't calling you names, then it meant he didn't like you. By the way, can we stop that stuff? Treating people like crap as a way to break the ice is terrible. I'm guilty of it in the past, and I hate that I used to do it. Anyway, not relevant. I could tell Nick was skeptical, but he just kind of went with it. I think he kind of resented me for not defending him, but he never said so. I don't blame him if he did. A few weeks after the conversation with Greg, Steve had a friend of his from out of town stay with us for a weekend. Greg was out of town for work or something. I forget the details as they aren't important. Before this friend of Steve's arrived, he told me that she was fat, but pretty and if I wanted to bone down with her, I had his blessing. This did not sit well with me, not only because of how he described her, which I learned wasn't true when she arrived, but because he felt the need to give his permission for two of his friends to get in bed with each other. I kept my mouth shut, though I forget the woman's name, but she was a very pretty woman. I was confused as to why Steve would describe her as such. She and I got along really well from the start. That night, she and Steve slept together. Again, I'm fairly certain he slept with her because he could tell I was taking a liking to her. I wasn't falling over myself to get into a relationship with her, but I did like her quite a bit. Steve had to once again assert his dominance over me. The next day, we all had lunch at a local restaurant and Steve essentially left his friend and myself to drive his car back to the house while he wandered off to do whatever knows what. I was infuriated that he would do that. Not necessarily the leave us part, but the fact that his friend had come to town specifically to visit him and he just bailed on her with no real reason. She and I spent the day watching movies and playing video games. We talked quite a bit about Steve as he was our one common link and a lot of things came to light about Steve that I won't mention here simply because I don't want to be typing this for the next two weeks. I texted Steve multiple times throughout the the day asking where he was. He didn't respond until about midnight when I sent a text telling him it was kind of crappy of him to just leave his friend with me when she had come to see him. The text I got back just read, mind your business, fatty. I'll be home when I get home. He finally rolled up around 10 the next morning as his friend was getting ready to leave. He was driving a motorcycle that I had never seen before. He barely said goodbye to the woman as she was leaving and when the door was shut, I rounded on him. Where were you, dude? I demanded, feeling myself getting angrier by the word at what he had done. Not that it's any of your business, but I was helping a friend bury a body, he shot back as he walked into his room. I knew instantly that this was a lie. I had this intuition when it came to Steve. I could almost always tell when he was lying, and this one was just so outlandish that I didn't even need to consider it to know it was absolute crap. No you weren't. I said under my breath, what was that? Fatty, he said, coming back into the room shirtless and getting in my face. I gently pushed him away from me and he looked utterly dumbfounded. He couldn't believe I would ever stand up to him like this. I said you're lying. I retorted quickly enunciating, but if you want to treat your friends like crap when they travel four hours just to hang out with you for a couple of days, then be my guest. We stood there glaring at each other for a few seconds before he deflated and looked slightly ashamed, which shocked me. I was with a girl I've been dating. He said softly, so you invited a friend to stay with us. I said, my anger rising again, cheated on your girlfriend with her, bailed on us, and then lied to me about it. You're a real douchebag. I turned on my heel and stormed up to my room. I'm fairly certain Steve threw something at me but missed, because I heard a thump on the wall just to the left of the doorway as I walked through. I didn't stop to find out. I didn't see or speak to Steve for a couple of days after that. It wasn't until Greg came home from his trip and noticed that we weren't spending time together and were acting coldly toward one another that our friendship started to repair a bit. Most of that was due to Greg yelling at us that he wasn't going to live with a couple of people who couldn't get their stuff together and act like adults. Despite our relationship repairing slightly, things were never really the same after that. Over the next few months, Steve started to sell drugs and always kept a loaded gun in the house. I specifically remember him telling me one day that some guy was going to be coming over to give him some money that he was owed and if he showed up while Steve was at work I was supposed to take the money, count it, and put it on his bedroom desk. I didn't know he was dealing at the time and so assumed it was just a guy who owed him money. I just agreed and went back to playing my video game as he left for work. Steve got home from work before the guy showed up and when there was a knock on the door, Steve came out of his bedroom with his gun in hand and held a finger to his lips. He opened the door to reveal a man standing on the porch 
porch with a wad of cash in hand. Steve immediately pointed the gun in his face, cocked the hammer back, and started screaming at him to drop the money on the ground and get off his porch. As the dude was fleeing in terror, Steve yelled after him that if he ever saw him again, he would kill him. Of course, I was immediately distressed by what I had just witnessed, but I was equally terrified. When he turned to me with a huge grin after collecting the money from the porch and closing the door, I just gave a weak smile and ignored the whole thing. I learned later that he was back on steroids when this happened. During this time, Steve would regularly come home late at night three sheets to the wind ranting about one ethnic group or another. The one that sticks out in my mind the most was when he stumbled and so drunk that he could barely string together a coherent thought. He was yelling about globalism and how the Chinese were trying to take over the world. He mumbled a string of words I couldn't make out then shouted clear as day, Ping Ling, followed by another string of unintelligible stuff and finally S-C-R-E-W-I in our daughters. As the last word left his lips, he immediately fell to the floor and began to sob. I had no idea what to do. If I tried to help him, I knew he would get violent toward me. In the end, I did nothing. I just went to my room. A few weeks after that particularly lovely incident, Steve and I got into an argument about something that I can't remember. He stormed off to his room, and I thought it was over. I knew from experience that given time and distance, he would calm down. He would never apologize, but at least the situation would de-escalate. I was wrong this time, and 10 minutes later, he came crashing back into the living room, gun in hand, and pointed it in my face. He was yelling that if I wasn't going to respect him, then he might as well just kill me. You're not going to shoot me, I said far more calmly than I felt. Inside, I was pooping my pants, despite the fact that I did honestly believe he wouldn't shoot me. I had been around guns before, but never had I had one pointed at me. Yeah, he said, why do you think that? I knew it. I replied, I know you're not going to shoot me because I'm one of the few real friends you have left. He seemed to consider this for a moment and finally lowered the gun. His face was still murder incarnate, but at least the gun wasn't pointed at me. Can you move, man? I asked. I'm trying to watch Netflix. He continued to stare at me for a long while, seeming to be internally fighting with himself before finally stopping back to his room. I didn't see him again for the rest of the night. A few days later, Steve and Greg asked me to sit down when I came home from my third double in a row at the restaurant where I worked. I asked why and they said we needed to talk about me living there. I told them there was no need. I was moving out. They seemed satisfied with this and I went to my room to get some much needed sleep. As a side note, as I was moving out, I accidentally broke the handle off of the storm door and Steve lost his mind, screaming at me and calling all kinds of names, including racial slurs. I assured him that I would replace it, but he just kept calling me names. Nick was helping me move out at the time and once we were away from the house, he gave me a look that spoke volumes. I know. I said, I know. Part of the reason I'm moving out. I didn't say anything. He replied, he didn't have to. I said, this was the point that I finally snapped and realized that Steve was nothing but a toxic piece of crap. It took someone I hadn't known for very long giving me a single look for that puzzle piece to finally fall into place and make me go, screw this guy. After I moved out, I only saw Steve once more. I was coming out of class on the university campus and he drove up on his motorcycle and started driving trying to make conversation but I just made some lame excuse about needing to get to work or home or something and walked away. About a year later, I blocked Steve completely on all social media when he commented on a Facebook post and called my mom a name. I don't know why I didn't do it sooner. About a year after that, Nick and I were at the mall. Being on a bit of a time crunch and needing things from different stores, we decided to head different directions and meet up in the food court. I finished what I needed to do first and was standing in front of the Dairy Queen waiting for Nick to meet me when I got a phone call from him. What's up? I said by way of answering. I just saw Steve. He said without preamble, he was going into the store I was coming out of. He didn't need to tell me which step. He knew most of the worst of what I've put in this story by this point, although I'm sure some of these anecdotes would surprise even him. My heart seemed to seize and I felt like I couldn't breathe. I hadn't seen or spoken to Steve in over two years and the thought of coming face to face with him now filled me with dread. Hello, you there? Yeah, I said, finally finding my voice. I'll meet you at the car. That's why I told you. I'll be out in a bit. I practically sprinted to the car and just kept praying to whatever gods might exist that Nick would be out soon. I went over and over in my mind what I would say or do if Steve showed up. Luckily, I never had to find out what I would have actually done or said because Nick appeared pretty quick and we left. That was the last I heard of Steve. The incidents that are portrayed in this story are not everything that happened over the course of my relationship with Steve. There were more, including more death threats, a physical altercation, more name calling, and insurance fraud that Steve decided to rope me into without my knowledge. These were just the worst or more poignant incidents that needed to be told in order to paint Steve as he truly exists.
where I'd tell the entire story of Stevie would likely wind up being a whole novel. A lot of it, while terrible, isn't really all that relevant in the grand scheme of things. So there's the Ballad of Steve. Now, I know at this point you're wondering to yourself why I didn't just leave Steve in the dust a long time ago. Why didn't I just walk away from that friendship at the first sign of trouble? Well, there are a few reasons. First and foremost, as I said, Steve was a sociopath. Sociopaths are extremely versed in making people trust them, even as they treat them like trash. Not to mention he gaslit me and made me feel as though a lot of the smaller incidents were my fault. That in turn led to me believing the bigger problems were my fault. This is how psychological abusers keep control. Secondly, I am a loyal friend to a fault. I will see the best in the people I care about even as they stab me in the back and beat me down. This is a fault of mine that I am working on. I only saw the terrible in Steve when he treated another friend I was loyal to bad. Third, a part of me was terrified to walk away. There was a piece of me that was scared, and sometimes still as since I blocked him, that he would get it in his head to kill me because I were rejected him. This is again part of the conditioning that abusers do. Regardless, I am much happier now and glad that the whole ordeal is behind me. I'd like to end on this final note. If you are in a relationship of any kind where you are starting to see red flags, don't ignore them like I did. I explained away a lot of the red flags that Steve was waving proudly and I regret it to this day. I was lucky and got out of the most toxic friendship I've ever known with only some psychological trauma and having my confidence shattered but it could have ended so much worse. If you need help getting out, sick it immediately. Leave everything behind if you have to. Things can be replaced. You can't. Anyway, thanks for reading this and Steve. Please stay wherever you move to. I don't ever want to see or hear from you again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I live in a quiet countryside where usually nothing is happening. I'm an 18 year old girl who could easily walk around my hometown alone without even being scared because it's really safe here. Basically no crimes. So as usual, me and my dog wait for a walk one evening. It was nice weather outside so I decided to go for a nearby field. I usually let my dog out of her leash there so it was fun for both of us. She's a nice dog and always comes when I call for her. We get to the field and everything is going really really well and nothing seems off except I have this kind of odd feeling in my gut that that I never usually have. The last time I had the same feeling when I was 8 years old and we were driving at night with my family. I had the same feeling then and I told it to my parents I feel like something is wrong. You should be careful I said something like that. They slowed down because I was oddly serious at the moment. A minute after I said it a deer came out of nowhere and we would have crushed if we had gone by the same speed as a minute before. We were all shocked and my mom thanked me. I still remember it like it was yesterday. However, in the field, 10 years later, I get the same gut feeling. Whatever I think and keep going completely ignoring it. We roll around the fields in a nearby forest until the sunset starts to set. I put my dog back to her leash and decide to leave from one of the tiny paths that go through a small forest. It's not a popular way to go but it's quick. As I'm walking along that path I suddenly spot a silhouette in the end of the road just before the forest starts. I think nothing of it at that point and just keep walking but after just a little while I have a strong gut feeling and stare at the silhouette for a while. It's then that I notice that the silhouette is staring at me without moving. I just think that maybe they were waiting for someone because because at first the silhouette looked like a child's. But as I got closer, I noticed that it wasn't a child, but a grown man who was riding what looked like a child's bicycle. It was a blue-green boy's bicycle. His legs were way too long for it, and his whole body looked like he was forcing himself to ride it. It was a really unsettling sight. Still, my dumb self didn't want to turn around and have a couple of kilometers waste of time, and even though it was creepy looking, I still thought maybe he's waiting for someone that comes from my way. But every step I take, he follows me with intense expression. I'm only like a 20 meters away from him when he he starts to do a weird motion by jumping on his bike, smiling the ugliest and the most unsettling smile I've ever seen, just staring at me with wide eyes. He kinda looks like he was expecting something and is so excited about it that he needs to jump. He looks like he's in his 50s or something, very long and thin legs and arms, bald and that creepy unsettling smile. That's when my alarm rings went on, I glanced behind me and no one was there, it was just me, a 18 year old small girl with her fluffy, definitely not a guard, dog. I turn around 360 and start to jog where I came from. Just just in case. I glanced at him and sighed in relief when I noticed he wasn't following me or anything. I thought that maybe he wasn't waiting for me after all and called myself stupid and a scaredy cat. I was so wrong. My adrenaline starts to slow down again as I'm in the middle of the fields and I still see no sign of him following me. I let my dog out of her leash again and she starts to run around. I'm nearly at the end of the field. I only have a kilometer or some of forest part before I get to my home after the field part. When my dog spots a rabbit or deer or some interesting thing and flies towards it, I panic because 
because she has never done that before and yell for her. I yell plenty of times for her loudly and finally she comes back. I'm relieved that nothing happened to her but as I put her back to her leash I noticed something formed the corner of my eye. The freaking bald long legs is biking towards me. He's not looking at the ground when he bikes but me. Freak out wasn't enough to express my feeling in that moment. I have never seen a human who looks so crazy. More than crazy. What surprised me the most was that he was biking through a field and I can tell you it is not an easy field to even walk sometimes. It has muddy ponds that you need to jump over but that psychopath just biked through them. He was struggling a lot to bike there but somehow managed to still do that. I didn't watch for another second behind me because I just started running. I ran so freaking full speed and I have asthma that I saw black and nearly collapsed. My lungs hurt so bad that I thought I was dying but the adrenaline kept my blood running and my legs too. Once I glanced behind me and he was there, struggling badly to keep up his full speed on the field grounds with that ugly white smile and the way too little bike. After that I just ran like crazy until I found a house, hid in their yard without even minding that I was in someone else's yard. It didn't matter to me in that moment at all. I waited a while with my breathing stuck in my throat, but he didn't come. I was planning to yell as loudly as I could if he found me, but he never did. At some point the adrenaline started leaving my system and I left my hiding spot. I ran again until I reached an area which had multiple people in their yards so I would have helped if I saw him again, but I didn't. I called the cops on my phone but couldn't bring myself to call. Mostly because I had no proof and I didn't want my parents to find out because they are overprotecting so I wouldn't probably leave my house anymore. I still live with them side note. I've been paranoid after this incident. My dog was frightened too. I guess she noticed something was really off too. I swear to god that I will always always listen to my gut when it's telling me something from now on. A couple of years ago at University I, a 20 year old woman decided to join a project group that catered to a niche interest. The group met on Thursday evening so I went along for the first time excited to join. I had a pretty good time and met some nice people. There was one guy sitting near me who didn't say very much but kept staring at me while we were working on our project. I didn't think much of it, assuming he was just awkward around girls or something so I tried to be friendly and speak to him the same as I was speaking to the other people in our project group. He still didn't really say anything to me, he just looked at me. But he was working hard on the project so again I didn't think much of it aside from that you get all kinds of people in the world. At the end of the meet, I said goodbye to the group I'd been working with and agreed to see them at the next meetup. I said goodbye to the strange guy as well since he was standing near me silently with everyone else. Feeling good about the project I turned away and left the building to walk home. But as I walked away from the group I noticed the strange guy immediately peeled away from the group and was walking right behind me. I turned and tried to be super friendly but by saying oh I'll be walking down that road so I'll say goodbye now and see you next time. If he said nothing it kept walking behind me. I was getting slightly creeped out but at this stage I was mostly annoyed because I wanted to walk alone listening to music. I had a long walk home and didn't feel like a pained interaction with this strange awkward guy. Anyway after quite a while at saying nothing he was still walking with me but he was now next to me. Still completely silent. I was starting to get majorly creeped out but I still tried to reason with myself that he's just an awkward dude who happens to live in the same direction as me. We were walking towards a common student area, so I decided I'd keep walking until I got to a grocery store not far from home. I also considered that should he have bad intentions I wanted to stay friendly to him so as not to anger him. He continues walking with me in silence and by the time we reach the grocery store it's been about 20 minutes. I'm thinking I just need to get rid of him by going in here as he'll just continue onto his house, right? Nope. I say well I've got to get loads of shopping done so I'll say goodbye and I go into the store. I see him hesitate at the door but he says nothing. I go in the store and glance back and he's still outside the store, but thank god he didn't come in with me. So I run around the aisles for a bit to waste time, and then I see him cross through the end of one aisle, inside the store. I grab something random off the shelf to take to the cashier, having some vague plan of telling them what was happening. But being naive I was still worried about reading the situation all wrong and getting a poor awkward guy in trouble for nothing. So I didn't say anything. While paying the guy saw me and waited for me at the exit. I walked past him and this time said nothing at all. I decided to just go straight home. Since I lived with male roommates who I thought would be able to help me and it was the first thing I thought of to do. Probably very stupid to reveal where I lived but I was freaked out and not thinking. I didn't want to use my phone to call anyone as I was worried it would just make the guy angry to hear me saying I was scared of him. So he continued walking next to me and we power walked to my house. At this point I realized with shock that none of my roommates would be home at this time so I was actually alone. The guy was still silent and he actually followed behind me as I walked up the path to my front door. I repeat the next part over
over and over in my mind for all the things that could have gone wrong and all the possibilities of what could have happened. I decided I had to just get inside and lock the door at any cost, so I thought the best thing to do was shock him. I got my keys ready in my hand and turned them in the lock. Then I turned around and flung my arms around his neck saying thank you so much for walking me home. It was so nice to meet you. And just be really loud and friendly and hugging. It did shock him and in the next second I removed myself from him, turned, slipped through the door and slammed it shut. He didn't have time to react and I got in safely. After going upstairs I looked through the window and saw him go back out to the road and just stand there for a bit. Then he just walked off back up the road. Those without saying I never went back to the project group and it made me extremely anxious about letting anyone know where I lived. I looked out for the guy constantly but never saw him again in my road so for whatever reason he didn't come back. Don't know when his intentions were but it was just bizarre. It made me very vigilant and overnight I went from naive and friendly to suspicious and private. At the time of this story, I was 14. I'm a dude. This takes place during the winter. I enjoy taking night walks. I never go out too late, but I go out when it's still dark. I usually do this because in the area I live in, my primary school friends lived in the same area and I wanted to avoid them at all costs. I also just enjoy the nighttime because I found it peaceful. One day, I decided to go out later. I had just come home from somewhere at around 8 at night, so I told my parents I was heading out for a walk. They were hesitant to let me go, as I usually went at around 6 in the afternoon but eventually they let me as long as I had my phone on me. So I headed out. I usually dress in all black with a hood on and a face mask, and I walk with my hands in my pockets. Bonus points if I have gloves on. Usually people who pass me on the street avoid me because of the all black attire I wear. Anyways, after roughly half an hour I had almost completed my walk, so close that I could see my house from where I was at. That's when I saw a light. It was a bright white light, moving randomly but generally staying in the same spot. I had pretty bad eyesight and it was dark, so as I walked I squinted to try and see what it was. Turns out, it was a dude also wearing all black, but with a headlamp. I walked closer, but slowed down my pace significantly. I got a really uneasy feeling, and I didn't like him at all. I wanted to just get home, but I would have had to walk past him in order to get to my house. I thought about turning around, but I really didn't want to walk the 30 minutes all the way back, as it would probably be 9 at night by then, and I didn't want to worry my parents. I continued to walk very slowly, watching him carefully. Suddenly, he stopped moving. Then he turned around and stopped again. The light was still. My heart dropped. There was a grassy area right next to the road that I was walking on, so I moved to the grassy area and began slowly walking there instead. I was pretty far from him still, so I thought to myself, if this guy runs towards you, run faster. It was a tense couple of seconds before he began jogging, not moving directly towards me but still coming in my general direction. I didn't run quite yet, as he certainly could have just been a jogger running along the road. I thought that until his jog broke into a run, and this time it was straight for me. I inhaled sharply and booked it in the opposite direction. I had always been quite a fast runner, and my legs were quite strong because I would go on a lot of bike rides in my area, which has a lot of steep hills. I was able to run for a solid 10 minutes, not daring to look behind me. I made it up a large hill before stopping to catch my breath. I looked to see if he was chasing me, but the only thing I could see of him was that light. It was moving around the same way I had seen before, and it was shining directly into my eyes. I jogged the rest of the way home. My mom saw that I was sweaty and exhausted, but I just told her I had gone for a run this time instead, which wasn't far from the truth. My boyfriend bought a house in a super stereotypical white suburban neighborhood. Living there was super awkward at first because I'm a person of color and while the neighbors were friendly, they often would make backhanded remarks or comments. Because of this, I tried to avoid socializing with people as much as possible. A few months after moving in, I noticed there was a house a few doors down that never had lights on or cars pulling in and out of the driveway but the trash was always put out at the end of the driveway on trash day. I started paying more attention to the house after noticing this. I started noticing odd things about the house, like noticing flickery but super dim lights from certain windows and blinds sometimes closing and opening. Anyways, one day I was walking the dog and I passed the house. A man was in the front yard observing the landscaping and he waved at me and said said hello and introduced himself as the neighbor who lives in the house. As he approached me, I noticed that he smelled really terrible, like poop and mildew, which was really odd because he seemed well dressed and well groomed. The way he smiled also made me feel uneasy. He was always smiley with his teeth and his eyes had a deadness to them. I told him I was wondering if anyone lived in the house because for the most part it seemed abandoned. He just shrugged but he seemed to be in a hurry to end the conversation after I brought this up which was fine with me. As I walked away from the house I kept turning around to make sure he wasn't following me and I kept getting the chills. A few days after meeting him I was on another walk with the dog and I noticed that the front door to the house was open. I thought this was odd 
because it would be letting all the heat into the house and it was the middle of summer. The next day, the door was still open, so I called the police to do a wellness check. Once the police arrived, I watched from my house to see if I could see anything going on. The police officers didn't step foot in the house, and about half an hour later a fire engine showed up. The police officer and the fighter stayed talking outside for a while after the firemen had entered and exited the house but not much else happened. About a month later, my boyfriend was walking the dog and he stopped to talk to some women who were clearing things out of the house. They told him that the house belonged to their father, who was currently in an inpatient dementia treatment, and that the house had been inhabited by a squatter. They told him that house was full of mold on the wall that was almost an inch thick and that the man had been hoarding roadkill in one of her roots. It also showed signs of him living in the house, including a space cleared out for him on an old moldy mattress in the upstairs bedroom. They had found candles and a salt circle in one room, as well as notebooks full of writings about the devil and devoting yourself to Satan and other worldly alien beings. I guess on the end the squatter had just decided to up and leave the house alone. The women have since cleared out the house and it has been gutted and remodeled. I'm not sure if they are selling it or what's the plan with it, but the memory of that man and his empty smile and the smell coming off of him will stay with me forever. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. In 2016, I was 26. I worked a seasonal job at a warehouse about a fiery minute drive from my flat. One day after work, I ordered some takeout from a place maybe 10 blocks from home. There was a gas station next door, so I filled up and left my car at the pump to say hello to some friends who lived across the street while I waited for my food to be ready. Maybe 15 minutes of chatting, walking back across the street, grabbing my food, across the lot to the gas station, into my car and a two minute drive to my flat. At the time, I lived in a duplex flat with a gutted adjacent flat attached. Behind me was an old vacant motel that was currently being gutted and repurposed into studio apartments. The nearest building to the left was an old clapper bar leading to the main street and the highway, and to the right was an empty lot where a building that was demolished nearly a decade earlier once stood. The rest of the neighborhood was lower income Hispanic. I pulled into my drive noticed a car driving relatively slow past. I went inside and leashed my dog up to let her out, as I was standing in the yard waiting for the dog to do her business. A maroon Subaru Forester, newer at the time, drove by slowly multiple times before pulling into my drive. I assumed he was lost or looking for something and walked up to him as he got out of the car and approached me. He looked like any older white man in his 50s. I remember he kind of reminded me of my dad. I asked him if he needed anything and he replied, no, I just was checking on you. I asked him if I knew him, figuring maybe I didn't recognize him. He replied, I saw you up by the gas station. You seemed like you needed help. I've just said if you need anything. I'm usually pretty slow to the cut, but at this point, I'd pace together that this man had followed me from the gas station to a friend's house to a restaurant and then home and immediately didn't sit right he was just standing there and he wasn't leaving and i had time to process the situation i thought maybe he's an older guy i'm a younger girl he's on this side of town in a nice car for whatever reason maybe he thinks i'm a trick and i said again i'm sorry i'm not picking up what you're putting down why are you here nothing i'm just a nice guy checking to see if you're all right i specifically remember him calling himself a nice guy during the period of of this conversation, I had made it to my stoop and he had closed the gap. Behind was door, then me, the dog, then him and his car. I told him you should leave. To which he asked, do you wish you had a nicer place? And if my dog, a medium sized German Shepherd, was friendly and reached out toward her for a pet. I yanked her behind me and said no and pretty aggressively told him, dude, leave. He finally started backing away. I stood in the drive until he got in his car and drove off. I took down his license plate and car description. Then I went inside. 15 minutes later, he pulled back into my drive, sat there for a second, and drove off. That's when I decided to file a police report. It didn't sit right. I just figured it was nothing, but I lived alone and if anything happened, I'd want a record. It was 6 or 7 at this point, so the non-emergency line was closed. I filled out a report online and never heard back from the police. Never saw that man or his maroon forester again, either. He might have just been a weird old man. I never saw any reports of anyone going missing from Nevada in 2016, either. I know it's a stretch and probably has nothing to do with anything, but I'd only just thought of this again in the last few months. They caught that guy in New York, and I wondered if he was in Nevada before it ever came out. Same age, same build, but how do you remember a face from seven years ago? I just remember the man at my place having more salt and pepper hair. He treated me like he thought I was soliciting, and he wanted to help. He did not respect my boundaries. It was probably nothing and not the same man. It's scary. Off situations just have a way of sticking with you. Maybe time to connect this is my way of making it make sense. 
I used to hang out with my cousin a lot. We were both 10 year old boys at the time of this encounter and I'm now 33 years old. It has stayed with me ever since. We'd mostly spend our youth roaming the streets, not causing trouble, but kicking footballs around fields, climbing, hanging out with kids our age, the typical stuff before phones and Netflix became commonplace. One day we decided to go and explore a part of town that we'd never explored before. It meant going through alleyways and back streets. The trail would actually end approximately two to three minutes from my house, which was a safe part of the neighborhood. Neighborhood. It was a sunny day, albeit not too warm, and my cousin and I had been walking for what seemed like miles. The journey we planned was supposed to go on for longer, but we got bored and decided to take a detour home. The detour involved cutting through an alleyway that looked a little bit like the Coronation Street Journal, if anyone is familiar with the television show. To the left of us were terraced houses, and to the right of us, steel fences with sharp points to deter any would be thieves. We continued up here, and soon enough, one of the kids from our school lived there, and his mom shouted, What are you boys doing here? We ran, and I don't know why, we just didn't like her son and her tone was accusatory. As we ran, we bumped into another kid. Don't go that way, he said, as his voice trailed off as he ran farther and farther away from us, down the opposite end of the alleyway. We shrugged and continued on. It got darker with the trees and foliage, but we soon emerged from the alley, and that's where we saw the lone boy. A boy aged 10 or 12 stood there. His eyes were empty. He had a vacant look on his face. Well, the half of his face that we could see well enough. Above his mouth was covered with a veil, somewhat like a Halloween mask of some description, except it was June. Halloween was months away. As we got closer, we noticed the boy had a kitchen knife in his hands. I mean a fully real, stainless steel kitchen knife, both hands on the handle. The sunlight made the blade glisten. We cracked a joke, cooking outside, but he looked at us blankly. No emotion, nothing. We were too freaked out to move, and that's when we realized he hadn't moved either. Not a muscle. We saw him blink, but physically, the knife hadn't been raised up or pointed at us, just held closely to his chest, blade pointed upwards. We figured we should get away because instinct told us this was weird and a bit freaky. Going back down the alley didn't seem like a safe option. Being stuck in an alleyway with a strange kid with a knife didn't seem smart. In front of us was a road on a steep hill. It was our best bet. We walked up to the top of the hill, keeping an eye on the kid. The top of the hill was two to three minutes from my house in terms of distance. At last, we felt safe. As we looked back down the hill, the low kid had put the knife by his leg, now holding it in one hand, but remained in the exact same spot and stared right back up at us, expressionless. We told our parents what had happened and they called a local community enforcement team to scout the area. Apparently the kid was found with the knife, but we never heard why he was there or what he was doing. 23 years after it happened, it's still on my mind. While I was living and studying in the capital of my country, I had a small rented basement of a 1917 built house next to a nightclub. I was preparing to go to sleep quite early since I had class at 8 in the morning the next day. Right before I fell asleep, I remembered that I forgot to lock the door, but since the city I lived in was generally quite safe, and the only way to get to the entrance of my place was past a front gate. All around to the other side of the house and down some stairs, I didn't think much of it and proceeded to fall asleep. Skip forward to the middle of the night, I wake up and feel someone or something slow pulling my blanket off me. In a confused state, I extend my hand and feel a hairy male arm under my fingers. My first thought was, oh, this is probably my drunk flatmate, but then I remembered that he is at his girlfriend's place on the other side of town. In pitch black, I jump from my bed, rush to the light switch, and as I turn it on, I find a stranger around my age, a student, standing in his underwear by my bed, with his underwear clearly wet. My initial reaction was to stay calm, since I had no idea if this dude was violent or what was even going on in the first place. I calmly asked to man. What are you doing here? He was clearly very confused as well and took a sit on a recliner I had in my tiny room. And there we are, both in our underwear, him covered in something wet and I on the border of pissing myself and what does he do? He extends his hand and introduces himself to me. At that point I go okay dude get out of my house and start escorting him to the hallway where I find all his clothes and shoes on the floor. As I am escorting him out he goes into the bathroom and locks himself inside. I hear him turn on the shower and proceed to knock on the door saying hey man if you don't leave right now. I'm calling the the cops to which he replies I'm not afraid of the police. Well that's just perfect isn't it? A few minutes pass and he steps out of the bathroom but naked with my flatmate's towel around his waist, looks at me looking kind of content and says hey did you see? They've got a shower here. At that point I am fuming. Who's got a shower? This is my house. You're a total stranger and you broke into my place. Suddenly an expression of complete fear appears on his face. Oh my god, what have I done? Jesus Christ he starts exclaiming as he is very awkwardly trying to get dressed in the hallway. Then I manage to 
to get him out of the house. I even called one of his friends from my phone to come pick him up at the club. It turns out he's from a completely other town and came to party to the capital, got kicked out of the club for starting a fight, and somehow managed to get into my place. To this day, I have no idea what he was on or how he managed to find my apartment as it is quite hidden from the street. Let's just say I never forgot to lock the door from that day. When I was 21, I was living in a two-bedroom apartment with my 15-year-old sister and our mom. How we ended up there is another story in itself. The complex was in the same town I grew up in. It wasn't the best complex around, but it also wasn't the worst. I took comfort in the fact that we would see the security guards roaming quite often because the laundry units were in every other building, and of course, our building didn't have a unit so I felt safer knowing there were guards around when I did my laundry late at night. I was on the top floor so I'd have to drag my laundry down five flights of stairs, walk outside to the neighboring building and go to the lower level to do laundry. One day I noticed a new security guard. He was a large man and probably about 6 foot 3, very muscular build. He wasn't as friendly as other guards. He didn't really acknowledge residents, so he was a little scary and intimidating, but that's good for the job he had. My friend lived in the same complex in a building behind me. There was a little playground and tennis court that separated front buildings from back buildings. One day my friend texted me around 10 at night saying she went to do her laundry and she saw him working around around the building she needed to go into. The guards were only supposed to survey the grounds outside and only go inside a building for suspicious activity. They only had keys to the building front doors but didn't have keys for laundry units, at least that's what we were told. He ended up following her into the laundry room where she verbally assaulted him and threatened to call management if he didn't get out. She said he stood still just glaring at her and left the building without saying a word. Now that this was fresh in my mind, I was on high alert. A few weeks go by and I come home after work around 9.30. When I pulled into my lot, I noticed the power was out. The whole parking lot and all the buildings were pitch black, no light sources detected anywhere. I decided to back my car into a spot so I could have a clear view of my building from my car. I was a little hesitant to get out because I had some bags of hair product I bought from work, some food I picked up, my water bottle and my purse to carry and I knew it would take some time to gather my stuff and lock up my car. We also had some homeless people nearby that would dig through the dumpster bins and search the lot for cigarette butts that were still smokable. One man in particular seemed very strung out and unpredictable so I didn't want to have a run in when I could barely see anything. I called my mom to come down and open the door for me but she didn't answer. My sister never answers her phone so I didn't even bother trying. I sat in the car contemplating my next move. By then my eyes had somewhat adjusted to the darkness and I decided to stop being such a chicken and just go inside. As I gathered up my things, the power suddenly came back on and I felt so relieved. But when I looked into the windows of my building, that relief quickly turned to fear and suspicion. I saw that same security guard that followed my friend, standing on our top floor landing and staring at our door. There were three other doors on my floor and he was standing in front of ours. He didn't move for a few seconds and just stared at our door, with his head leaned forward like he was trying to listen through our door. He then slowly turned and made his way downstairs. I called my mom again and she answered this time. I told her what I saw and she came down to get me and they called building management. I never saw him again. I don't know what happened, if he quit or got fired, but I was very relieved that we wouldn't have to deal with his strange behavior anymore. Apparently other residents had strange encounters with him as well. It's scary when you can't even feel safe in your own home. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.